Dragon Curse Dragon Curse Series Book 1 By Mia Hall Chapter 1 Lily If they don't shut up, someone's going to call the cops. That wouldn't serve us very well. In fact, that would throw my pitiful excuse for a life into a pandemonium I didn't need. I could hear my two best friends ragging on each other from my bedroom window. I tried to tune them out. I really did. But God they wouldn't quit. Alicia and Brad were going at it, and as usual I was the target. That would change though soon enough, it always did. They'd start in on one another, then come back to me after a short spell. Come on Lily. I seriously, don't understand what's taking you so long. Alicia's voice. I resisted the urge to yell out to them to shut up. This was going to be a fun day. A heck of a fun day. I wouldn't let their squabbling or loud voices ruin it. Unless someone calls the cops on us for disturbing the peace. Girls right? What can you say? Can't live with them, can't live without putting up with their incessant need to plan and primp. Am I right? Brad's voice this time. He was kidding. I could hear the mirth in his voice. And I could also hear the serious crush he had on Alicia. You are aware that I'm a girl, right? I mean you have noticed that before, haven't you? Alicia's pout could be heard, even from up in my bedroom. What? Brad Mock shouted at Alicia. He probably only got an exaggerated eye roll and the ghost of a smile in return. You're trying to tell me you're female? How is this possible? When did this happen? Do your parents know? I bit back a laugh and waited for Alicia's response. Ha ha you're so funny Brad. How you've gone this long in life without having a girlfriend, is totally beyond me. Like for real. It's a travesty. A national tragedy, even. She did sarcasm even better than I did sometimes. It really is, isn't it? Now can we stop picking on how lame I am, and go back to picking on Lily for how long it's taking her to get ready? I like that much more. It was definitely more fun for me. Yeah, Alicia replied with more sarcasm, so thick it could have been cut with a knife. I just bet you did. You're right though. She's been up there for about a century. Lily. Earth to Lily. We're waiting here. And it's not like we have all day. Alicia's voice grew louder with each word. Actually, I yelled back, leaning toward the open window of the shitty apartment building I called home. It is. That's the whole point of senior skip day. Oh. Alicia, I do believe you just got burned. I could just see Brad moving his hand in the hand signal for burn. Shut up Brad. Sometimes you're so dense it makes me want to scream. Oh yeah? Well I may be dense but you just got burned. My friends continued to bicker, and I shook my head, laughing quietly. Brad Arbor and Alicia Bell were my best friends in the whole world. Even a couple stories up, without being able to see them at all, I knew exactly what they must look like down there. The two of them would be lounging in the front seat of Brad's Jeep, in the alley beneath my bedroom window, with Alicia tapping her woefully chewed nails impatiently. She wasn't a girl who was good at waiting, not for anything, and the fact that she hadn't marched up the stairs to bust down my door was a miracle. Some people might have found her impatient, and yes, bossy was a word they might also use but I just thought it was funny. Probably in part because she was so little. She was barely five foot two, with big blonde curls and even bigger blue eyes. She looked like a little doll, Brad was fond of describing her as small but mighty. That was a comment that always got an eye roll from Alicia, but I knew she secretly liked it. Not because she had told me or anything. I could just tell. Seeing her next to Brad was actually quite comical all by itself, come to think of it. He was six foot three at eighteen, towering over Alicia by more than a foot. He had messy auburn hair, freckles and green eyes that always looked like he was laughing. When he was little, he had been a pudgy kid and had gotten made fun of for it, but as he got older he kind of stretched out. By senior year, he was one of the better looking guys in school. Girls drooled over him in the halls, and he had no idea. He was super chill, 
pretty much the opposite of Alicia's type A personality, which was part of why they got along so well. Plus, I was pretty sure he was in love with her. Actually, scratch that. I knew he was in love with her, and she felt the exact same way. Again, I didn't know this because he had told me, and not because she had told me either. I could just see it. They were my best friends, had been from practically the moment my broken little family moved to Houston. For years the three of us had been constantly together, just like the three musketeers. I wouldn't have been a very good friend, if I hadn't been able to see the way they felt about each other, would I? Nope, not a very good friend at all. Lily. Alicia pulled me, from my reverie. Come downstairs. Right now. Geez Alicia, you're being pretty harsh even for you, Brad chastised her. Come on. Alicia gave as good as she got. You must be ready to go too, right? I mean right? The traffic is going to suck. Maybe not, Brad shot back. I silently sent my thanks to him for buying me a few moments longer to find socks. Please this is Houston. Of course the traffic is going to suck. Traffic in Houston always sucks. It's like it's state mandated or something. Somewhere, some evil little bastards are holed up in secret offices passing laws that the traffic in Houston will suck or else, and they're laughing at all of us poor suckers who are stuck driving in it. Alicia, I mean this in the nicest possible way, but you've got to lay off the crime TV, okay? I think it's doing funny things to your brain. Lily. Alicia again. I grimaced. They were going to get me in trouble with the neighbors. Mr. Jones on the first floor was always griping about noise. As if summoned, the screeching began. Will you please shut the hell up down there? People's trying to sleep up in here. Goddamn. Damn kids should be in school. Gonna call the police, you just see if I don't. That was Mr. Jones, the charmer. I wanted to yell at him to go get his bottle and drink himself into oblivion, but I held back. Mostly because he'd complain. If we had any more complaints, we were facing eviction. Again. I couldn't have that. And my little brother would be devastated. He liked his teacher, and that was rare for him. Plus, I couldn't have him calling the police. Nor could Brad and Alicia. That's all we needed, the cops, truancy, that hassle. Brad and Alicia knew my precarious situation at home. I'd warned them not to get me into hot water. Eureka! Socks? They didn't match, but who cared? I'd be barefooted before long, dragging my toes through the silt that Galveston Beach liked to call sand. There were a couple of beats of silence, followed by another neighbor's disgruntled yelling, and then I could hear Brad and Alicia whispering to each other, laughing in that excited, nervous way people got when they believed they had narrowly escaped real trouble. Even getting yelled at by a crazy guy was fun for them, at least when they were together. I sighed, allowing myself to have just a minute of feeling sorry for myself. It wasn't that I wasn't happy for my friends, because I was. I knew the two of them would share their feelings for each other any day, and not a minute too soon. They were going to make a totally adorable couple, and I thought they were perfect for each other. That being said, I didn't have any prospects anywhere in sight. Not even the hint of a prospect, and I would have been lying if I said that wasn't a bummer. I was one day from my 18th birthday, and I had never had a boyfriend, not even anything close to a boyfriend. Not even a kiss. It's not like I was desperate or boy crazy or anything, but still, it wasn't awesome either. Okay, maybe it kind of sucked. Despite the fact that my increasingly impatient friends were still downstairs waiting and were very likely to piss the neighbor off again, I stopped and stared at myself in the mirror. It was something I had developed a habit of doing. I would just stand there in my bedroom mirror, doing my best to look at myself objectively. If I was being honest with myself, not cocky but honest, I had to say I wasn't a bad-looking girl. I was actually sort of, well, I was sort of pretty, although even thinking it made me feel funny and blush furiously. I was of average height, about 5 foot 5, with an athletic build. I had loved dancing since I was a little girl, and although we'd never had the money to put me in classes, 
I'd done my best to teach myself with YouTube videos. So I had a good body, at least as far as I could tell. I had brown hair, with a few even lighter streaks, long and usually piled on top of my head in a messy bun. Little wisps of the bangs I was in the process of trying to grow out were always slipping out and falling around my face, causing me to constantly blow my hair off of my forehead. I guess if I had to pick something, I would have said that my eyes were my best feature. They were blue which was common enough, but they were ringed in gold, flecked with gold. They were beautiful, or so I'd been told. I was always getting compliments on them. I actually got a lot of compliments from guys, but always the kind that were given on the down low, always sort of secretive. I wasn't an idiot. I knew why guys didn't want to be seen with me, why they didn't want to be caught looking like they had any kind of interest in me. It was because of where I came from. It was because people liked to talk, and most of the school had at least heard rumors about the Rogers family, the girl from the wrong side of the tracks with the gimpy brother. Of course, I would have beaten the shit out of anyone I actually heard calling my younger brother Ricky Gimpy, but that didn't mean the names didn't get flung around. Ricky was 12 years old, but the limp he'd acquired as a six-year-old was there to stay. That little gem had been courtesy of one of our stepmom's boyfriends, a real bastard and a mean drunk who hadn't liked it when Ricky spilled his cereal. He had broken Ricky's leg, and although my stepmom had eventually dumped the boyfriend, she hadn't ever taken Ricky to get his leg fixed. Because of that, it had healed wrong, and it would always show in the way Ricky walked. Anybody would have thought that terrible incident would have been enough to get Mona on the wagon, but no such luck. All she had done was pick us up and move us from Louisiana to Houston, Texas, claiming we could all use a change. Since we didn't have any money, we'd wound up living in subsidized housing. And I'd put an end to my YouTubing dance videos and started to YouTube self-defense and martial arts videos. Best I could do, since we couldn't afford any real classes. I'd gotten pretty good, too. I had to, since my stepmother's taste in men never got better. The only reason Ricky and I were able to go to decent schools was the money our grandmother had put in trusts for just that reason. It was money my stepmom couldn't touch, the only money she hadn't used on drinking and the occasional asshole boyfriend. I was grateful for the school, and I knew Ricky was too, but we also both knew that we were different from the other kids. All of our classmates knew it too. That was why none of the guys in my classes wanted to date me, even though they had no problem sending me Facebook messages telling me how hot I was in the middle of the night. It sucked, and I couldn't wait until it was time to go to college. Once I was in college, it wouldn't be like this anymore. In college, nobody would have to know where I had come from or how messed up my past was. Lily. Better make it quick. I won't be able to contain the beast for much longer. Hey. Don't call me a beast. All right. I shoved my head out of my window this time, responding quickly so that Mr. Jones upstairs didn't get seriously pissed off again. I'm ready. I'll be right down. I took one last look in the mirror, put on a fresh coat of lip gloss, and slung my purse across my body. I preferred cross-body purses. I liked to be able to move as quickly as I wanted to, without being bogged down by a stupid bag. Things had been freaking stressful lately, what with my home life being what it was and school quickly coming to a close, and I was definitely looking forward to a day off. I just had to get past my stepmom first, which wasn't always the easiest thing to do. Her moods were unpredictable, to say the least. Chapter 2 Lily my stepmom Mona. She'd married my dad while I was. I don't even remember how old I was. My mother died when I was too young to remember. Then Ricky's mom left us. Then there was Mona. Then dad died. Now it was just Mona. The stepmom from hell, but she was all we had. I slipped out of my room calling softly, Mona? Nothing. She was planted on the couch, a place she pretty much never left unless forced to, her body turned toward the TV. I took a deep quiet breath, trying to steady my nerves before talking to her. I loved my stepmom in that you love what you have sort of way. 
but she was just so completely unpredictable, and she had been getting steadily worse for about as long as I could remember. Her decline had started picking up speed after our move to Houston. I'd often wondered if that might have something to do with what had happened to Ricky, what she had let happen to Ricky, but in the end, the reason didn't really matter. What mattered was that she really wasn't much of a parent or guardian at all at this point. Most of the time it felt like I was the adult and she was the child. Mona. Come here baby, come and look at this. Oh boy. I chased the grimace from my face so she wouldn't read my disappointment. I could tell what she was trying to say, but her words were already coming out slurred, and as I approached, I could see that she had the bottle of vodka on the coffee table next to a bucket of ice. It was only 10.30 in the morning. On the plus side, it meant she may not even know what day it is, which meant she wouldn't realize that I was skipping school and I wouldn't get any shit for it. That was the only plus that I could see. The bottle being out already, her slurred words so early meant it was going to be one of her bad days. I cringed in anticipation of what it would be like when I got home from Galveston. If we were lucky, she would just be passed out. If we weren't so lucky, well, I didn't want to think about that. I wasn't going to think about that, at least not until I had to. I pushed my shoulders back and walked over to where she sat, bent down beside her to hear her better and tried to ignore the now very intense stale smell of booze. Probably her Jack Daniels from the other day. For what might be the millionth time, I promised myself that I would never be like her. I was never ever going to let something like alcohol completely take over my life. What is it, Mona? What do you need? I don't need anything, I want to show you something. Look. Will you look at that? Just like Elizabeth Taylor's. Doesn't it look just like hers? I blinked, totally confused about what she might be talking about. Maybe she was actually going crazy or something. It couldn't exactly come as a surprise. It was a long time coming. But then she looked at me, her eyes bugging out of her head in a way that had always kind of freaked me out, and jerked her thumb in the direction of the TV. I understood then. She was watching one of those home shopping network channels, some program hawking replicas of famous movie stars' jewels. At the moment, they were going over a Liz collection, and my stepmother was totally enraptured. Her eyes were glassy, like a kid looking in the window of a massive shop window full of candy. People used to tell me that I looked like her, you know? That was something people used to tell me all of the time, back when I was young. Back before everything started moving around, sagging in the opposite direction of where it was supposed to be. I know, Mona. You still do, though. You're still just as pretty as she was. I patted her head and hoped she'd wash her hair soon. I guess I'm not being fair to her. Dad's passing must have hit her pretty hard. Bah. Come on now. Don't you think I know when my little girl is lying to me? You're the one who looks like her now. I might as well have disappeared, you know? Might as well have just disappeared. Little girl? And resembling her? Mona loved to think that I looked like her. I wondered if she'd ever truly taken a look at me. I love you, Mona. I gotta go now, okay? You'll be home when I get back? Sure, sure. I'll be around. You go on now. Go on and let your stepmama alone. You're making me tired. I stood up and walked quickly toward the front door, trying to ignore the lump rising in my throat. Why was it that every time I went anywhere, I got the uneasy feeling that it might be the last time I saw my stepmom alive? It wasn't supposed to be like that. A parent, even a stepparent, was supposed to make you feel safer, not more afraid. I didn't have a dad anymore, he'd passed long before our move to Houston, so the only parent I had to look after me was my stepmom, the Elizabeth Taylor look-alike from a long, long time ago. Except Mona wasn't interested in taking care of anyone, least of all herself. I didn't want to think about it. This was supposed to be a good day, a fun day. This was supposed to be a rite of passage. It was senior skip day. 
I was one of those students who almost always did exactly what I was supposed to do. I never turned anything in late, never got sent to the principal or had to do detention. This was my one day to do something rebellious, even if it was widely accepted and expected by the school's faculty, and I was going to enjoy it. I was determined to enjoy it. I took the steps down two at a time and threw myself into the back of Brad's Jeep, ignoring the door handle, climbing over the side. Brad smirked at me. Sheesh, it sure took you long enough. You're lucky you got here when you did. Boss lady over here was trying to get me to take off without you. He indicated Alicia with an incline of his head. As if, I grumbled, still irritated by Mona's drinking. You'd think I'd be used to it by now, and could let it go a lot easier. Not true, Alicia bellowed, smacking Ben in the arm with a surprising amount of force for such a petite girl. Don't listen to him, Lily, he's definitely lying to you. But for real, what were you doing up there? Sorry, I said sheepishly, feeling an immense amount of relief just to be out of that sad apartment and with my friends. Time to get on the way to the beach. Galveston wasn't the prettiest beach in the entire world, but it was close, and for this day, it was ours. Freedom felt good, and as Brad shuttled me and Alicia, I slumped down in my seat and let the wind blow through my hair, thinking about the many possible futures that might be laid out in store for me. I had a pretty good imagination, and the versions of futures I came up with were plentiful and varied. That being said, nothing I could think of came anywhere close to what was actually going to happen to me. Nothing in the world could have prepared me for that. Chapter 3 Lily The frisbee that a couple of guys were throwing skidded to a stop near me, kicking sand all over my leg. I refrained from giving them a dirty look, and then I never had a chance to. The sound of an explosion was pushed to the forefront of my world. What was that? Oh my God, what was that? The question, the look on Alicia's face, it was the same thing I was thinking. And judging from the look on Brad's face, him too. It was the same thing everyone on the beach, everyone in Galveston, I expected, was thinking. And there were a lot of us. Apparently, it wasn't only our school who had come up with the idea of spending the day on the beach. We were already in the first days of May, and the weather in Houston and the surrounding area was already on the verge of unbearably hot. Galveston Strand, as well as the beaches themselves, were peppered with all kinds of people. Some of them looked to be tourists, headed out on early vacations to beat the summer madness. There were young mothers with their children, clumped together with the slightly shell-shocked looks of moms, just coming to realize how much energy children actually had. There were tons our age. Apparently, our school wasn't the only one with students who felt like taking a trip to the beach. There were high school seniors everywhere, and some kids that were, from the look of it, not even close to being seniors, and all of us had that kind of giddy feeling that came with knowing summer was right around the corner. For a little while, everything felt kind of perfect. It was one of the rare times when I got to feel like what I was, an almost 18-year-old kid. Lying on the beach with my face turned up, the hot rays of the sun soaking into me as I listened to Brad and Alicia bicker, then flirt, then bicker again, and then flirt, I felt good. I felt like things might actually be okay. I was actually starting to think that I might be able to figure out a way to make all three of us okay. Me, Ricky, even Mona. For the first time in a long time, I had hope. So of course, that was when it happened. That was when everything in my world went completely crazy. Lily. Lily, what was it? Please, what was it? Alicia was holding onto my upper arm with a death grip. I had to gently peel her fingers away from my skin. There are definitely going to be bruises there, I thought to myself dazedly, and wouldn't Alicia think it was funny that she had enough strength to do something like that? It was a crazy thing to be thinking about. This was not the time for me to go all weird and contemplative, and there was a very good chance that a couple of bruises were going to be the least of my problems. I sat up, trying to comfort Alicia's shaking, clinging figure at the same time. I squinted up through my sunglasses and saw Brad standing in front of us. His entire body was rigid, 
all of his normal, easygoing humor erased. He looked like a boy who was trying to be a man. He looked like he was trying to decide whether he should stand up and fight, or run like hell. For a brief second I could have sworn his skin went grayish, but then again, that was probably my imagination. Or maybe it was the sun playing tricks on my eyes. I could sympathize with being confused about whether to run or fight, or what. I knew the feeling. Brad? Come on guys, I think it's time to get up. Put something on too, okay? Better to be dressed. Don't want you guys looking any kind of way that could draw extra attention, all right? Just in case. In case? Alicia asked in a panicky voice that felt like a knife slicing through my heart. What do you mean, in case? In case of what? I don't know. I don't know, okay? What makes you think I know anything you guys don't? Do you think I have some kind of ESP that lets me in on whatever the hell is going on 45 minutes away? I hate to disappoint you, but I don't. I don't have a clue. In the middle of pulling my cover up over my head, I stopped and stared at Brad. He had never spoken to Alicia that way, at least not that I was aware of. That was when I really started to feel afraid. We had all been just hanging out, the day playing out as perfectly as we could have hoped for, when the ground beneath us shook. The ground actually shook, and for a crazy second, I was sure we were experiencing the first ever earthquake on Galveston Island. At least, the first I'd ever heard of. Except this shaking didn't originate in Galveston. I don't know how I knew that, but I did. What we were experiencing was a kind of ripple effect. The shaking we felt was like the furthest rings of the ripples in a pond caused by a falling stone. And it hadn't just been the shaking, either. The shaking was bad. The massive deep-sounding boom was worse. Because the boom didn't originate in Galveston either. It was coming from Houston. Even an hour away from the city all three of us called home, we could hear this boom, the kind of noise that rattled a person all the way down to their insides. So sure the ground shaking underneath us was scary, but the sound was worse. The sound was utterly terrifying. It was the sound that made it clear something was really wrong. The kind of something was wrong that people saw on the news in far-off countries they never planned on visiting. Except this wasn't happening in another country. This was happening in my home, and I had no idea what was going on. As I did my best to stay calm, to stay rational, Alicia began to cry. I knew it was the combination of everything going on around her. It was the ground that still vibrated beneath our feet, in a way the ground wasn't supposed to move. It was that sound, a sound I could still feel rattling in my teeth. It was also the way Brad had spoken to her. I had a feeling that Brad's tone might have been the thing that had upset her the most. He was always so good with her, always treated her like she was the best thing on the planet, even when they were ribbing each other. Something they did more often than not. His face fell when he understood what he did. Oh man, come here, Alicia. Come here. No, she said still crying, her voice sounding sullen like a little kid. No, I don't want to. Come on, Alicia, I'm sorry. I'm so freaking sorry. Alicia went to him then letting him fold her up in his arms and really starting to sob. Even with everything going on, with the world practically falling down around our ears, I felt a little twinge of happiness for them. I had a feeling this would be the moment they would point back to in the months, hopefully years, to come. This would be the moment they finally realized they were meant to be more than friends. About time, I thought to myself with an internal smile. About freaking time. Then I thought I was crazy for stopping to think about that kind of a thing at all, given the circumstances. Because there was something I hadn't thought about yet, wasn't there? There was something I needed to think about, something very, very important. When it hit me, I felt like a great idiot for it not having been the first thing to pop into my mind. Ricky. What? What did you say, Lily? Ricky, I said louder this time trying my best to keep the panic rising in my chest at bay and doing a pretty poor job, Ricky. My stepmom too. We've got to figure out what's going on, guys. 
We need to figure out what just happened, and we need to make sure our families are okay. Okay, you're 100% right. Hold on just a second. I'll call my dad. He'll know. He'll explain everything. The look of relief on Brad's face was complete. I knew he must feel like he was supposed to be acting as the man in the situation, which had to suck when a guy was only 18 and probably every bit as afraid as the chicks he was hanging out with. But me saying that we needed to know what was happening had given him a course of action to follow, and having that made him feel better. He would call his dad. Brad's father was a super important lawyer in Houston, one of the biggest ones. He would know what was going on. Of course he would. I felt hope start to take root in my heart, hope that we were being childish and letting our imaginations run away with us. It was a hope that was, unfortunately, very short-lived. As Brad held the phone to his ear, that expectant look slowly faded, replaced with one of dumbfounded fear. I could see what he was going to say, before he even opened his mouth. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew exactly what was coming. There's nothing. Nothing? What do you mean, nothing? What does that even mean? Alicia screeched. Even when I knew what was coming, I still couldn't believe it. There's nothing. No signal. Nothing. Lily try yours, will you? I dug my phone out of my bag, knowing it was pointless but doing it just in case. I wanted so badly for this to be no big deal. But I had a gut feeling. And sadly, my gut feelings were usually right. I wanted my phone to work, and for us to get some information and then all have a good laugh about how jumpy we were being. Too many horror movies, that was all. Too much bad TV. No such luck. I shook my head. Mine's the same. The phone lines are down. There isn't any service at all. I did a slow circle as I spoke, looking at all of the stunned, somehow drugged-looking people sharing the beach with us. Many of them had phones clutched in their own hands, some of them even shaking them, slapping their battery packs as if doing so would cause the cell towers to be operational again. Oh man. We are so screwed. At that moment I realized how much people, including me, relied on our technology, and how lost we were without it. Nobody had even moved more than a couple of steps. We were all just standing around like cattle, waiting for someone to tell us what to do. Come on guys, I said in a low urgent voice I hardly recognized as my own. We need to go. Like now. Go. Alicia asked in a whimper. Brad pulled her in even closer. We're supposed to go. We don't even know what's happening, she continued. You're right we don't, and neither do any of the people around us. Do you see them, Alicia? Are you seeing this? Nobody has moved, at least not yet. But they will. People are going to start to panic. And I have a feeling it's going to happen sooner rather than later. We need to get out of here while we still can. If we wait much longer, there's going to be a stampede and we'll be stuck here. I don't know about you, but if something really bad is happening, I don't want to be stuck on an island. I saw the horror of that thought dawn on both of their faces. I wasn't trying to freak them out, not really, but they needed to realize that being stranded on Galveston Island was a real possibility. It wasn't like there were a whole lot of ways to get off of it after all, and that one big bridge wasn't meant for the kind of traffic a mass exodus was going to cause. If we were going to go, we needed to do it like yesterday. I gathered up the towels and nodded at Brad to grab the cooler. I gave them a steady look, trying to seem as calm as I could. What I had said was right, we needed to go, but if at all possible we needed to do it without drawing any more attention than absolutely necessary. I had an awful vision in my mind of us getting up to go and starting a kind of stampede where every person on the beach was trying to get out at the exact same time. It was going to happen, that was inevitable, but I was hoping to get on the road while everyone was still too stunned to move. Luckily, Alicia and Brad seemed to catch my drift without me having to say anything, and they followed me quietly, all three of us walking slow and steady, as if we didn't have a care in the world. 
it felt like it took a thousand years to get to the car. Miraculously, by the time we'd strapped ourselves in, nobody else on the beach had taken our lead yet. It was the eeriest feeling, like the whole world had been put on pause except for the three of us. I was grateful for the head start, but it was still an unpleasant sensation. It made the sense of dread all that much worse, and it was already pretty freaking high to begin with. It wasn't until we were pulling out of the parking area and onto the street that we heard the first scream. Alicia flinched in the seat in front of me. Brad grabbed her hand and held it tight, his knuckles turning white. I twisted around in my seat, not wanting to see what was going on, but powerless to stop myself from looking. Whatever spell had held everyone where they stood, had broken. There was that first scream, then another, and then the panic began in earnest. What looked like a hundred people, probably many more than that, all started to move at the exact same time. People were getting knocked over, some of them trampled by the people running just behind them. I faced forward again. There was nothing I needed to see back there. It was every bit as terrible as I had imagined it would be, but I didn't need to see it. Everything I needed was in front of me, starting with getting back to Houston. Chapter 4 Lily The radio stations had no reception. None. Were they even working at all? Brad kept fidgeting with the buttons and got a big fat nothing. Oh my god. This is its oh my god. Alicia had calmed down some on the ride, and when she spoke again it was with the dull tone of someone in shock. Not that there was much of anything else that needed to be said about what we were looking at. Oh, oh my god pretty much summed it up. Things had gone pretty smoothly for the first part of our drive. There were a couple of other cars that had the same idea as us, knowing how important it was to move as quickly as possible, but for the most part the roads had been pretty good. The closer we got to Houston however, the less true that had become. And what we were looking at now. There were almost no words to describe it. It was more like a war zone than the city we had grown up in. I hadn't moved to Houston by choice, and I'd never thought I had much love for the place, but seeing it like this made me want to cry. That's how things always go, isn't it? So often a person didn't realize how much they cared about something until it was gone. What happened here? Brad's voice was thick with emotion and confusion. I had a feeling his thoughts were moving along the same line as my own. Alicia, after her oh my god comment had gone silent. She only looked out the window, face pale and eyes wide. It really was like a war zone. The streets we drove through were broken and cracked, the sidewalks totally demolished in some places. It looked like there had been an earthquake, although a little voice in my head told me it was something else, something not quite so easily explained. It was starting to get dark, a darkness that seemed to be both descending and deepening with unnatural speed, and the whole city was falling dark. The power was out. It wasn't just in certain pockets or certain neighborhoods either. From what I could tell, the power was out in the entire city. The only lights to see by were the multiple little fires that had popped up, either due to disaster or man-made. There were people too. There were people out on the streets, in a way I hadn't ever seen before. They moved like zombies, walking right down the middle of roads, heedless of the cars that might be trying to drive there. It looked to me like the rules most of us followed, or at least tried to follow, from day to day had ceased to apply. People were doing whatever they wanted to. I realized just how dangerous that was when Brad stopped, beating his steering wheel in frustration as a herd of people stumbled across the road in front of us. Shit, he shouted, beating the steering wheel a few more times for good measure, don't they see that there's a car here? Don't they know this is a road? For driving? I don't know if they do, at least not anymore. I'm not sure they have much of a clue what's going on. I could feel the tension in the car, knew that my friends didn't like hearing that, but they couldn't exactly deny it. At the moment, we were driving through a neighborhood called The Heights. It was one of the nicer neighborhoods in Houston. My favorite neighborhood, actually. No way did I live there, it was much too expensive for that, but I lived in an area of downtown that was close enough for me to reach the heights by bike. 
It was the kind of neighborhood I imagined myself living in when I got older, when I was successful and free of my not-so-awesome childhood. I think my love for the area was part of what made seeing it like that so jarring. This neighborhood full of good, decent people. It always looked so beautiful and picturesque, but at the moment it was a lot more like a scene out of one of those post-apocalyptic movies. Maybe the fact that it was usually such a friendly, nice neighborhood made it harder for the inhabitants to deal with whatever awful thing was happening. So there they were, walking the streets, looking around them like they had no idea who or where they were. I felt terrible for them, and opened my mouth to say something to Brad about my observations, when something slammed into the hood of Brad's car. All three of us jumped, and I let out a little yelk of surprise and fear, an act one immediately regretted, though it wasn't like I planned it. Something told me that it was beyond important for me to get a really good grip on myself, on my emotions. Something told me that was a skill I was going to need in the future. When I looked up I saw three lanky guys, somewhere between boyhood and manhood, doing their best to surround the car. God, what I would have given at that moment to have some street lights. The ordeal was made infinitely more frightening, because it was in such deep dark. Yo. You, why don't you step out of the car? Yeah man, why don't you step out of the car? Bring your little girlfriends with you. Brad froze. Alicia and I froze. It didn't seem like this was even happening. It had to be some kind of a bad dream, and if I closed my eyes and opened them again, I would be on the beach waking up from an unpleasant nap. When I saw the third guy, the guy who had pounded his fist on the car and hadn't spoken a word, pull out a gun, and I knew it wasn't a dream after all. He had the strangest grin on his face, almost sad, like he wished he wasn't having to do such an unpleasant thing. When he made eye contact with me, my heart stopped beating in my chest. It was yet another moment where I got the impression that time was standing still, and that the decisions I made before it started moving again were terribly important. No hard feelings, right sister? Nothing against you and your friends. Just how things are in a state of emergency, right? Each of us out for ourselves. The boy man with the gun gave me another sad smile, his friends laughing hysterically as if he had just made the funniest joke in the world. I didn't see anything funny, but what he said got to me. A state of emergency. I guess I had already known that was what we were in, but there was something about hearing it out loud. We were now in a state of emergency which meant looting, crime, all of those things from the movies. That's what was happening. These guys were going to get us out of the car and rob us. If we were lucky, they would only take the car afterward. Cars were going to become a big commodity if things kept going the way they were. If we were unlucky, they would pull us out of the car, take what they wanted, and shoot us like dogs in the street. It wasn't like there were going to be any cops that came after them and told them to stop and put their hands up. There was probably so much crime going on in the city, a city with a disturbing amount of crime on a normal day-to-day -day basis, at the moment that the chances of these boys getting stopped or caught were one in a million. If we got out of the car, we were going to be in major trouble. All of a sudden, I understood what we had to do. Up to this point, I hadn't been treating the situation with the seriousness it deserved, but I finally got it. I knew things were do or die. Go Brad. What? What did you say? He glanced back at me. Go. I said a little bit louder, still quiet but with enough force to make Alicia turn to look at me with incredulous, uncomprehending eyes. Go now. Don't wait for them to move, because they aren't going to. Just put your foot on the gas pedal and floor it. Are you crazy? If I do that, I'm going to hit them. I can't just hit them. That's illegal. Yeah? Yeah, you're right it is. As is shooting somebody, but I don't see any cops, do you? If you don't want to listen to me, you don't have to. But they're going to hurt us, or at the very least, take your jeep. So, if you want to wait around and take a gamble, go ahead. But if you want to make it out of this alive, go. Brad went. Alicia let out a scream and covered her eyes, but Brad did exactly as I told him to. He put his foot on the gas, 
not hard enough to shoot forward at 60 miles an hour, but still hard enough to scare the guys who were bothering us. They jumped aside, shouting profanities, and as we sped off past them, they started to shoot at us. Luckily, they weren't very good shots, but it was still totally terrifying. I had been right. Those guys would have shot us, no problem. They would have shot us because times like this were the times when lawless people thrived. We were in a state of emergency, all right, and we were all going to have to adjust our way of thinking about the world. After that, we rode in silence. It didn't feel like there was a whole lot left for us to say. We'd almost run someone over, been shot at. Ever since then, we'd been taking the back roads, the roads we thought would have the least amount of traffic. It took forever, and we were all on edge the entire time, but nothing else happened. We could hear people screaming in the distance, more gunshots, but nothing else actually came out to try and hurt us. At least not yet. After what felt like centuries, we got back to my building. I was fighting back waves of panic at that point, thinking about Ricky and Mona, and I hardly stopped to say goodbye to my friends. That was something I would come to regret later. These two people, they were the people I cared about more than anyone in the world other than my family. I should have stopped to say a proper goodbye, but how could I possibly have known the way things would go? I couldn't get up the stairs fast enough. Never in my life had I wished for the elevator to be in working order more than I did in that instance, and every step I took felt like it was taking forever. I could hardly get the key into the lock when I arrived at my front door. My hands were trembling so bad but I did. I flung the door open, running inside without bothering to shut it again. The panic was complete by then, and I felt like I couldn't breathe anymore. Like there was an elephant sitting on my chest, and that if I didn't get it off soon, I was going to suffocate. And it would all be over. Chapter 5 Lily Mona Mona, are you here? Ricky? It was so dark inside, so terribly dark, and it only made the feeling of suffocating worse. Why hadn't my stepmom gotten out some candles or something? I knew she had them, lots of them. It wasn't because she was the type to be prepared for a disaster or anything like that, she was way far from being that kind of a person. But she was a bit of a hoarder, for specific things anyway, and candles happened to be one of the things she liked to collect the word she always used any time I hinted at the idea that she might have a problem with hoarding things. I knew there had to be close to 300 candles stashed throughout our sad little apartment, quite possibly more. So then why was it so freaking dark inside? Why hadn't she lit a candle or five? And what about Ricky? It was way, way past the time when school should have been let out, and one of his friend's moms always drove him home from school. If push had come to shove, he could have walked home. We were honestly close enough for that. So then why hadn't he gotten out some candles and lit them? Sure, there were some 12-year-old kids who wouldn't have thought to do that, who would have just panicked when the world started falling apart, but Ricky wasn't that kind of a kid. All of that terrible stuff with my stepmom's boyfriends and Ricky's leg had made him wise well beyond his years. Ricky would have known what to do. He would have lit the candles and waited for me to get home. If it was dark like this, that meant he wasn't here to do it. Either that, or he was home, and for some reason he couldn't do it. Mona. Ricky. Where are you guys? A moan from the direction of the couch caught my attention, and I hurried that way. It was too dark though, and I caught the corner of the coffee table and went sprawling. Something rolled off over the edge, clunking me on the head, only serving to compound my frustration until I realized that it was a candle, that is, and then I was over the moon. I got up on my hands and knees, feeling around of the table's surface for one of the many lighters Mona kept lying around. With my luck, this would have been one of the days when she went on her rare cleaning binges and put them all away, but in this matter, it seemed that luck really was on my side. It only took a moment or two of blind groping, before my palm landed on a lighter and I got the candle lit. After a second of my eyes fighting to adjust to this new source of light, I looked back to the couch, almost afraid of what I was going to find. Mona. Oh God Mona. What the hell? 
She wasn't hurt, nothing like that, thank God, but she was very much passed out. She was on the couch, flat on her back with an empty handle of a bottle jack clutched in her hand. From the looks of it, she hadn't slowed down after I had left for Galveston. If anything, she must have sped up, and with the amount that had been left in the bottle when I'd walked out the front door, and the fact that it was now completely empty, she had probably spent her entire day drinking. She was passed out cold. It seemed likely to me that she had been out since before the explosion that had rocked our world and made it feel like it had broken it in half. She probably didn't even know there was anything out of the ordinary going on. Didn't know that her 12-year-old stepson, the one who was handicapped because of a man she had brought into our lives, hadn't even made it home. I was so angry at her that I stood up quickly, grabbing the other candle off the table and lighting it to use as a makeshift torch. In my heart, I knew I wasn't going to find Ricky. If he was here, he would have said something by now. But I had to be sure. Somebody had to try and look after him, and clearly that somebody wasn't going to be my stepmom. And besides, if I stayed where I was, kneeling beside my drunk passed out stepmother, I would do something I regretted. I wanted to punch her. Settle down, Lily, I cautioned myself. Once again, I reminded myself that now was not the time to lose my cool. Actually, it had never before been so important that I keep a level head. That was going to be an imperative if I was going to navigate my little family to a situation that was at least halfway safe. Ricky? You here, buddy? Nothing. It didn't necessarily mean he wasn't there. Ricky was a sensitive kid, much more sensitive than I was. Neither one of us enjoyed Mona's excessive drinking, but it was way harder on him than it was on me. Some of it was because he had suffered the worst violence as a result of Mona's wild behavior, but I was pretty sure it was more than that. I thought that being around Mona when she got the way she so often did, when she got the way I had no doubt she had been earlier in the day, was pretty awful for him. It hurt his heart. I could see it in his eyes when he looked at her. It hurt him, and so he would do his very best not to have to be around it at all. He would hole up in his room, hiding under his bed or in a closet with a flashlight and the comic books he loved so much. When he didn't like the world he found around him, he would make one for himself that was better. Maybe that was all that was going on now. Maybe he was just in hiding, and a thorough searching of the apartment would reveal him to me. Not so. I looked under every bed, in every closet. I looked in every little nook and cranny of the sparse, dingy apartment. I looked in places a kid his age couldn't possibly fit, and when I didn't find him in the apartment, I went down to the laundry room just to make sure he hadn't felt the need to go hide there. Nothing. As much as I wanted him to be, Ricky just wasn't there. I sprinted back up to the apartment. There was too much adrenaline pumping through my body for me to be tired, and skirted the coffee table, careful to avoid running into it and knocking over the candle. The last thing I needed was to start some kind of a fire. I knelt beside my stepmother again and looked into her face, trying very hard to feel compassion for her along with my disbelief and anger. Mona. It's time to wake up now, okay? You've got to wake up. You've got to. Nothing. She didn't even flinch, like even the unconscious part of her that was still an adult, and a mother figure didn't hear me calling. Normally, I would have just rolled my eyes and gone about my business, but that kind of thing just wasn't going to fly. For once in her life, I needed my stepmother to act like a grown-up, even if I had to drag it to her kicking and screaming. Mona. Mona, this isn't funny. You need to wake up. You've got to help me find Ricky, okay? Something's wrong. Something is very, very wrong out there, and I can't find Ricky anywhere. So get up. Still nothing. I shook her gently at first and then with increasing roughness. Finally, I resorted to actually slapping her across the face, hoping that it would be enough to jolt her out of whatever drunken stupor she was in, but it got me nowhere. Mona was out cold, and apparently there wasn't a thing I could do about it. I was on my own. 
The world was going to hell in a handbasket, and I was completely on my own. I guess everyone has the realization that they really do have to be adults at some point or another, and this happens to be mine. But seriously? Couldn't I have had a little bit less stressful of a moment to usher me into adulthood? Did it have to go along with this bizarre, impending doom? Stop it, Lily, I chastised myself. Feeling sorry for myself wasn't going to help anything, and it sure wasn't going to find my brother. Nobody was going to find Ricky but me. Not my stepmother, not the cops, not some knight in shining armor who would appear out of nowhere and save the day. I was going to have to be in charge of saving my own day, whether I liked it or not. I took one last look at my stepmom, then headed out the door with nothing but a knapsack packed with a few items I thought I might need along the way. Not that I really had any clue about that. I didn't know where I was going, and I didn't know how long I would be gone. Until I find Ricky. That's how long. I knocked on doors as I went down the hall, but only the ones where I knew Ricky had a friend. Ours wasn't exactly the safest building, and this wasn't a good time to go out trying to meet the neighbors, but I also knew that there was a chance that Ricky had run off to a friend's place when he realized things were getting bad, and Mona was down for the count. So I knocked. Not a single one of them gave me an answer. I could understand it, really. I probably wouldn't have answered either if my family had been all safe and sound, but that didn't mean I wasn't frustrated. At one point, I got frustrated enough to start kicking on a door, hoping it would piss the inhabitants off enough to force them to talk to me, but no such luck. Nobody was going to talk to me. It was time to head outside. Chapter 6 Lily I would never be able to say how long I searched for Ricky, never be able to get any kind of grasp on the way time passed during that terrifying time. All I knew was that nobody had seen my brother. I found a little cluster of boys Ricky sometimes hung around with, huddled on the side of a building, discussing the idea of robbing the corner store a half a block away. I heard them before I saw them, and made sure to make enough noise to let them know I was coming. They were just kids, but if they were working up to robbing places, they may have already gotten themselves some weapons. Whoa. Whoa there, hold up, one said, wielding a bat. Another one stepped in front of him, putting his hand on the bat, forcing him to lower it. Calm down, it's Lily. What's happening, Lily? Where's my man Ricky? I nodded my appreciation. I was kind of hoping you could tell me that. He's not in the apartment. And my stepmom, I shook my head then shrugged. She doesn't know where he is. The boys exchanged glances, the looks on their faces telling me they knew all about my stepmom. I could tell that they didn't have a clue where my brother was. My heart sank. It was so dark and Houston was so awfully big. The city was in chaos, some unknown disaster ripping it apart, and my brother was out in it somewhere all on his own. God alone knew what kind of things might find him, what they would do to him once they did. I had no idea where to look for him, but I knew I couldn't give up. I was going to keep looking until I either found him or something got in my way. As if I'd let anything get in my way. I glanced at his friends again and saw that one of them, the oldest and biggest, had a bike propped up against the wall. Hey Eddie, any chance you'd do me a huge favor? I asked. Maybe depends. What you want? Let me borrow the bike? Ricky's gone, and I have to go and find him. You guys know how he is. I can't just leave him out there. I can't do that. Sure, I'll let you use it, but what you gonna give me? Little brat. I narrowed my eyes, appraising him. What do you want? He raised his brows suggestively. A kiss? Seriously? I contemplated kicking his butt. Eddie, please. You're 13. How about you let me use your bike, and I give you my undying gratitude? Sound like something you could live with? Shoot, not my first choice, but I guess I'll play along. But hey, Lily? Yeah? Be careful out there, all right? It's dangerous. This city, it's full of boogeymen right now, and they are feeling frisky. 
The other guys made haunted house noises intermingled with wolf whistles. I swung my leg over the bike. He definitely wasn't wrong about that. The city was full of dangers. Dangerous people, dangerous streets. The city was like a minefield, and I was doing my very best to navigate it. I wouldn't have done it for anyone else but Ricky. He was my heart. He was my little ally. No way was I going to leave him to suffer this on his own. I threaded Eddie's bike through the streets without even knowing where I was going. A little voice deep inside of me, a voice I didn't recognize and hadn't heard before, dictated the path I took. I half hoped that it was some kind of a link to Ricky, that it was calling me to him. It was a long shot, but that didn't mean it wasn't possible. Probably not. Maybe it was that woman's intuition thing that Mona kept insisting I had. But then off in the distance I saw a host of bright lights. It might not have been so noticeable if everything in Houston was up and running properly, but with the city so dark, it was impossible to miss. I had no idea what it was, nonetheless it gave me the first real hope I had experienced since I felt the ground shake, and I clung to it like my life depended on it. Maybe it was some kind of government thing, like FEMA or something, coming to help us get back on our feet. They do that, right? It didn't look like it was too far away, either. That's when a plan solidified in my head. I would ride out to the source of the light, find out what it was. If it was a government entity, the way I thought it was, I would plead with them until they helped me find Ricky. It wasn't the best plan, but it would work. At least that's what I thought at the time. Then again, I had no idea what I was actually riding the bike into. Had I known that, I might have just ridden myself home. Or I might have done things in exactly the same way. Chapter 7 Lily I had been so completely sure that I would find a whole host of cops, or government officials or whoever it was, that swept in and took care of everything. So very sure. And so very wrong. When I got to the source of the light, for a minute, I actually believed that I saw them. They were so real to me. They were so real I felt like I could reach out and touch them, like all I had to do was walk the bike up to one of the very important and official-looking men, and that would be that. It would be only a matter of minutes until everyone sprang into action. They would all drop what they were doing, regardless of how important their tasks may have been, and go to work to bring my little brother back to me. Pretty stupid, huh? Like a whole bunch of government dudes would have stopped all of their important work just to help me. It was the kind of wishful thinking found in little kids or daydreamers, and I was no longer either one of those. So for that one moment, I saw my help had arrived. Then I blinked and it was gone. I was looking at a field full of cows. I must have ridden much further than I thought, but other than that, there wasn't another soul aside from me and the livestock. Oh my God. What is that? I had found the source of the light, and it definitely wasn't coming from the good guys sweeping in to save the day. Instead, it appeared to be coming from the ground itself. In the middle of the field, with cows ambling past it like it was no big deal, was a massive trench. It looked like the very fabric of the world had ripped, like someone had stretched until the seams burst. The smart thing would probably have been to go along my merry way, but that's not what I did. I couldn't. Out of that big old rip, poured a crystal blue light that looked cleaner than anything that came from planet Earth. Even the soil on the lip of the tear the light came out of looked somehow, healthier. The light seemed to be drawing me forward, pulling me toward it. I was powerless to resist. The closer I got, the more certain I became that this trench, this unearthly light, had something to do with all of the craziness erupting in the city. I was pretty sure it was the root of everything, and I didn't think it had come from natural causes either. I should have run. But no. Not me. Not stupid Lily Rogers, who didn't know any better than to mind her own business and hunt for her brother and ignore the blue light, whether it was the cause for Houston's pandemonium or not. I could have, might have, stood there looking into that chasm for the whole night, mesmerized, transfixed, all thoughts of my stepmother or my missing brother totally forgotten. 
It had a hypnotic quality, and I might not have been strong enough to pull myself away without some kind of intervention. Luckily, or maybe unluckily, that intervention came in the strangest possible way. It started with a rustling in the bushes and trees. My eyes tore themselves away from the eerily beautiful blue light and towards the line of trees at the furthest edge of the clearing. For the first time, I became acutely aware of how lost I was. In the six years I had lived in Houston, I'd never even seen a pasture full of cattle, and yet somehow I had made my way to the middle of one. And now something was coming. No, 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 no. I hissed the words in my mind, to the cattle, maybe to the light itself. How could I have been so stupid? Houston was a dangerous city at the best of times, and I was wandering around like some kind of explorer discovering the new world, instead of a 17-year-old kid in the middle of a disaster zone. To make matters worse, because I was in the middle of a field, there wasn't really anywhere to hide. I was out in the open, totally exposed without any idea what was coming towards me. Feeling the panic rising inside of me, I dropped to the ground, staying on my belly and hoping that whoever was coming would be more interested in the light than they would be in looking at their surroundings. That was my only plan, to just lie there in the grass until I was alone again, hoping not to get stepped on by a cow. Stop. A male voice. I wondered if he was talking to me. Stop what? I opted for silence and playing dead rather than asking. This was a good call, I found out in the next moment. Another voice said, quit talking. Just get him. Get him and that'll stop him. And I wondered who him was. And who was chasing him. Chapter 8 Lily The rustling in the trees grew louder and louder, and any secret hope that the intruders would choose a path that would take them away from me was dashed. Whoever was coming was headed straight towards me, and at first I thought there were more than one of them, at least three, but from the sound of it I decided probably more. Finally, the group tumbled out of the thick trees, revealing themselves to me. I let out a strangled gasp, before getting enough control over myself to clamp my hand over my mouth. If I hadn't had the presence of mind to do that, I'm sure I would have started screaming. There was only so much a person could take in one day, and at that point I had well exceeded my limit. There were four of them, one more than I had initially guessed, and all four of them were barreling towards the tear in the ground from which the light was coming. It looked almost like they were racing, or maybe playing a friendly game of tag, but from what I'd heard of their conversation, I knew it was more than that. This wasn't a game, it was a fight, a chase with perhaps deadly intent, and it looked like it was three against one. That was the first thing I noticed. The second thing was their skin. That was the thing that had caused me to gasp, the thing that was still making my stomach do crazy flip-flops. I don't think I could have moved even if I wanted to, at that point. I felt every bit as rooted to the ground as the grass I was laying on. At first sight, the men's skin looked about the same as anyone else's. The closer they got to the light, however, I realized that they were nothing like me. They had nothing like human skin at all. There was something reptilian about it, something serpentine. It looked opaque, but I got the uncomfortable feeling that in certain light, I might be able to see through multiple layers. Even stranger, as if people with skin which resembled a lizard wasn't already strange enough, was the fact that it appeared to be glowing. It was like these men's skins fed off of the light coming from the cracked earth, like they drew power from it. Two of the men had skin a shade somewhere between yellow and green. The one who was being chased, the target of the hunt, had skin the color of silver white and a thick shock of hair nearly the same color. He looked like a statue come to life, beautiful and terrifying at the same time. The other was dark, so dark his skin was almost black. His golden brown eyes glowed in the night. A circling ensued between the silver one and the dark one. Their eyes remained locked, their bodies rigid. I was watching a game of cat and mouse, a battle of good and evil, and I didn't even know which side I was supposed to be rooting for. Then again, I wasn't sure I should even root for beings that looked like this. Maybe if they would distract one another, I could do a kind of an army crawl out of there. 
I might be able to hop on my bike and haul ass, get away from these things without them ever realizing I was there. Then the battle began. Now there was a phrase I never thought I would be using outside of a creative writing class. But there was no other way to say it. It was a battle in earnest, the four strange men taking their fighting stances, each one making it clear through his footing that he did not intend to be taken down. I almost let out another gasp when I saw the rods each pulled out from sheath-like holsters beneath their jackets, strange things to be wearing at all in May in Houston. That wasn't why I was so startled, of course. I was startled because the rods they had all pulled out lit up once firmly grasped, each with a gem on the end of it. As if that weren't bizarre enough, each man flicked his wrist as if he was trying to shoo away a bothersome insect, and the rods became full-length staffs. These guys, whatever they were, weren't small by any stretch of the imagination. Each guy had to at least six foot tall. That said, the staffs were pretty massive, hovering just above the men's heads. The silver-white guy thumped the base of his staff on the ground, creating a little divot where it hit. The sound that came off of it was that of a gong being hit with a large mallet. Despite my fear, I was gripped with a burning curiosity as to what those staffs were made of. What were the crystals adorning their tops? What was the purpose? Are you sure you want to do this? The dark one asked. Are you? The silver one countered. I found myself rooting for the silver one. He was outnumbered. I was always an underdog kind of girl. Please, the dark one responded. Do you think anything happens that I don't know about? Be warned, this is a fight you cannot win. Are you so sure of that? Oh man, the dark one clearly didn't like that. Apparently, he wasn't a guy who was used to being argued with and it showed on his face. He wielded the staff up over his head, pointing the end with the stone in the direction of his opponent. When he did that, the other ones raised their staffs as well. They stayed that way, frozen in place, and I got the weirdest idea that this would make a fantastic painting, the kind that would hang in one of the hipster galleries in the city and sell for boatloads of money. Then the moment was gone, and everything began moving very quickly. There's nowhere left for you to run, one of the green guys snarled. Nowhere to run and nobody to turn to. He's right, his lookalike snarled in return. Two bullies, feeding off of the other one's negative energy. One lunged forward. The silver one easily sidestepped. Instead of making the contact he had been so sure he was going to make, the greenish one went stumbling forward, lost his balance and almost tumbled, and then righted himself again. He turned, whirled around and struck out at the place he assumed his foe must surely be now, but the silver stranger was much too fast for him. He darted back and forth, moving from one place to the next with impossible speed. To my eyes it looked like he was teleporting instead of running, but the occasional silver streak told me that he was just much faster than any living being I had seen before. I was pretty sure he could triumph, and had he only been facing them only, he would have been victorious without any problem at all. But it wasn't just the two of them. There was also the dark one, and he was far more formidable than the other two combined. While the silver guy and the other two were engaged, he strode up behind them, a look of bleak determination on his face. The silver guy didn't see him, a mistake I could understand given the crazy circumstances but knew could be deadly all the same. I wanted to call out to him, even went so far as to stand up and start toward the skirmish, clearly having forgotten my own safety. I didn't get the chance to warn him. At the very moment when I was in the process of rising, the dark one struck from behind, sending the silver guy sprawling. He flew through the air, landing dangerously close to the place where the earth had split open. Upon impact, the staff in his hand went flying, landing far enough away from him that he couldn't reach it, but super close to me. I looked at the staff as if it were a serpent, suspicious and at the same time curious. The dark guy descended on silver, baiting him, drawing out the process of his victory. I didn't think. I acted. It was that stinking underdog instinct of mine, probably imprinted in my DNA after having to protect Ricky all those years. Without help, that guy was going to die. I couldn't just stand back and do nothing. I lunged into a sprint, desperate to reach that staff before it was too late. 
It was a decision that would change the rest of my life. It was a decision I didn't give a single thought at all. Chapter 9 Cade Are you sorry now? Declan whispered, his dark, motionless face peering down at me with a kind of morbid curiosity. Such a fruitless endeavor. Sorry? No. Not ever, I scoffed, though look at me now in a pasture with bovines in the above ground, fighting for my life. Everyone wants to be the crusader, until they realize what that actually means, Declan continued. Save the lecture. You're not qualified to give one. I wasn't interested in his theories. We were on opposite sides of the spectrum when it came to the matter, and I hadn't come all of this way to lie there on the ground while Declan lorded over me, and I wasn't interested in contributing to his enjoyment. Still, this wasn't how I had figured on things going. At all. Somehow, in my mind, this trip would have gone off without a hitch. It was stupid. It was hubris, and hubris never brought anyone anything but pain. I knew that. Do you have any last words? Declan raised a brow. I think I've covered it. Declan though, he simply smiled at me, that strangely peaceful smile that frightened most others, but only ever succeeded in pissing me off. He looked contemplatively at his staff, rolling it in his hands as if he'd never seen it before, but thought it looked like it might come in handy. Then he raised it up over his head, his dark form towering above me with nothing but death in his eyes. My death. He was looking at me, and my own death was staring back in my direction. I looked longingly towards my staff, knowing that if I had only managed to hold on to it, I would be in the clear. That's when I saw her. A girl, half crouched as she ran, was approaching my staff with surprising speed. She glanced up. Her eyes locked with mine. There was a jolt of understanding, and no time for me to call out for her to leave well enough alone. I looked back up at Declan, my face as calm as I could manage while my insides roiled like the worst kind of storm. No, I yelled, knowing Declan would think that I was talking to him, when really I was warning the innocent bystander to stay away from my staff, which she couldn't use anyway, and to get out of the area before Declan or his friends saw her. The attention I had spared for the girl was enough time for Declan and his guys to move in on me, and all three of their staffs grazed my skin at the exact same time. Each place that the gems of the staffs made contact with my skin started to smoke and sizzle. I let out another cry, this time one of agony, hating myself for not being strong enough to stay silent. I rolled from side to side, desperate to quiet the pain ripping through my body, desperate to stand, to be on something remotely close to even footing with my enemies. I couldn't manage it though. They wouldn't let me. I was like some kind of wild animal being herded. They had me caught between their three staffs, and any time I moved from one to try and escape, there was another one to singe me again. So then, this was how they were going to take me out. They were going to torture me, and then they were going to kill me. This was not how I wanted to die. I wanted my death to be swift. I didn't expect it to be painless, but by the curses, I wanted it to be swift. Back off. I I I mean it, okay? The girl. Her voice shook almost as much as her hands as she attempted to wield my staff. Yes, attempted because it was much taller than she. Curse the ages. It was the girl. The same girl who'd locked eyes with me and ignored my attempt to keep her away. Declan's guys looked quickly to the left, their eyes widening with surprise. For a brief second, Declan and I continued to stare each other down. I knew what this new distraction was, as unbelievable as it was, but did he? I could see Declan's frustration etched in the hard set of his face, the line of his mouth that quickly pulled back into a snarl. Finally, his eyes tore themselves from mine, allowing me to look over my shoulder and again surveil the one who was crazy enough to get in the middle of this whole mess. Drop it. I don't know what the flip that thing is, and I don't care. Drop it. Right now, she yelled. If this weren't a matter of life or death, I'd have thought she looked cute standing there holding my staff trying to look tough. Go? Declan's voice was firm. I looked at Declan. Go? Who was supposed to go? Her. 
I'd expected him to kill her, not send her away. The girl looked at him in confusion too, like a little chihuahua threatening a German shepherd and actually getting away with it. Go wasn't the word either of us had expected him to utter, and neither of us really knew whom he was talking to. Declan let out a roar of anger, then spun around to face his men. Their horrified looks were almost comical, although nobody seemed to feel much like laughing at the moment. He raised the hand with the staff again, the onyx orb at the end of it glowing and pulsing rhythmically. His men shrank back even further, no desire to be the targets of his wrath. Go? He roared again, go. Now. Go back from whence we came. I'll follow. The girl's mouth dropped open, as if she'd bluffed and been taken seriously, and now was stunned. She had no idea the damage that Declan could have wreaked on her, had he chosen to. The two his sheep, as I like to think of them, for that was exactly how they behaved, exchanged uncertain glances. Without giving so much as another glance at the girl who had foiled their plans, they sprinted and then leaped into the schism, and were swallowed up. That left only me and Declan. No, not quite. There was also the girl. She still stood motionless, her jaw still dropped, eyes wide open, frozen in place and holding on tightly to my staff, probably holding on so tightly to keep from shaking with fear. I knew that Declan could easily appear fearsome to a human. I wanted to call out to her to toss it to me, to get it to me before it was too late, but even as I opened my mouth to speak, I could feel the heat of Declan's staff on my neck. She wasn't moving. She wasn't going to be my salvation. She was only a frightened girl. I said no. Her tone was fierce. Her glare was aggressive. Gone was the scared mouse. She'd become a lioness, a savior, here to protect me. This would be comical on any other day, in any other circumstance. If she knew what I was, what Declan was, she'd have realized the futility of her efforts. But she didn't, and she had the bravery of the ignorant. And oh, did it make her brave. I pondered this with admiration, though I felt the heat of Declan's staff and knew my own beheading was seconds away. After taking my life, would he take hers? And why did that inspire me to fight even further, to avoid the certain fate? To say I had underestimated the girl would have been a colossal understatement. I really had thought that she was useless and would be lucky to make it out of the blasted field alive. Instead, there she was, running towards us with unexpected speed. Not only that, but she had my staff clutched in both hands and hoisted up on one shoulder. She was headed directly for Declan, a look of fire in her eyes far beyond her years. She was almost upon us before he could even act. He darted to the right, moving further away from me and closer to the schism. The expression on his face was one of shock, and for maybe the first time ever, I could understand where he was coming from. This girl showed no intention of backing down. Declan only got his own staff up just in time to shield himself from a blow that would have been catastrophic. He hunched forward, seemingly understanding that this fight was real, that he could get hurt if he wasn't careful. I struggled to my knees, ready to take control of my staff and finish everything for good. I wouldn't overestimate yourself, girl. This is a dangerous game you're playing. His tone was haughty. Really? Because you're the one who looks scared to me. Now back the F up. Back up. Declan turned to glance behind him, looking into the depths of the schism, and then to the girl. If I back up much further, I'll fall. I have a feeling you'll be fine. And if I'm wrong, well, hey. We all make mistakes, right? I found myself liking her spunk way too much. That's true, we most certainly do. You seem to be making one right now. I don't want to hurt you, but if you don't put that thing down, I won't have a choice. You're forcing my hand, don't you see? Her glare was cold. Nope. That's not how I see it at all. And believe me, I can take care of myself. I'm a lot stronger than I look. Declan gave her a condescending smile, then stormed forward. I lowered myself, preparing to spring to the midst of what would be her slaughter. Once again, she surprised us both. She pivoted her weight on one foot, using it to piston out the other leg. 
she landed a massive kick square in the middle of Declan's chest, causing him to stumble. Relentless she spun my staff in her hand and struck. My staff connected with Declan's face. He leapt to the side, his hand flying up. Ah! You wretch! Enough! His words were pain-filled. Enough is right. You might want to go ahead and join your buddies in that hole in the ground. I don't know what this thing is, she shook my staff making her point. But I think I could get used to it. Just give me a little bit of practice. We'll see what happens. Declan was on his knees now, just like me, his hands splayed out over his face. For a crazy minute, I thought he was crying, but when his fingers moved, I saw what was really going on. She had struck him full on across the face, the shaft of my staff cutting a thick diagonal pathway that started at one corner of his mouth and stretched across the whole of his left eye. That eye was a train wreck. It was nothing but shredded flesh and oozing blood, hardly an eye at all anymore. I had seen many fights in my day, but never in my life had I seen anyone make their mark on Declan. It was unheard of, and it led to another thing I hadn't ever seen with him before. Fear. In the eye that was still good, I could see a cold, curdling fear. He grabbed his staff, struggled to a standing position, lurched forward, and then turned and leaped into the schism. Just like that, we were alone. Chapter 10 Cade At first there was no sound but the crickets and the occasional snort from a passing cow. How anticlimactic to be left with nothing but cattle after a battle like that. A battle I would not have come out on the other side of without the rescue of this girl. Even the idea of it made me angry. The last thing I wanted was to be indebted to this girl especially after looking more closely at her and realizing who she was. That was a very stupid thing to do. Excuse me, she asked in genuine surprise. What did you say? I said that was a very stupid thing to do. Are you talking to me? Still holding onto my staff, using it as kind of a crutch now, she pointed one shaking finger at herself. Of course I'm talking to you. Who else? The cows? Well maybe. It would make a whole lot more sense than you saying it to me. I just saved your butt back there. You know that right? I was fine, I said through clenched teeth with a tongue that felt heavy and sluggish in my mouth. I had it. Um did you? Did you really? Because from where I was standing. Crouching. What? From where you were crouching. You weren't standing, you were crouching. Hiding, I expect. Anyways. From where I was standing, it looked like you were in a pretty tight spot. Pretty much an I'm going to get myself killed kind of a spot. I studied her, with her brown hair with light highlights, which looked like she'd spent time in the sun. Her eyes glowed blue, the gold flecks inside them glowing even brighter. As attractive as I may have found her, she was beginning to irk me with her complete ignorance of the danger she'd put herself in. She needed a lecture. Or a spanking. But who was I to dole out spankings to someone who looked so close to my age? I crossed my arms over my chest, put on my best foreboding look. Do you pretend to understand what's going on here? I warn you, you've got no idea how dangerous the world you're dipping your toe into. No idea. You got lucky with Declan, do you hear me? Assuming that luck translates into skill would be a terrible mistake. But it's your life, right? Do what you want with it. Could you back up please? Her tone was polite. Confused I stared then asked what? Back up. She repeated herself quietly, her voice calm but her face pale and rigid. I'd like it if you could back up. You're scaring me. I have no idea what you're tall. But I did. When I stopped to really listen to what she had asked me, I knew exactly what she was talking about. While I had been delivering my rant, I'd moved closer and closer to the target of my wrath until I was practically nose to nose with her. The fact that she had stood her ground the way she had was impressive, especially considering the fact that she had no idea what I was or what was actually going on here. I took three steps back, breathing deep trying hard to calm myself. To my right, a large brown cow ambled past me, mouth working relentlessly on her cud. 
by the gods, how has it come to this? She looked at me quizzically. The gods? As in plural. What are you talking about? And why do you keep looking at me like that? I honestly don't know what I did to piss you off. I was only trying to help. Guess I forgot that's something we don't do here. Here? On Earth? No, she gave me a look like she was talking to someone who had gone stark raving mad. That would be pretty freaking general, don't you think? I meant here, as in this city. As in Houston. I take it you've never been here before. No, I answered her distractedly. My mind moving a mile a minute and still staring at her incredulously. Not to this, no. I held out my hand. May I have that back now? You mean your staff, right? That's what you want? That must be why you keep giving me the dirty looks. I wasn't planning on keeping it. It's cool and everything, but I'm not a thief. I nodded, unwilling to disrupt her rant. And she continued. There's a natural disaster going on around us, in case you hadn't noticed. I noticed. She took a step toward me. Feeling stupid but powerless to stop it, I held my breath as she handed my staff over. Not having it with me was like lending one of my limbs out to a stranger without so much as a how do you do. I wasn't going to feel right until I had it with me again. When she handed it over, a bolt of light shot from her hand straight into mine. For a moment the two of us were locked together that way, both of our hands clasped around the staff. An unusual burst of light flamed the second we touched it. Or the second our fingertips touched. I had no idea what caused it. Then as soon as it had come, the moment was gone. The girl gasped, shaking her hand as if she had been stung. What the flip was that? A shock. I've never seen anything like that. You've never seen anything like most of this. Tell me, how were you able to hold it? I need to know. What do you mean how, she asked angrily. More startled than hurt, I thought. I picked it up and held it. How does anyone hold anything? Don't try to change the subject. I want to know what that is. I don't have time for this. I still need to find my brother. I studied her. Tell me, what are you that allows you to hold my staff? How did you come to this place? I'm nothing. I'm just a girl looking for her brother, after some freaky explosion that's turned my hometown into a weird apocalyptic war zone. She was fighting tears, it was clear. The girl who defended me, with my own staff, had tears threatening to emerge. Tears or not, lost brother or not, she should not be able to handle my staff. I considered it, turning it in my hands, trying to figure out how she'd been able to get it to mind her. Our staffs did not work this way. Ever. Staffs were unique to their owners. None of that tells me how you found this place. She looked at me as if she'd wished she'd struck me instead of Declan. I'm looking for my brother and my town's blown up, and that's all you're worried about. You're a major D-bag, you know that? She crossed her arms, flung her hair back, and stomped her foot. I followed the light. The light coming out of that trench thingy. The schism? You can see that. I stepped closer, took her by the shoulders, started to shake her. Hey. Seriously weirdo, let me go. I was beyond stunned. It was her. This explained it. It couldn't be anyone else. How was she put right here, so easy a target? This was the girl. This was the girl I was to assassinate. But now. Now nothing made sense. Because she wasn't really a girl at all. She was something far more whether she knew it or not, because she had wielded my staff, and it brought everything I had been told into question. To make matters worse, something was coming. Something we didn't want to be around for. Do you think you can trust me? I asked her. Can I trust you? I don't even know you. There's no time, I insisted, shaking her shoulders again. I need to know if you will trust me just this one time. You saved my life from Declan. I owe you. I need you to trust me. Why? 
because, I hissed in her face, not caring if I scared her senseless, not caring about anything but getting us out of this place. They're coming back. And if you thought what you just saw was bad, just tell me that you can you trust me. I I think so. Her voice was soft. When I change, jump on, okay? Jump on and hold on for dear life. Her whispered response was all the answer I needed. Yes? As Declan and what sounded like a minimum of a dozen more came racing back toward the mouth of the schism, voices raised in anger, I did the only thing I knew to do. I changed into my dragon form and lowered my neck. Miraculously, Lily did not hesitate. She jumped on and we were off. Chapter 11 Lily A dragon Oh. My. God. This couldn't be. Dragons aren't real. Yeah well the smart alecky side of me said, neither are staffs that glow or guys with skin that looks like. I exhaled. Breathe, I reminded myself. Okay, dragons are real. Sitting beside him, I kept repeating that mantra to myself over and over again. The odd and hot guy with the silvery skin had transformed himself into a silvery, metallic dragon. I knew it had happened, I had seen it with my own eyes, but I still couldn't quite believe it. It was just that everything had happened so fast. One minute we had been standing there yelling at each other, something that had probably been a total waste of time to begin with, and the next, he was flying me away from the pasture and the shouts of the guys who were coming for us. For us. The men coming out of the giant hole in the earth weren't just after him, they were after me. I heard them say, there she goes. I was perched on the back of my newfound acquaintance, calling him a friend would have been too strong of a word. He said he could be trusted. And could he really? I didn't know him at all, not one bit. All I knew was that whatever he was wrapped up in was way, way out of my league. I just wanted to find my brother. It was the same thing I had always wanted, just to keep the little man safe. The dragon guy had flown the two of us to a park somewhere I didn't recognize, somewhere far on the outskirts of the city, and gone back into his human form. Now he rose from the swing he had been perched on. He began to pace back and forth in front of me, his skin still giving off that magnificent silver light. It looked as if he had somehow harnessed the light of the moon itself, and if I was being honest with myself, he was kind of beautiful. I blushed even thinking it, but that didn't mean it wasn't true. He was beautiful, or hot, or whatever, even after I'd watched him change from something that looked relatively human into a real, live dragon. Maybe it was even partially, because of it. The best way I could describe it, was that I had watched his body unfold. One minute, he had been standing in front of me, asking me questions I didn't really understand, and the next he had jumped into the air, never coming back down again. He had been in midair, and his body had stretched out, his shoulder blades lengthening and morphing into a set of massive wings. It was a wonder I had done what he'd instructed, and jumped on his back. I could just as easily have frozen solid with the surprise of it all. But I didn't and there we were, waiting in a park for, what? What was I waiting for? How could I sit here, hiding out, when I still needed to make sure my brother was okay? Look, I appreciate you helping me and all, but if you're not going to say anything. Liliana. Right? No one calls me that. I pick my jaw up off the ground. Wait. How do you know my name? I know your name because others know your name. I don't know what that means. Are you like, trying to be cryptic? Or is that just how you are naturally? I could say I wasn't freaked out, but I was. Scarily freaked out. In a major way. I know your name because the Overlord knows your name. The Overlord? Yes, he spoke wearily as if just having this conversation with me was the most exhausting thing he'd ever had to endure in the whole world. The Overlord and his followers. They know who you are, and they want you. And who are these guys? What did he mean, they wanted me? That I needed to ask took first priority, but I couldn't get past the fact that he knew my name. Anyway, judging from what I'd seen thus far, it was safe to say that they didn't want me. 
No. Nope, not at all. They wanted me dead. Let's just say they aren't from here, okay? They're from the same place that I'm from. They're my kind, not yours. Okay, then what's your kind? What the flip are you? Flip? What does that mean, flip? Seriously? Was this guy for real? He could turn into a dragon, just morph and fly away, and yet he was acting confused by my choice of words. He was definitely the weirdest thing I had ever encountered, and if I hadn't been so afraid for Ricky, I might have actually enjoyed myself with this waste of a conversation. It's just a word I use instead of curse words. Don't change the subject. I want to know what you are. That's beside the point. All you need to know is that you are wanted. Get as far away from here as you can and don't come back. Are you mental? I'm not going anywhere. You seem to be ignoring the part about needing to find Ricky. I'm not ignoring anything. I'm telling you what you need to know. Actually, no, that's exactly what you're not doing. You seem to be pretty intent on not answering any of my questions. He crossed his arms over his broad chest and gave me an icy look. Again, I'm telling you what you need to know. Whether I like it or not, I owe you my life. You can choose to do as I say or not. I owe you a debt, and I'm trying to make sure I pay it. I have an idea. Why don't you just take me home? You know where that is, right? That is neither here nor. Yeah, yeah, it's neither here nor there. I know. I'm gonna take that as a yes. You probably know it for the same reason you know my name, the reason you don't think I can handle knowing. So take me there. There's no point. Maybe not for you, I hissed, feeling myself getting very close to blowing my top and not really caring at this point whether I did or not. It's not your family. If you don't want to take me, fine. Some fine debt paying on your part, you say you owe me, but whatever. But I'm not doing another thing until I get to go home and see my stepmother and find my brother. Do you understand me? I understand. We'll go there, if that's what you want. Just don't say I didn't warn you. Wait. If I was going to go somewhere with him again, I should at least know his name. What's your name? Since you know mine and all. He paused, studying me, as if trying to determine something. What? If I was worthy. If I'd live long enough to make it worth his telling me. If he'd never see me again after this and still he stared. I put my hands on my hips and acted a lot braver than I felt. Well? Cade. Chapter 12. Lily. Jeez you're fast. For someone who didn't want to take this little detour to begin with, you sure did get me here quickly. Might as well get it over with. I warn you, you will not find what you're looking for here. Says you. I took off, heading straight for the door that would take me from the rooftop of our building where Cade had landed us, somehow without anyone noticing, which seemed impossible to me, but things were pretty crazy in Houston even on a good day. And this was far from a good day. The rooftop door was locked. No matter how hard I pulled on it, I couldn't open the door to the stairwell. It was the only thing between me and the apartment where I was so desperately hoping to find my family and its unwillingness to move made me crazy. I started kicking it as hard as I could, over and over again. I didn't even know if I thought the kicking would make it open. I just knew that there was no other outlet for my frustration. I probably would have kept kicking until I broke my foot, if Cade hadn't come up behind me and grabbed my arm. I turned on him, kicking him hard in the shin before I got control of myself. He gave a little grimace, but that was the only sign of having felt the blow at all. That's not going to work. His teeth were clenched, like maybe I did hurt him after all. Oh, really? Thanks for the observation, genius. I know it's not going to work. I can see that it doesn't work. Do you think you've got any better ideas? Because if you do, I would love to hear them. Otherwise, why don't you just leave me alone? Without speaking, he withdrew that rod that would turn into a staff with the appropriate flick of the wrist. I took an involuntary step backward, 
wary of what I had already seen that thing do. He looked at me with some of the condescension I had seen earlier, and then reached out to push me gently out of the way. He held the staff out to the door, the head of it on the lock. The silver gem on the end went to work, setting off little sparks. After less than a moment, the door gave a little groaning noise and swung open. Thanks, I said uncertainly, a little begrudging. I don't think I could have done it. You can stay up here if you want to. You can go if that's what you want. I need to get to my family. He didn't answer me, but he also didn't stay on the rooftop either. He followed silently behind me. I could feel how much he didn't want to be doing this with every step he took, in every breath, but I didn't care. I couldn't care. There wasn't enough of me left to care, after all of the caring I was doing for Ricky. And for Mona, of course. She was difficult, but I loved her. She was my stepmother. The closest thing I'd had to a parent since, yes, yeah, since. When we finally got to my door, I stopped, and spun around to look at Cade for the first time since getting into the building. I gasped, pressing my back against the door. He was unbelievably close to me, so close that I could smell his skin. It was the smell of earth, the smell of spices I didn't recognize. I looked up at his strange, crystal blue eyes and did my best to remember to breathe. It was hard, somehow, having him so close to me. It was just a little bit distracting, which immediately made me angry with myself for being so silly. He raised one eyebrow. I scowled in defiance at the look on his face. You can wait here if you want. That's all right. No, seriously, it's okay. I can go in on my own. It's just that my stepmother doesn't really like having visitors come in without having some kind of warning, and with the phone lines down. You don't have to tell me lies. I don't care what your stepmother does. Besides, she won't be inside. I told you. There was no reason to come here. She isn't home. She is. I saw her myself, before I took the bike and went looking. That may be true, but she's not there anymore. Nobody is. I balled up my hands into fists, trying very hard to decide whether or not I wanted to hit him badly enough. His whole doom and gloom thing was getting way old, way fast, and I didn't appreciate it. And besides, I knew my stepmother would be inside. I had been the one to see her passed out on the couch, not him. He had no idea what she was like when she got like that. Nothing short of a miracle was going to pry her off of that couch. I swung the door open wide, giving him a smug look as I did so. He walked inside, never bothering to return my look. No, all he looked at was the couch. The empty couch, where my stepmother rested no longer. I don't understand. I stood there, dumbfounded, staring at her normal resting spot, as though doing so would somehow bring my stepmom back. She was here. She was lying right there, and she was out stone cold. There's no way she could go anywhere. But she did. I told you, there's nobody here. For the first time since this whole mind-boggling thing had begun, I felt completely lost. I had no plan of action, no idea what was the right move for me to make next. It was just that the city was so big and Ricky was so small, my stepmother so messed up. They could have been anywhere, in any of a million places, and I was the one who was supposed to find them and take care of them. It was such a large burden for a 17-year-old to bear, and suddenly I felt very, very tired. Liliana. Nothing. I didn't feel like talking now. I didn't even bother correcting him. No one called me Liliana anymore. That was what my dad called me, and that was because he said it was the name my mom picked out for me. No. One. Calls. Me. Liliana. But no. I said nothing, because I couldn't even think straight. Nothing made sense and nothing was right. I'd quit looking for Mona if I could only find Ricky. I wanted my little brother back, and I wanted him now. It took everything in me not to curl up on the floor in a fetal position and burst into tears. I didn't see what he could say that would make any difference, and I really just wanted to feel sorry for myself. Not attractive, but true, 
and as far as I was concerned a luxury that every person should be allowed every now and again. Liliana. I bit back my reply again. I would not tell him that everyone called me Lily, because I didn't plan to know Cade long enough for it to matter. What do you want, Cade? I'm trying to think. She's not here. She's not anywhere near here. Oh yeah? Well if you know so much, why don't you tell me where she is? He stayed silent. Of course he did. This was what it had been like, every time I asked him a question, I really wanted to know the answer to. Why should this time be any different? For some reason I couldn't even begin to comprehend, he was keeping things back from me. I grew fed up with waiting. Fine. She's not here. You got me on this one. I'm going to go and look for my brother, unless you've got any profound insight into where he might be. Happen to have any of that? Yes? 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 Well then why don't you tell me? You mean you've known where he was this whole time and just kept it to yourself? What is wrong with you? Talk about wanting to rail at him. I wanted to kill him. Nothing is wrong with me. I'm trying to understand you. What you are, exactly. Will you stop talking to me like that? I already told you. I'm nothing, okay? I'm just a girl, and all I want is for you to tell me where he is. Please. Please, okay? I grabbed him by the lapels of his jacket, a jacket that had seen better days since his fight earlier in the pasture. It was grass-stained and ripped. He's where you were. He's where we were. He's in the schism. In. Yes, in. In the land where my people come from. They've taken him down into the schism. They? I scowled. Oh, screw it. Who cared who took him? I was taking him back. Fine. Let's go. Without waiting for his response, I was moving again. I headed toward the doorway, intending to go straight back up the stairs we had come down, a plan finally starting to take shape in my mind. It might not have been the best plan, but at least it was something, and that was all right with me. The worst part was the not knowing. That kind of helpless feeling was something I never wanted to have again. Even a bad plan was better than nothing, especially if it might get me back to my little brother. Where do you think you're going? he asked, unmoving. I stopped, looked back at him. You mean we? We, he parroted. I sighed with exasperation and fought my eye roll. Yes, we. You're going to take me back. If ease in that, the schism take me to it. I'm going to get to him back, come hell or high water, okay? I can't do that. No. I turned to face him, the turn whipping my hair crazily around my face and making me feel like a wild woman. No, you don't say that to me. Want to know why? Sure if that'll help. Because I know it's a lie. If anyone can get me there, it's you. I've seen it. I know what you can do, and I want you to. I poked his chest with every word. You. Will. Take. Me. There. He was unmoved. Fine. If you don't do it, I'll walk. I'll walk all of the way back there if that's what I have to do. Don't you see that's what they want you to do? That's exactly what they're counting on you doing. He's bait. He's not. He's my brother. That may be, Cade responded patiently. But he's also bait. It's bait you can't take. It's too dangerous. All of this is too dangerous. Things have gone much too far as it is. Either you tell me why that is, or I'm going, whether you like it or not. I'm tired of all of this cloak and dagger stuff. I want some answers, or I'm going. Cade began to pace again, only pausing every so often to peer up into the moon with a contemplative, sad sort of expression. Finally, he turned back to look at me. I wanted so badly to be able to read his eyes at that moment, but he was like a closed book. I wouldn't get any more out of him than he wanted me to. Completely infuriating, but nevertheless true. You will force my hand, Liliana. No one calls me that anymore, I whispered, finally defeated. 
He stepped closer, took my hand in his. That scent of his was heady. Have you ever felt different, Liliana? Like you're different than the others? Of course. Everyone feels different. I was confused by his gentleness, confused by his kindness and confused by my situation. I mean the kind of different that makes you feel lonely. Sometimes it might make you feel special, but it's a lonely kind of special. Like you can do things other people can't. Like you might have abilities, things you haven't discovered yet. I was the one who had asked for this conversation, but suddenly I didn't want to have it anymore. It was getting uncomfortable, because some part of me knew exactly what he was talking about. It was the sort of thing I had dreamed about, but never looked at when I was awake. It was the kind of dream that whispered in my head that it was more than just the fact that my stepmom was a drunk, and I lived in a bad part of town that kept people from wanting to get close to me, kept guys from being interested in dating me. There was something more. That's stupid, I replied lamely. Of course I haven't. As if I would discuss my inner feelings with some dragon guy who wasn't going to take me to my brother. Liliana, I mean Lily, you have because it's true. You aren't the same as others. You aren't the same as anyone else you've ever met. You are quite literally the last of your kind. When he called me Lily, I found myself missing the way he said Liliana, as if I were a revered queen or a treasure. I don't understand. My throat felt like it was closing up, like I would choke on tears I would never allow myself to shed. It's like you're trying to confuse me, saying things that only half make sense. What do you mean by telling me that I'm the last of my kind? Are you trying to tell me that my stepmom and brother are dead? You just said that my brother was in the schism. Which one is it? He is in the schism, and you are the last of your kind. The two are not mutually exclusive. They are both true at the same time. Explain. I chewed on my lip to keep from pouting. Or crying. Or screaming. Maybe even to keep from feeling. Silence. That stupid, maddening silence I had already come to associate with this guy Cade. Fine. If he didn't want to tell me anything, that was his choice. I wasn't going to let him stop me. There was nothing he could do now. Now it was a matter of my stubbornness and that was pretty much legendary. I'm going. Where? To the schism. You do what you want. I'm going. I only got two steps before Cade was standing in front of me again, his expression one of almost blind panic. This was the first thing to give me pause. This guy, who was able to transform himself into a dragon, was afraid of the idea of me going back to the tear in the earth. There had to be reason for that. Okay. I get it. You aren't giving this thing up. Is that it? Yes, that's about it. I'll help you. I'll help you get your brother back, if that's what you need. It's the only thing I need. Fine. But on one condition. Tell me. You have to do everything I say. Every single thing. I need you to understand how dangerous this will be. What? No questions. Either you get it or you don't. Either you comply or you won't. Which is it? I nodded my head resolutely, wanting him to believe me. I wanted me to believe it too. Chapter 13 Cade I turned back to look at Liliana. Are you coming? Why was she dragging her feet? She said to call her Lily. I couldn't. I'd only ever known of her as Liliana, even before I met her. Even before I was told I had to kill her. Kill her. I thought of her hair, her eyes, her lips. The way she smiled when she was smarting off. I couldn't kill her. I'd have to figure out what I was doing when I got back, but for now all I knew was, I couldn't kill this being. Um, no, Liliana answered in a tone that made it clear what she thought of my theory. That's not what I'm doing at all. In case you haven't noticed, this is kind of a long walk. And it's not exactly like everything is in pristine condition, you know? 
She kicked at some debris with her left foot, then grimaced as if she'd hurt herself. Hum. She rolled her eyes and started muttering under her breath at that last, leading me to the decision that staying quiet was probably best. Gods knew there was no way I was going to spontaneously begin to understand what made this girl tick. From my limited knowledge of her she was taciturn and beyond difficult, both things that made me almost wish that she had never come to my rescue to begin with. But there was more to her than her attitude, a lot more, and that was what made her so interesting along with infuriating. The fact that she did not seem to understand or even recognize the extreme difference in her from those humans she had spent her life around added another layer of complication. Layer upon layer of complication, and I was meant to navigate us through it all. Hopefully without getting one or both of us killed. Because I owe a debt, I murmured to myself, serving as my own reminder for what was at stake here and what my true role must be. Ow. Flip that hurt. What? What's the matter, were you hit by something? Hit by something? What on earth do you mean? Like a bullet. An arrow. A spear. You know the sort of thing I'm speaking of. No. She offered me a scowl. I wasn't hit by a flipping arrow. I tripped over a car bumper. It was just lying in the street. Because you know, the whole city is falling apart. The whole world, I whispered to myself, looking at the sky in discomfort and wishing we were already done with this suicide mission. Excuse me? What was that? Nothing. Will you just hurry up? If I remember correctly, the last time we made this trip together, you were flying us to our destination. Don't be surprised if I can't walk as fast as you flew. If you want us to get there in a hurry, do your presto chango thing and get us there right now. Do you think that hasn't occurred to me? That I wouldn't love to just get this thing over and done with? Well then, what's the problem? The problem is, last time I checked, this isn't a version of the world where dragons flying through the air is a normal thing. Do you honestly think we can keep traveling that way, and not expect someone to notice? To alert whatever passes for authority here, and shoot us down out of the sky? No, I bet you didn't. I bet you didn't think about it, at all. Plus the thing I didn't want to mention to her, I was in no hurry to return to the schism, or Anafal, my home below the schism, below the above ground, or as she called it, Earth. I'd failed in my mission. She was still alive. I'd be in trouble. And mostly, Declan's father would have achieved what he'd set out for. I bet you're worried those guys are going to come back, the ones I startled. I bet they're pissed. Especially the dark one. Did you see what I did to his eye? No way is he not looking for revenge. And at the very least, I know you're tired of listening to me. I can see it in your face. There's this one vein in the middle of your forehead that's standing out. The more I talk, the more noticeable it gets. I bet. She was rattling on. Liliana, Lily I corrected myself, she wants to be called Lily, had banked on my not being able to stand listening to her going on and on, and she had guessed right. My face must have been disgustingly easy to read. She had known the exact thing to do to get her way, and I had allowed her to use it on me. I unleashed my dragon. She shut up then gasped. She had already seen me change once before, but it didn't seem to have lost any of its sense of wonder for her. Her eyes grew large as I allowed my body to unfold, to unravel itself the way my grandmother had unraveled her balls of yarn when she did her knitting. As always, there was a sense of almost unbearable relief as I felt the shift come over me. There was always a push and pull with being a shifter, and in my human form. When I was in my human, or humanish because I definitely didn't look the way Lily and the other humans looked, there was always an internal nagging, a scratching to be let out. It was my dragon calling to me, calling for me to unharness again as it belonged, as it should be. It was impossible to become really comfortable in my human skin, because part of me was always rejecting it entirely. When I was my dragon, I felt like I had been let out of a cramped space I'd occupied for so long I'd forgotten what freedom felt like. I felt like I was exactly the thing I was supposed to be. 
That being so, I couldn't help but enjoy the look of awe on Lilia, Lily's face. It wasn't quite fear, but I could detect a healthy dose of apprehension there. It might have been petty or immature of me, but I never claimed to be perfect. I couldn't help but enjoy the silence my change inspired in my new traveling companion. That, and the yelp of surprise she let out when I nudged her with my reptilian snout so she had no choice but to slide onto my back. I gave her virtually no time at all to prepare for our ascent into the sky. It was what she had wanted, after all, wasn't it? To be airborne? Well, there I was. I was giving her exactly what she had asked for. I wondered how often that had been true for her before, then shook my head quickly to get rid of the thought. Why the heavens should I care whether she ever got what she wanted? She wasn't my problem, I reminded myself. Liliana is not my problem. Chapter 14 Cade What the hell? Liliana, Lily stomped her foot. I found that action adorable, but it could get irritating, I supposed. Something the matter. I cocked my head. Is something the matter? Um, yes, something is the matter. Why would you do that? You could have gotten me killed. But I did exactly what you asked me to. Didn't I? You wanted me to change, to get us here faster. Yes, but. And we're here. Aren't we? I mean, that is the schism, is it not? And I wasn't thrilled, at all. I wasn't looking forward to facing the music down there. It is. You got us here. Bravo. She clapped her hand slowly, mockingly. That doesn't mean you weren't being a jerk, landing like that. Because you were. You are. And you know it. Her eyes lingered on my face for another moment before she turned her back on me, just long enough to make me start to feel uncomfortable. I looked at her more closely and saw that she was shaking. Was it with anger? With fear? I had a feeling it was both, and I felt a twinge of remorse. I had done that to her. It was my fault, and as difficult as I found her, it wasn't exactly necessary for me to treat her that way. For the first time since meeting her, I felt sorry for something I had done. Not too terribly sorry, but sorry enough to decide that it might be a good idea to lay off of her a little. Besides, our fighting wasn't going to get either of us where we wanted to be, and it might actually make things considerably more dangerous. That was something we definitely didn't need, not when things were already as bad as they were. Look, Lily. Forget about it, okay? You got us here. That's good. It's what I asked you to do. Now, why don't you tell me what the plan is from here on out? What are we going to do next? We aren't going to do anything. I am. What? No way. There's absolutely no way I'm going to say yes to that. He's my brother. There's no way I'm letting you make a plan that I'm not even involved in. Do you want him back or not? Of course I do be you. No buts. No arguments. In the end, it's a simple yes or no question. Do you want him back? You know I do. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Okay then. I'm glad we got that established. Now, do you remember on the roof? What did I say my one condition for taking you here was? Lily scowled at me and mumbled something that didn't sound like words at all. I took that as a good sign. She clearly remembered exactly what I was talking about, or else she wouldn't have looked so unhappy. I was certain she was probably still going to put up a fight, but I also knew that in the end, I was going to come out on top of this one. She was desperate to get her brother back, and that meant she was going to do as I told her to. I raised a brow. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. I said your condition was for me to do exactly what you told me to. Right, to do exactly what I said, and that means everything I say. Fine, then what's the plan? What's your brilliant idea for getting Ricky back? You're going to stay right here. I want you to hide behind the nearest tree, and don't come out again until I come for you. Not for anything. I doubt my friends will think to look for you here. I have no doubt you rattled them, and badly. 
And you? What are you going to do? Easy. I'm going into the schism. Easy. That was what I told her, that my part of the plan would be easy. I smiled darkly to myself at the thought as I slipped into the schism. Saying it was simple, but that didn't necessarily follow for the actual doing of it. It wasn't like I hadn't traveled through schisms before. Of course I had. Everyone from Anafal had. It was an odd experience, there was no denying that, but one I was used to. It was like walking into a blinding light, and in the middle of that light, there was a door. One couldn't reach out and grab the door, couldn't push it or pull it the way one would a normal door. It was a door one pushed open with their mind. There was a moment of extreme strain, as if the thing they were pushing against was pushing as well and was much stronger, and then they were through. Then there was the darkness, a sense of falling that felt like it would continue for eternity, before they found themselves at their destination. For me this time, that destination was on a fall. Home. The word felt funny in my mouth and left a slimy residue, a bad aftertaste I wasn't used to. This was my first home, but it didn't feel like it. Not anymore. It felt like I was walking into the enemy's camp with no kind of preparation, which was something I would ordinarily never do. You owe her a debt, Cade. You owe her a debt, and it must be paid. This repeated in my head like a mantra, the only words that kept me from turning around and marching myself back out again. That, and the fact that the above ground wasn't exactly my favorite place to be either. It felt like there was no place for me now, and when this whole thing was finished, I was going to have to take a long, hard look at my circumstances. Probably return to the ice realm, where I belong now. Looking at Anafal's residence now, my former attachment to Anafal felt tenuous at best. Lo. Depressing day, ain't it? Look at that there sky. Nobody likes a sky like that. It's gonna rain for sure, am I right? Sure, I answered the ragged man wearily pushing his cart down the road in front of me, wanting only to be left alone. Definitely looks like it. You have yourself a nice day all right. I hurried along without waiting for a reply, hoping against hope that the man hadn't turned to watch me with suspicion as I went. In my mind, he was doing that very thing, but I was feeling paranoid by that point. The fact that I could feel the man's eyes on me as I left him, didn't mean they were really. At this point, I couldn't honestly trust much of anything. I may have been in the place I'd called home once, but I was in hostile territory. My best hope, my only hope really, was that the majority of the people of Anafal didn't know that yet. It was with that weighty feeling of dread and unknowing that I made my way to the heart of Anafal, the grand city of Valaport. As I always did, had done ever since I was a young thing, I stared up at the city's spires with unchecked awe. Even when I was old enough to know what kind of evil and corruption existed inside those gates, I couldn't help but be impressed with the magnificence of the flagship city. The spires were made out of gold and precious gems, the result of various expeditions over the centuries, and were so tall they seemed to touch the sky. The only thing that marred the city wall's beauty was the massive wrought iron gate serving as the entrance to the place, and one could argue that the gates were remarkable in of themselves. They were made of a deep black iron, stronger than any found on Lily's earth and reached upwards so high it was difficult for a man to see the top. Approaching, stepping briskly over the plank wood bridge that covered the rushing river surrounding the fortified city, I did my best to keep myself calm. What I was about to do was beyond illegal. If I were caught in the act, I would undoubtedly be put to death. If I were apprehended before I got to Ricky, I had no idea what would become of either one of us. And then there was the matter of Lily. Lily, who would continue to hide behind that tree in that godforsaken field, waiting for a brother she would never see again if I failed. It was an awful thought, and it made my resolve to succeed all the stronger. It emboldened me enough to walk up to the waiting house, the name we used for the building where abducted ones were kept, something that always struck me as slightly absurd, and speak to the woman who was guarding it. What do you want? Not the most welcoming person. Good afternoon, how's the day? She gave me the once over. Fine. The same. What do you want? 
This was a guard I had never seen before, one who didn't look even the least bit friendly. She was a big woman, bigger than me for sure, with skin a muddy brown color that faded in and out of copper in places. Her eyes were large and black, her face hard and unbending. I had been hoping for an easier foray into the waiting house, but this would have to do. There was no other choice, was there? No other choice at all. I don't want anything, to tell you the truth. I don't even want to be here, if you want to know what I mean. Then what are you doing here? I'm here because Eamon sent me. He wants me to take a crack at the boy, see what I can learn. You? She asked doubtfully, looking me up and down with an expression on her face that made it clear she found me lacking. Why the devils would he send you? Because, I can be very persuasive. When I want to be. Is that so? Could have fooled me. I know, right? I've got hidden charms, let's just say that. Also, I've got some experience with his bratty sister. I was the last one to see her, and she's the thing we're after in the end. Isn't that right? True, but... If you don't want to take my word for it, I'll understand. I can run and get Eamon and be back in a flash. But he might not appreciate having his afternoon disrupted. The woman was weighing her options. I could see it on her face. On the one hand, she wasn't supposed to let anyone into the waiting house, and we both knew it. On the other hand, Eamon was notorious for his dislike of inconvenient interruptions. After another moment's hesitation, she sighed. All right, all right. No need to wake him. Just make it quick, will you? I don't want to deal with this. I don't know why I'm always the one who has to deal with this. Don't worry, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. That's because I didn't give it. It's Marley. Just be quick, all right? I'm going to pretend that I never saw you. I nodded, smiling widely until I was out of her range of sight. She was going to pretend that she'd never seen me, was she? Good. That was just fine by me. The best thing for me at this point was to be nothing more than a ghost. Keeping that in mind, I crept down the hallway, marveling at the fact that there weren't more people guarding this place. Someone must have been absolutely certain nothing was going to get in the way of their plans, despite the fact that I had already proved such an inconvenience. The better for me. I couldn't be sure that I would walk out of the waiting house alive and with Ricky in tow, but I liked my odds better with every passing second. By the time I made it to the last cell on the row, I was nearly vibrating with anticipation. I was close so terribly close and there was no way I was going to stop now. Ricky. W, w W what? Who's there? Who's out there? My name is Cade. Are you all right in there? All right? Yes, all right. Are you okay in there? Are you hurt? I don't really know. I don't think so. That's good. I need you to make sure that you're not standing near the door. If that's where you are you need to back up, as close to the back wall as you can get. Okay. I can do that. But hey mister, can you tell me something first? Sure, as long as you ask me what you need to ask fast. We don't have much time Ricky. You know my name. I do. Is that your question? No. I was just wondering. Is this real? Is all of this really happening, or is this some kind of a weird dream? One of those weird dreams that feels too real, and you can't ever seem to wake up from. I paused, staring at the door with something that felt a lot like pity. It wasn't common for me, but it seemed pretty hard to avoid in a situation like this. When Ricky asked me that question, his voice cracked and broke. He sounded just like a child, a scared little boy who had gotten mixed up in something he couldn't possibly understand. Which of course, was exactly what he had done. All of the sudden, I wanted to get him out of there, for more than just paying off my debt to Lily. I wanted to get him out of there, because he didn't deserve any of what was happening to him, and I wanted to see it come to an end. Mister? Mister, you still out there? Yes Ricky, I'm still here. Are you away from the door? As far away as you can get. Yes? 
I pulled my rod from underneath my shirt and rolled it in my hand, until the gem on the end began to glow brightly. When it was as strong as it was going to get, I held it against the lock of the cell. It took almost zero contact before the metal began to sizzle, and very shortly it popped off completely, the force of which blew the door backward with amazing force. Ricky let out a little yelp of surprise and fear, but he had done what I asked, cowering in the corner furthest from the door, and so was unhurt. I strode into the middle of the tiny, dank cell, looking around me for any weak spots I could use to my advantage. Who are you? Why are you here? Did they send you? No, they didn't send me. I know your sister. I'm here to take you home. His eyes grew even wider still, something I wouldn't have believed possible, but I didn't have any more time for conversation. I was already in the process of changing, and despite the sound of people yelling off in the distance, I knew we were going to be okay. At least for now, we were going to be okay, because the change was upon me again, and we were getting out. Chapter 15 Lily It was too much. It was totally impossible. There was only so much a girl could handle before she started to reach her breaking point. As I lay there in the grass, huddled and hiding in some no-name field next to a hole that led straight to hell, as far as I knew, for the second time in one day, I was starting to think I might finally be at that point. But how many times had I thought that, throughout the course of the day? Hadn't I been thinking it, before anything much had happened? It was kind of bizarre how my capacity for handling difficulties had morphed in less than 24 hours. I could still remember the way it felt looking into my bedroom mirror and wishing a boy would finally decide to be interested in me, wishing my stepmom would get a grip. I had been wishing all of the normal things for a girl my age with no idea of how crazy things could actually get. Not like now. Now I knew. I knew I could never get comfortable with the way things were, because things could always get worse and they could always get weirder. Seriously Cade, come on. Where the flip are you? I didn't have a watch. So I didn't know exactly how long I'd been hiding there behind that tree, but it felt like it had been a year. At least. I couldn't stand the idea of Cade off somewhere saving my brother, while I was left to cower on the ground like some kind of helpless baby. It was driving me crazier and crazier by the second, and all at once I knew I couldn't take it anymore. I got up, feeling all of the muscles in my body groan in protest from their prolonged period of dormancy. My left foot was asleep, and like a dead weight, that was soon replaced by a sensation of tingling that felt like dozens of tiny little needles. I grimaced with pain, but I wouldn't let the pain to stop me. I moved slowly towards the schism, wanting to keep close to the ground and move quickly at the same time. I wanted to help Ricky, and I couldn't stand just hanging around and waiting, but that didn't mean I was looking to get taken up by those guys who had been after Cade. I just wanted to get my brother. It was the only thing I could focus on now that everything I knew of the world had become completely unrecognizable. I needed to get my brother, and once I had him safe and right in front of me, I would think of what to do next. The only thing I had to do to set a plan into motion was step down inside. I only had to step down inside of the schism, just as Cade had, and I would be on the path to helping get Ricky back. I pep-talked myself softly. How else would I muster up the courage to do it? Come on Lily, stop being stupid. All you have to do is step inside. Just step inside the same way Cade did. That's all you have to do right now and you know it. By then I was standing very close to the edge of the schism, so close that I could almost feel the brilliant light touching my toes. Would it feel like fire? With a light that bright, it seemed impossible that it could feel like anything else. And so what if it did? If it felt like fire, I would be hot. It would pass. Knowing this was enough to get me going, and I was just about to step down into the light. A force shot up out of it and knocked me flat on my back. The hit was so hard that it knocked the wind out of me, and for just a minute I was sure I was dying. There wasn't enough air. No matter how much I gasped, no matter how hard I tried to draw a breath, none would come. What stupid way to die. 
especially when I hadn't gotten done what needed doing. Ricky was still down there somewhere. I couldn't die. I just couldn't. Lily. Oh man Lily. You okay? Ricky? It had to be his voice. It's me. It's me, Lily. Tell me you're okay. He was shaking me so hard, I thought I'd vomit up the non-existent contents of my stomach. I sat up slowly, feeling a deep ache in the small of my back that I could already tell would get worse before it got better. I was trying to decide whether or not I had a concussion. I had hit my head pretty hard, so it was definitely a possibility. Was that why I was hearing Ricky now? Was I even awake, or was I just passed out there in the middle of the field with nothing but the cows to keep my company? Lily. What do you think you were doing? Cade. That got my attention, even more so than the sound of Ricky's voice. Cade's tone was unmistakably annoyed, the tone I had heard the most from him since first meeting him. I knew that tone. I didn't need to know him all that well to know what it meant. He was supremely disapproving of me, and although I couldn't have pinpointed exactly what the reason for his current unhappiness was, I knew it had to do with me. You don't follow directions, Lily Rogers. Oh yeah. For sure Cade was supremely pissed at me. You're right, but can we wait a second before you lecture me? I'd kind of like to say hello to my brother, if you don't mind. I've been pretty much freaking out about him for the last couple of hours or more because I'm not even sure how long you've been gone. Cade opened his mouth to protest and then shut it again promptly. Ricky hobbled towards me, him getting down to his knees at the same time as I struggled to make my way to my feet. The result was that the two of us met somewhere between sitting and standing, my arms wrapping around Ricky so tightly that I could feel his slight ribcage beneath my fingertips, could feel how small he really was. I had to choke back a sob then. I knew he was my younger brother, fine half-brother, but still my brother, the only brother I had, but it hadn't occurred to me how small he really was, especially for a twelve-year-old. The fact that he had made it through whatever kind of ordeal he had been put through, was a miracle. I should have been there for him, and I wasn't sure that was something I would ever be able to forgive myself for, but this made it very clear to me what my priority going forward was. I may have been only seventeen, but I had to take care of my family, no matter what doing that might entail. Lily. Lily, you have to listen to me now. Leave it to Kate to interrupt us at this moment. I looked up. He moved toward me quickly, so quickly that Ricky flinched. I didn't understand it at first, but then I realized why he was so nervous. I couldn't help but laugh. I would have done just about anything to see the look on Ricky's face when the change had happened. It's pretty cool, huh, little brother? Cool. Ricky laughed weakly. Sure is. Cool and pretty freaking strange. Kate cleared his throat. Lily, pay attention. I promise you, it's the last time you'll ever have to. That was enough to get my attention, and I turned to face Kate again, my brother momentarily forgotten. What on earth could he mean by that? Why would it be the last time I would ever have to listen to him? I didn't know exactly what he was getting at, but I could feel a strange sort of discomfort lodging itself in my belly. I didn't like the finality of the statement at all. Sure, Cade was annoying, but that didn't mean I wanted him to just take off and leave us there. In my humble opinion, it seemed like a pretty bad idea for all of the parties concerned. Well, mostly bad for me and Ricky. He took me by the shoulders. The things you've seen tonight, they weren't things you should ever have been a part of. You're lucky to be alive at all. That's how dangerous this is. How dangerous it's been since the moment you set eyes on that schism. I'm lucky to be alive. If I remember correctly. Yes? He sighed with a flare of temper that somehow made me feel better. I know. You were the one to save me. So then, it's really me who is lucky to be alive. Is that about the gist of what you were going to say? That about sums it up. Fine. Seems we're both lucky to be alive. But for you, it has to end here. You have to stay away from my kind, all of my kind. 
including me. You? But why you? Because? His body seemed to sag, as if he was carrying a heavy weight. Because it's not safe for you. You have to stay as far away from my kind and this schism as you can manage, and you have to do your best to forget any of it ever happened to begin with. I know it must seem impossible now. I'm sure it would for me as well, if the situations were reversed. But it's what you've got to do. There's no way I could ever forget any of this. You say that now. His hand still holding my shoulders squeezed lightly, and I felt a tingle running through my skin where his fingertips pressed against my flesh. But you will. People always forget. It's one of humanity's curses and strengths. You'll forget. You just have to allow yourself to. But? No. No buts. It isn't safe, and my debt to you is paid. You've got your brother back. Let that be enough, and don't follow this trail any further. It won't lead you anywhere you want to go, and I won't be there to protect you anymore. Do you understand? I had no words, no voice. I hadn't realized it until that moment, and I was shocked by the revelation, but I flat out didn't want him to go off and never come back. Some of it was because there were still so many unanswered questions. I had no idea what had caused the schism, no idea what Cade and those other guys really were, other than the fact that he was a dragon. And I had no idea why they had taken my brother and held him hostage. And I still didn't have a clue where my stepmom was. Was her disappearance related to this? Did the bad guys have her now too, as they'd had Ricky? There were so many terrible burning questions, any one of which would have been reason enough to want Cade to stay. Except that wasn't it, or at least not all of it. If I were honest with myself, something I wasn't particularly inclined to do at the moment, I didn't want him to leave because I sort of, liked him. He was beyond aggravating, and seemed at least a little bit full of himself, but there was also something sad and noble about him that made me want to stay near him. And those eyes. Whenever those eyes of his landed on me, I felt my heart flutter in my chest. Go figure. The first guy they first had met who actually struck my fancy, and he was a dragon or a half-dragon or something like that. Leave it to me to make things as difficult as humanly possible. As I thought all of these things, a flurry of ideas half-formulated flying through my head. It felt like I had to have been standing there for years, frozen in my thoughts. It couldn't have been more than half a second though, before Cade's lips on my forehead snapped me out of my daze. I looked up at him and saw those eyes trained on me, whatever thoughts residing behind them completely unreadable. Take care of yourself, Lily. Or at least, try to stay out of trouble. Without another word, he turned and marched back toward the edge of the schism. He stood with his toes hanging over the edge, just as I had done right before he had exploded out of it with my poor befuddled brother clinging to his back. Part of me expected something to come out and knock him over the same way it had me, but nothing so dramatic happened. Not so much as a single glance back over his shoulder for good measure, and he was gone. The only proof that there had been anything out of the ordinary at all was the schism itself, and that seemed to be getting smaller. Or was it just my imagination? I didn't know. I didn't know anything anymore, except for what I wanted to do next. Phew! What was that? Who was that? I don't get it, Lily. I don't get what's going on here. One minute, I'm trying to figure out what happened and where that explosion came from, and then... Ricky shook his head in disbelief. How do you know him, anyway? He turned into a dragon. Did you know he could do that? He turned into an actual dragon. I know. Come on. Right now we had to move quickly, or my admittedly hazy plan of action wouldn't work after all. Come on. Come on where? Where do you want me to go? I'm pretty sure he told us to stay put. The dragon dude said we should get away from here and he seemed like he had a pretty good idea what he was talking about. I'm sure he sounded like it, but sometimes people need things they don't know they need. I think Kate is one of those guys. But what are we going to do? We're going to go after him. Why? 
I couldn't answer that. Ricky was much more of a rule follower than I was. He had been ever since the accident that had left him crippled, and I didn't blame him for it, but I also didn't have time for it at the moment. Instead of waiting for him to object or use his uncommon reasoning skills to convince me not to do anything silly, I took him firmly by the arm and pulled him down into the schism. Chapter 16 Lily Lily What? Why? Shush. Calm down, Ricky. Calm down? Calm down? You calm down. We're right back where I was before. We're right back in that place the weirdo dragon dude dragged me out of. Ricky, I hissed, panicking a little at the rising volume of his voice. Seriously, you have to stop. Nope. Not until you tell me what's going on. I'm not doing anything you say, until you tell me something about what's going on. I had no other choice. I took him by the shoulders and shook him. Not hard, not enough to hurt him, but enough to get his attention and maybe even scare him a little bit. Anything to keep his voice from getting louder. Stop, I castigated him. Be flipping quiet. I was pretty badly shaken myself, my entire body buzzing with the aftermath of falling through the space and time of the schism, and the last thing I needed was full-blown panic on my hands. Because there were two things I knew for sure, we weren't alone and we weren't safe. The place that we had come to rest after our fall from the schism was a bed of moss tucked into a tight grove of trees on the edge of a thick unruly forest. Of course it was. I had spent more time hiding in trees in the last few hours than I had in my whole life, but at the moment I was grateful to have the cover. I needed to get my bearings. The place where we stood was like the pasture we had been in, and at the same time unlike it. It was like a photo of that same field from a long time ago, before cars or skyscrapers or electric lights. I could see a large castle-like structure far off in the distance, but aside from that, I couldn't see any buildings at all. We were in the middle of nowhere, in a place I did not know at all. The only thing that kept me from totally freaking out was the image of Cade on the road adjacent to the woods. The image was growing smaller all the time, but it was still him. I turned my attention back to Ricky, trying very hard to ignore the tears that had begun to bead along the line of his bottom lashes. Okay, baby brother, you want to know what we're doing? We're following him. There's something going on here, something he knows that we need to know. I kept my eye on Cade up ahead, while I took a second to explain to Ricky. Like what? Like about Mona, for one. Mona? What about Mona? She's gone, Ricky. When I couldn't find you, I tried to wake her up. She was passed out on the couch, and I shook her and shook her, but she didn't wake up. I couldn't wait, you know? I couldn't just wait around for her to wake up. I had to go and find you, but you weren't anywhere. But what does that have to do with her being gone? After I met Cade, after that mess with him and the other ones, I made him take me back home. I wanted to see if you had come home, or if maybe Mona was awake yet. But there was nobody. The apartment was empty, just like Cade told me it would be. Mona is gone, and it has something to do with whatever is going on here. I need to find her, okay? I mean, like how did he know she was gone? Maybe they took her. So we need to find her. Get it? Yeah, he said uncertainly, sounding heartbreakingly like he had when he was just a little boy. Okay. But then what? Things are bad now, aren't they? So, what are we gonna do after we get Mona? We're going to get out of here. Not just out of here either, but out of Houston. We'll go to Dallas, maybe. Mona has family there, if I remember correctly. They aren't close to her I don't think, but it's a place to go. It's a plan, right? Right? He didn't sound as if he was on board as much as I wanted him to be, but at least he wasn't saying no. Okay. Come on then. Follow me, close behind so we don't get split up. It's important. I need you to do whatever I tell you to. Anything and everything I tell you to. He nodded, his face drawn but resolute. 
I was struck by the strangest feeling of deja vu, remembering the way Cade had made me promise to do whatever he told me to. All I could do was hope Ricky was a better listener than me, although it would have been some kind of karmic retribution for him to be every bit as stubborn and difficult as I had been. I half expected him to argue with me some more, but instead, he nodded again. I started to creep forward, confident now that he would come after me as he was supposed to. That was good, because we needed to get a move on. Cade was moving quickly, and if I wasn't careful, he was going to escape my line of sight completely and then where would we be? That was all I thought about, the only thing I could think about, and it was enough to keep me moving forward. I picked up the pace, and consequently was less worried than I had been about losing him. That worry had been replaced by the concern that we were moving too quickly and would get ourselves caught. I didn't know how good Cade was at tracking, but I had a feeling he was better at it than I was. If he caught me, I didn't know what he would do, but I didn't think it would result in me getting my stepmother back. Which was why I was doing it, I reminded myself. I was following him because I needed to find Mona, not because I didn't want to stop being around him quite yet. Lily. I kept creeping forward, not at all interested in having a conversation now. Ricky started tugging on my sleeve, and I did my best to ignore that too. He wouldn't let me. He could be pretty freaking insistent when he wanted to be, and apparently, this was one of those times when he wanted to be. Lily. What is it? Look. Over there. I sighed in exasperation, then turned to look where my brother was pointing. It was all I could do not to let out a scream of warning. They were suddenly everywhere, surrounding Cade with such precision that there was no way for him to escape them. In no time at all, they had him surrounded, the dark one whose face I had sliced open was leading a band of seven dragon shifters. There were gold ones, pink ones, the two yellow-green ones from before. There were too many of them. I looked around for anything I could use as a weapon, and wished fervently for a staff like the one Cade had. Something like that might have given me a fighting chance, but as it was, there was nothing I could do but continue to lead Ricky along, and hope I could continue to keep up with Cade and his captors. As it turned out, I needn't have worried. I heard a low moan, and then a blast of pain on the back of my head. After that, darkness. Chapter 17 Cade Declan I whispered his name under my breath before I ever saw him. I got the strangest feeling, like this was all something I had done before. Later, I would learn that at that exact moment Lily had been experiencing her own bout of deja vu, giving her brother the same instruction I had given her back on her rooftop. Back what felt like centuries ago. Declan I felt him there. I couldn't see him, couldn't even begin to figure out where he might be, but he was around. And he was getting closer. It wasn't a surprise, not really. I had known something like this was headed my way. I had known it from the time when I had made the decision to go rogue, and then known it again when I made the decision to pay my debt to Lily. Something was going to come for me. I could run, but it would only catch up with me. Declan would only catch up with me and he would be better prepared this time. I was so sure of that that it didn't come as a surprise when, twenty minutes later, I heard Declan's voice behind me. You shouldn't have come back here, Cade. But then you must know that. Where was it he figured I could go, I wondered. Do I? I would have thought so, but then again I might be giving you too much credit. In fact, I'm sure I'm giving you too much credit. It isn't as if you've made the wisest decisions of late, now is it? Well, I don't know about that, I replied with an easy tone that belied the situation I found myself in. I feel pretty good about my decisions. Of course you would say a thing like that. Of course you would. You always were a stubborn one, weren't you? Not that it will do you any good now. I don't see it that way. My pulse was racing adrenaline pumping as I tried to think of plans while at the same time maintaining a semblance of a civilized conversation with someone who was an enemy. Don't you? Do you not see the circumstances you are now in? 
I've got you vastly outnumbered. Surely you must see. If you don't, well then take a look. As much as I disliked the idea of doing anything Declan told me to do, this last idea wasn't a bad idea at all. I turned to see a triumphant-looking Declan and six others rapidly surrounding me in a circle. It was different than the last time, and it wasn't just the fact that he had more people with him this time. It was also that these were the right people. These were the ones a person brought with them when they were ready for a real fight, including the guard I had fooled earlier, the one called Marley. She had murder in her eyes, and I wondered how dearly she would make me pay for the lies I had told and the trouble it must have caused her. She didn't look like the type to forgive and forget. She didn't look like that type at all. Okay, I see. What of it? That depends on you. On what you're going to do. You can fight again if you like. I suspect that some of our numbers would quite enjoy the fight, to tell you the truth. You've been busy, and it hasn't been making you any new friends. Not like I'd ever want to be friends with any of your lot. So, if there's more to what you're trying to do, you better just go ahead and get on with it. Declan's face grew even darker with anger. Marley let out a snarl that made it clear that she would definitely enjoy a fight. I probably should have felt fear. It would have been the sensible thing to feel, the smart thing. What I actually felt was close to nothing. There was nothing but the memory of the kiss I had placed on Lily's forehead, and the knowledge that I had done what I had to. I didn't know where Lily and her brother were, but they were far away from here, and that was what mattered. Funny, that I should care about keeping her safe when I had started out with the quest of killing her. It was funny enough that I didn't understand it, but that didn't matter, either. They were far away. They were safe, and there was nothing for me to do but fight, and almost certainly, to die. Tisk tisk tisk. Are you sure you want to be doing that? What with everything that's at stake? Nothing's at stake. Not a single thing. Now funny that you should mention that because I think there is, Declan said in a bright voice that made me instantly wary. He cleared his throat then announced, William. Now would be a good time for you to come out. All of Declan's company turned and looked to the line of trees, and I couldn't help but do the exact same thing. I immediately wished I hadn't. Lily and Ricky. Captives. I looked for what felt like a very long time, then turned back to Declan. My body was rigid, my face cold. Every single one of my muscles was electric with the desire to fight, but to do so would only make matters worse. There wasn't a thing I could do that wouldn't make matters worse. I thought that might do it. No more need to fight now, yes? You'll come quietly. I'll come quietly, I growled, unable to keep my hand from tightening around my staff despite the fact that I'd just said I was going to stand down. I'm glad to hear that. Really, I am. I want you to keep that in mind, okay? And no hard feelings. None at all. Except that I wanted to kill him. I was about to ask what the hell he meant by that, when something heavy hit me from behind. It had to have been some kind of a stone for it to knock me over the way it did. The pain was excruciating, but only for a moment. I didn't have time to feel the pain. Instead, everything went black, and I was gone. Chapter 18 Cade 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 I couldn't tell if the voice I was hearing was real or imaginary. I wasn't sure if I cared. My head pounded with the power of a stampede, traveling within. I hadn't slept in such a long time, and I wanted to keep doing it. I just wanted to sleep and sleep and pretend that there was nothing important enough to get up for again. With this intent in mind, I turned on my side, showing my back to the one trying to disturb me. Cade. Seriously. I know you can hear me, okay? I can tell. I saw it on your face. It wasn't going away. All I wanted was to sleep, and the voice wouldn't let me do it. I sat up then, my head throbbing so mightily that I thought I might be sick. It was such an intense pain that I couldn't see straight, couldn't see the one who was trying to rouse me. Not that I really needed to see to know who was there. 
Although I had been confused and pretty much without memory as I started to wake, everything was coming back to me now. It was all coming back, and with it came an anger I couldn't help but welcome. It sure beat dwelling on the pain. I gave her a look. You. I should have known it would be you. Lily's eyes glowed with an emotion I couldn't pin down. Well I'm glad to see you again too, she huffed. I rubbed my head, found a knot. Glad? You want me to be glad? I jumped to my feet, gritting my teeth and trying to ignore the faint feeling that came over me with the rapid movement. Lily was sitting in one of the furthest corners of a very large cell, her chin propped on her knees and her arms wrapped tightly around her body. She didn't say anything in reply to my outburst, only looked at me with those wide pretty eyes. I don't know if it was those eyes or seeing her there at all that fueled my anger so completely, but now that it was sparked up, it showed no signs of slowing down. Glad. You want me to be glad to see you here. Do you not remember what I told you? She was still looking at me, those gold-rimmed blue eyes unblinking, and for a minute I was sure she wasn't going to answer me at all. As angry as I was at her, angrier than I could have imagined myself being at anyone, I was starting to get worried too. From what I knew of her, Lily wasn't the type to remain mute. Had they done something to her, threatened her so that she was too afraid to speak to me? Had they hurt her so that she wasn't able to talk to me? So many questions. Questions were all I had, and I felt like they might very quickly drive me mad. I know, she answered, so quiet I could hardly be sure she had spoken at all. I know what you told me. I'm sorry. I should have listened. I groaned. You should have. What is it? Do you just like getting yourself into trouble? Do you like the danger of it or something? You must. I don't see that there could be any other explanation for it. I said I was sorry, okay. What else do you want? I don't know what else you want me to say, but I'll do it if it'll make you stop. Breathing heavily now, feeling sick from my fury and from the pounding still going strong in my head, I turned on her more completely, prepared to continue with my tirade. That was when I noticed that she was crying. I hadn't noticed it before because she wasn't making the sounds a person usually made when crying, but now that I was really looking at her, I could see that her face was pale and drawn and streaked with tears. Seeing her tears deflated my anger almost immediately, and I slumped back down to the floor, leaning my head up against the stone wall. It was cold, a welcome sensation against the throbbing in my skull. Still trying to calm myself, and not having any desire to be the cause of even more tears for Lily, I looked around me. I knew that it was important for me to examine our current jail closely if I had any hope of getting us out of there. The first thing I needed to do was look for weaknesses. I started the task with a small amount of hope. I had seen what had passed as Ricky's cell earlier. If this one was anything like that, I should be able to have us out of there as soon as my head quieted down enough for me to complete a shift. My hopes however were quickly dashed. This cell was nothing like the one they had used to hold Ricky. They had learned from my abduction of the boy, and they had learned the lesson well. The cell we found ourselves in was made entirely out of thick stone, thick enough that I would never be able to crash through it, no matter how strong my dragon was. The cells were damp too, damp and musty and smelled like earth. There was so little light in the small space that the glow from my skin was the best source of light we had. I reached to my waistband and found that my staff was gone. Bastards. They had stripped me of it, just as I had known they would. We were as close to helpless as two people could be, while still moving of our own free will. It was exactly the kind of situation I hadn't wanted for Lily. I had tried to protect her from it, and I had failed. Today's my birthday, you know. She sniffled, then straightened her posture as if trying to be brave. Under her breath she whispered, Happy birthday to me. I looked up at her, wincing a little to see the tears still falling down her face, though she was trying to put on a brave facade. She made no move to wipe them away, and I was struck by a sudden desire to do it for her. My face grew hot with the thought of what she might do if I wiped those tears away. I fidgeted with my shirt to occupy my hands. It is. 
It's my birthday. I'm 18 today. Officially an adult. What a way to celebrate it, huh? 18 and in a prison cell. Just what every girl dreams of. I'm sorry. Don't be, she laughed with no humor at all. It isn't your fault. It's mine. I should have done what you told me to, right? I should have just gone when you said, and none of this would have happened. They took him again. Did you know that? He's gone. You got my brother back, and I couldn't even manage to hold on to him for a short time before getting him abducted again. Terrible big sister, right? Big sister of the effing year. Let's just say I'm not getting that medal anytime soon. I remained quiet. What was I supposed to say, after all? It was true that her extreme sadness had gone a long way toward calming my anger, but the facts were still the facts. She shouldn't have come. She had allowed herself to become leverage, which was the exact thing they were looking for. I had freed her brother for her once, but I would not be able to do it again. They would have him under much tighter watch, heavily guarded so that nobody could get close to him. We were all in a far worse situation than we had been before, and nothing I could say would change that. She began to pace, almost frantically. I don't understand it, Cade. I don't understand any of it. Why me? Why are they doing this to me? You really don't know, do you? I shook my head. As if I wanted to be the one to clue her in. No, I did not. You should have done what I told you to. It was foolish of you. It was dangerously foolish of you not to do as you were told. She stood still and stared at me. Foolish? She laughed harshly. That sounds like the perfect word for it, doesn't it? Fine, I'm an idiot. Guess it's lucky for you that you don't owe me anymore, huh? Yes, I answered coldly, feeling my anger return. Fury burned in her eyes. She started to pace again, back and forth in front of the cell's gate, her fists balled up at her sides. She needed to calm down if she didn't want to attract unwanted attention, but saying so was only going to make her angrier. It didn't take a genius to see that. I just want to get my brother back, okay? I want him back, and then I want out of here. End of story. Do not pass go, do not collect a million dollars. Sure that's what you want. There are plenty here, who have other plans for you. Some of them are the same people who wanted me to get rid of you. You're going to have to get it through your thick skull that you're in danger here. Real, actual danger. I was on my feet now too, the two of us facing off against each other like fighters in a ring. I had no doubt that it would only have gotten worse had we been allowed to continue to go at each other like that. The things we might have said to each other would probably have been almost as damaging as the things Declan intended on doing. We didn't get a chance to find out. There was suddenly the sound of footsteps from the hallway outside of the cell, and both of us grew very, very still. Chapter 19 Lily What a terrible time you seem to have had. I can't even imagine. It's all been a mix-up and now it's been fixed. I hope you can forgive us. At first, I thought I had to be dreaming. What other explanation could there be for this sudden change of circumstances? That, plus I felt like I was trying to come up from somewhere deep underwater. Somewhere part of me wanted to leave, and part of me wanted to stay in forever. With my eyes still closed, I did my best to recall where I was and how I had gotten there. Had I been hit again? Had someone hit me in the back of the head yet again? and dragged me off someplace? No. No, I didn't think that was it. But something had happened, and it wasn't something good. I had been in the woods, watching Cade get taken up by the Dark One. That was when I had been hit in the head. From there I had been moved to a cell with Cade, and he had been angry at me. I had been crying, embarrassing but true, and still he had been so flipping angry with me for not doing what I was told. He had been telling me about the danger I was in, about why it was true when the footsteps had come down the hallway. I couldn't remember anything after that. Why couldn't I remember anything else? There were only those footsteps, and now waking up in this strange room with this even stranger voice. 
It's okay, Lily. It's okay for you to speak to me. Really, as I said to you, this has all been a misunderstanding. You must believe me. The use of my name was enough to jolt me out of my fog. I opened my eyes slowly, first one and then the other, waiting for the blur of that strange sleep to leave me. What I saw did nothing to get rid of my confusion, that was for sure. I was in a room that was painted all white, lying on a small bed, more like a cot really, topped with a deep downy mattress. This was really the worst kind of introduction to Anafal, I fear, the worst possible introduction. I couldn't help myself. I looked up. The man in my cell looked the same as the others, for the most part. He was bigger, so tall that his head almost scraped the ceiling, and the clothing he wore was way fancier than anything the others had worn. He was clad in robes of deep purple silk with threads of gold stitched through it. I wasn't sure why, but something made me completely certain that the gold wasn't fake gold, just for show. It was real gold. Real gold spun into thread just so this guy would look more regal. His skin was a golden hue as well. Not golden in the way someone who tanned a whole bunch was referred to as having golden skin either. Golden the way a statue was golden. The skin had the same faint glow as Cade and all of the others of his kind, and his eyes were a shocking violet that was perfectly complemented by his deep plum robes. He was older than the others I had seen too. He had a shock of white hair on top of his head, with only a bit of red in it to show what he might have looked like when he was younger. He was smiling at me indulgently, as if the only thing he had wanted in the whole wide world was for me to be willing to talk to him. I knew it probably wasn't safe to trust him, but it was hard. He didn't seem dangerous. He didn't seem like any kind of an enemy at all. It's so much better when we can have a conversation, don't you think? Sure I guess so. Can I ask you a question? Of course. All right. Let's start with who the heck are you? Ha! Huh. A fine question indeed. That is undoubtedly the first question I would ask if the roles were reversed. I am simply referred to as the Overlord. The Overlord? But what's your actual name? It is the only name I need. Now what else? What do you mean, what else? I know you have more questions, child. I'm here to give you the answers. My eyes narrowed suspiciously. Suddenly the ones who imprisoned me are nice? and answering questions. Where's my brother? He's safe. And Cade? Also alive. I want to see my brother. You will. Any other questions? Okay, how about this? You said Anafal. What is that? He made a clucking sound of disapproval and shook his head slowly. I felt my stomach tighten into a little knot of apprehension wondering what I had done or said to make him look at me that way. It wasn't like I was immediately jumping on the overlord bandwagon or anything like that, but I also found that I didn't want to piss him off. Maybe I was afraid of him, and that was why, but I thought it might also be at least a little bit because he seemed like a pretty decent friendly guy. As far as I was concerned, that was exactly the kind of guy you needed on your side, when you found yourself in the kind of strange situation I was currently in. I would have thought the company you were keeping would have given you some kind of a clue as to where you were. It seems like the friendly thing to do, does it not? Or perhaps you never asked him any questions. He meant Cade, and suddenly I grew angry with Cade and at the same time protective of him. No, I said guarded. Cade has a rather unfortunate reputation for being a troublemaker. I'd have thought. He didn't finish his thought, but for some reason I felt an uncomfortable lurch in my stomach. On the one hand, what this overlord character was saying made a certain kind of sense. Cade had refused to let me in on anything, keeping me in the dark at every turn. On the other hand, something inside of me wanted to rebel at this attack on his character. Something about it didn't feel right. I had the vaguest feeling that I was being manipulated, but it was a feeling I couldn't seem to hold on to. It was like a slippery fish who kept swimming into my hands only to dart off again at the last possible second. There was something not quite right here, 
but I couldn't for the life of me say exactly what it was. I'm sorry, that was rude of me. It's not kind to speak ill of others, especially when those others aren't around to defend themselves. Will you tell me? Will you tell me what Anafal is? This place is called Anafal, all of the land you see around you. It is the world you are in, the world you fell into when you slipped into the schism. I tried to absorb this, to wrap my head around it. A whole new world? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I walked into a whole new world? You did indeed, something not many of the people can say. Which makes you very special. But then I'm sure you already knew that. That last statement gave me pause. Very special. That's what Cade said. But I was just me. Back in Houston, a place which I had apparently left entirely, I hadn't felt special. I had felt awkward and different, and sometimes terribly put upon, but never really special. I had felt alone and afraid, but not special. He clapped his hands softly, as if coming to some sort of conclusion. I have business to take care of. If you need anything, anything at all, please don't hesitate to let me know. You are a guest here, after all, not a prisoner. I can see by the look on your face that you don't really believe me, but it's true. You are in no way our prisoner. Please remember that. He smiled at me again, before turning and heading towards a large white curtain that hung all along one whole wall. I want to leave. I practically shouted it out, afraid that he would leave before I got the chance to say it. Can you let me go? No. He turned slowly, everything in his face and his posture sad and defeated. I'm afraid that is something I cannot do. It's for you. That last statement gave me pause, but I didn't question it. My brother. I need to see my brother now. That is something I can do, if you agree to my terms. I frowned. I don't think I understand. I can have you reunited with your brother. And never separated again. Ever. You only have to do one thing for me, in return. Ever? The sound of that was the culmination of my goals. Anything, I said quickly. I'll do anything. I just need you to sign this. From deep in one of his sleeves the overlord produced a long, ancient-looking scroll, tightly wound and bound with a ribbon. With a flick of the wrist, he untied it and let it unwind, then walked toward me with a long black quill. His eyes were still kind, but I was terribly nervous. Something was happening here, something just beyond the scope of what I could understand. What is it? It's just an agreement that if you don't try and escape, I will bring your brother to you. It's a symbol of good faith. To show that we understand each other. Yes? Yes, I whispered doubtful, feeling very far away from understanding indeed. I understand. As long as it brought me my brother. And will you sign? I nodded, not even trusting myself to speak at this point. The overlord grinned at me, a wide grin full of perfectly white, unervingly sharp teeth. He moved toward me, and before I could say another word, he pricked my skin with the pointy end of the quill. Where the point had landed sprang a bead of blood, which traveled up the quill with lightning speed. Hey! What the? Not to worry, it's simply how we do things here. It's how we sign our agreements. Here you are. He handed me the quill, indicating with his hand where I was to sign. I hesitated just long enough to take one deep breath, but Ricky's face flashed across my mind. I signed. I had to get my brother back. I just had to. There. Wonderful. I'll have your brother to you presently. That better mean soon. Like now. But he wasn't even waiting for my response. As soon as I had signed the scroll, he had rolled it up tightly again, tucked it away, and skirted toward the long white curtain, pulling it aside with a practiced efficiency. I let out a little gasp. Throughout this entire exchange, I had believed that while I slept, I had been whisked off somewhere far away from the jail where I had been housed with Cade. Now that the curtain was pulled back, I saw that I had been completely wrong. I had hardly been moved at all. Instead, I was in the cell down the way from where I had been before, across from Cade. 
Cade, who was staring into the overlord face with an angry scowl, watched him until he was gone, and then stared down the hallway after him. He stared for a long time, his expression dark, his eyes clouded over like a sea in the middle of a terrible storm. You signed it. His voice had a dead, dull quality that I didn't like at all. It was a total contrast from the look on his face, the rage in his eyes, and it made him seem beyond dangerous. I could see right away that I had done something he didn't agree with. I just wasn't sure why. Chapter 20 Cade I grabbed for the bars. I couldn't rail at the departing bastard, so I railed at Lily instead. So is that what you're in the habit of doing? You go around signing anything, and everything put before you. It's a wonder you haven't gotten yourself killed already. How you've managed to make it through life for so long is simply beyond me. She studied me, as if I were a different species. You're angry. Angry. I'm beyond that now. I'm baffled, that's what I am. It's like you want to make things harder for yourself. It's like you're trying to make the worst possible decisions. I was much too hard on her, and I knew it, but I didn't seem to be able to stop myself. The feeling of helplessness that had overcome me was making me crazy, and the only way I seemed to be able to respond to it was with anger. Anger that was misguided, directed at the wrong person. I knew Lily was only trying to do what was best for her and her family, and she was doing it without having any idea what that might be. There was no reason to be talking to her the way I was. Okay, I've had just about enough from you. Her tone was terse. Do you know why I'm so completely clueless? Because of you. I'm clueless because you haven't told me a flipping thing. I've been operating in the dark, and if I've made mistakes, I've tried my best. You can't say that I haven't. She was right of course. I had kept her in the dark in an attempt to keep her safe, and all that had happened was more and more trouble. Now here she was, here we both were, stuck in the dungeon of the Onifal castle, with her brother stolen away again, and no idea how we were going to get out of this mess. I had kept her in the dark, and things had gotten worse. They were bad enough at this point that I couldn't see a way out of it, at least not one where we all made it out alive. I sat with my arms resting on my knees, my head leaning against the damp stone of my cell, and wished to be anywhere else. You shouldn't have done that. Right, she said angrily, her hands on her hips and her face flushed a bright pink that made her eyes look like they were on fire. You keep saying that like I'm suddenly going to understand what you're talking about. How about we try something different for a change? How about you actually tell me why I shouldn't have done it, so that I have a clue what's actually going on? I rose, my bones weary and my body far too heavy, and made my way to the bars of my cage. I had never even considered the possibility of being stuck down here in the dungeon like this. Like all young men, all young warriors, I had held the cocky belief that I was as close to invincible as a man could be, without actually being one of the gods. Being stuck in a cage was a pretty rude awakening, and I felt the sting of defeat acutely, with my fingers wrapped so tightly around the bars that my knuckles turned white. The contract the overlord gave you. Agreement, she corrected me. As if the terminology matters. I kept on. The contract you signed. What sort of ink did he use? Ink? She asked uncertainly, her arms wrapping tightly around her ribcage like she had suddenly become incredibly cold. He didn't use ink. Not exactly. Right. He used blood, didn't he? He used the quill to draw your blood, and then he had you sign with your own blood. He did. She was whispering now, and judging by the look on her face, she knew that what she had done was wrong. Looking at her now, I felt like I was going to lose it. I was already well aware of the finality of what she had done, and in a bit, she was going to know too. What would she do? What could she possibly do? It's a blood contract, Lily. It's different than a regular agreement. An oath made in blood. You are obligated in ways you have no idea. But he didn't tell me that. He didn't tell me what was really happening, so the contract should be void. I'm sure that's the way things work on your earth, 
but that's not how we do things in Onifal. You signed the contract, and whether you understood what you were doing or not, it's binding. You are tied to this now, and there's no way around it. Wait. My Earth. She was finally pinging on what I'd said a few seconds ago. Different realms. Different times. Different everything, I explained with a deep sigh. She shook her head, as if she was trying to wrap her head around it. Then she held up a hand. Wait a sec. But what does that mean about that oath? I don't understand what you're saying. It means you are bound to him. When you signed that paper, you were signing away your future. You no longer get to decide what happens to you. You are now sworn to be taken as the mate of one of the overlord's sons. She snapped to attention, gave me a double take. What? Wait, hold on just a minute. One of his son's mates? Mates? I'm only 18. Just 18. Just now. I'm nope. No way. There is no way that is happening. I'm sorry to say that it is. I don't think there's anything I could do to protect you now, not even if I wanted to. But someone can't just force you to sign away your whole future. He didn't force you, Lily. You signed it willingly. But I didn't know what I was signing. He lied to me. He told me it was about my brother. Try telling that to the soul gatherers, I thought, but I wasn't about to tell her that. It doesn't matter. You've promised yourself to one of his sons. You are inextricably linked to that family now. She moved toward her cot and sat with a heavy sigh. Her silence was so unusual for her. So worrisome. I said nothing, waiting for her to work through it in her mind. I knew she would have more questions for me in a moment. How could she not? She was always full of questions, even when she wasn't dealing with an arranged marriage she hadn't seen coming. So I sat quietly, trying to glimpse the expression on her face and at the same time finding it impossible to look away. Every human emotion on the spectrum seemed to be taking its turn there. At the bottom of it all, she just looked like a frightened kid. A beautiful frightened girl locked in a cage just like mine. Who are they? I was caught off guard. Who are who? The sons, Kate. Who are the overlord's sons? He has several. One of them you've already met, actually. I have, she asked in surprise. When? Who? Outside of the schism. The dark one. The one called Declan. The one you struck with my staff. That guy. You mean to tell me that one of the guys I might be forced into marrying is a guy whose face I've mangled? Not to mention that he wouldn't want that, I'm too young. I'm not. Why would he want to marry me after what I've done? I've been nothing but a massive pain to him from pretty much the minute he laid eyes on me. Not just to him, I muttered, trying not to smile despite the seriousness of our new predicament. Something about the matter-of-fact way she spoke was funny to me, funny and oddly endearing. She rolled her eyes and tucked her legs up under her, looking even more like a child than she had before. Ha ha, very funny. This is not happening. Oh, it's happening, I assured her. And I doubt your intended betrothed would have much of a choice, but even if he did, I don't think he would have the kind of problem you're thinking he would have. Um, why? Because Lily. Because of what you are. It's why they want you. It's the same reason I was trying to stop this kind of thing from happening. It's why I was sent to take your life. But why? What am I? I still don't understand that part. You keep saying that I'm different, but I don't understand how. And I definitely don't understand your role in all of this. What's your interest in this whole thing? My role was to help keep the line intact and to preserve our way of life. And to do that you had to kill me? Don't you think that's a little bit of an overreaction? The people who sent me didn't think so. That's how serious they consider this issue to be. It's how serious they are. I wasn't sure where I stood on the matter myself at this point. Her jaw dropped and I remained silent, waiting to see what she would have to say next. She looked like she had something she needed to say 
but not a word came out of her mouth. All of the color had drained from her face, making the dark circles gained from lack of sleep all the more apparent. Even seated the way she was, she swayed dangerously on her cot, and I was almost sure she was going to faint dead away. I made a lunge forward as if to catch her if she fell, but of course, there was nothing I could do. We were separated by two sets of bars, and enough rock to crush an elephant. Or a dragon, I thought grimly. We were separated and surrounded by enough rock to crush a dragon. That was a deterrent. Are you going to faint? No. Her eyes were glazed, despite her declaration. Well, I'm not honestly sure. I don't think I've ever fainted before. I don't think I've ever even seen someone faint before. You can put your head between your knees. I've heard that can help when you start to feel dizzy like that. I'm okay. Really, I'm okay. I just wish this didn't all seem so crazy to me. I've probably said more already than I ever should have. I don't know why I thought I would get any kind of answer other than that. It's how you like to do things, isn't it? You give just enough information to confuse me, and then you decide not to say anything else. I wanted to do something, to say something that might make it better for her. I even considered just spilling my guts and letting whatever happened afterward happen. Footsteps came down the hallway again, this time more than one set. There were five of them. Four guards stood outside of Lily's cell while one entered and took her gently by the shoulders. The fight in her seemed to be gone, and she allowed them to lead her out of the room without ever giving me a second look. Chapter 21 Lily Ricky. Oh my god Ricky, I can't believe it. I ran at him, almost knocking him over with the force of my body diving into his. He let out a strangled little sound of surprise, laughing and choking all at the same time. I actually almost knocked him over on the floor, but managed to right him again at the last second. Geez Lily, what's all the fuss about? What's all the fuss about? I stared at my baby brother in disbelief. I couldn't help it. I started to cry then, big fat tears rolling down my face accompanied by ugly gulping sobs. It was not pretty, this kind of crying, and I could see how uncomfortable it was making him. It was making me uncomfortable too, but I couldn't seem to stop. The full force of everything that had gone on in the last 24 hours had finally hit me all at one time. It felt like running into a brick wall leaving me helpless to do anything other than let it all out. I don't know how long I cried, but it was for a long, long time. It was long enough for Ricky to wander away from me and go back to what he was doing before I had come into the room, which had been eating and reading an old, incredibly thick book. When I was pretty sure I had regained a reasonable amount of control over myself, I went to the table where he sat, still sniffling slightly, but otherwise okay. You feel better? Ricky asked, his eyes focusing on the food in front of him instead of venturing a peek at my splotchy face. A lot better. Sorry Rickster, I don't really know where that came from. Lack of sleep maybe. I don't know. Stress? Ah, uh, don't call me Rickster Lily. You know I hate it when you do that. You're right. I ruffled his dark hair, a gesture I had made about a thousand times. I do know. That's why I do it. Now tell me, are you all right? Like really and truly all right? You can't imagine all of the terrible things I've been imagining. Seriously, Lily. Don't be a drama queen. I'm good. This place is actually kind of great. I didn't think so before, not when they had me off by myself with nobody to talk to and nothing to do, but it's definitely growing on me. Have you tasted this food? I glanced at the table. Meat. Fruits. Cheeses. What a banquet. And on fancy plates no less. Some plates were on tiers like four and five plates high. Cheese. Well what did I expect from a palace? I shook my head at him. He was fine. I'd been stuck in a cell, worried about him, and all along he was fine. And here I'd signed on to marry someone. Mary? Really? I flopped into the seat beside him and grabbed a massive juicy piece of fruit. 
It tasted like a pear, but better. I considered this new change in our fortunes. All of the talk about the blood contract still weighed heavily on my mind, there was no doubt about that. The idea that I might really have to marry someone I didn't even know was a terrible one and not something that could be easily shaken. But sitting in this beautiful new room with my brother looking so happy, it felt a whole lot more difficult to believe. When I had been held down in the dungeons with Cade, Cade whose face was a perfect mask of doom and gloom, it had felt like the entire world was coming to an end. But now? Now I wasn't so sure. They had come to get me, before I had been able to get any more information out of Cade like I'd had any success anyway. I had allowed the silent stoic guards to lead me away from Cade and the dungeons, and up to the rest of the building because I wanted to see my brother. The building as it turned out, that was actually a castle. It wasn't one of those fake castles, not the kind of things you might find in an amusement park. This castle was the real deal. I didn't know how exactly I knew that, but I did. I could feel it. Every inch of the place screamed ancient. The stone the place was built out of was weathered and faded, a million scrapes and nicks visible from centuries of people living around it. There were hundreds of tapestries lining the walls as we passed through room, upon room upon room, each one depicting some fierce battle or formidable-looking leader. As we moved up a winding set of stairs, I was able to look through a series of small windows down upon the land below us. Immediately surrounding the building was a vast stone courtyard with hundreds of little stalls set up. There were people everywhere, some dressed in robes and linens almost as fine as the ones the overlord had worn and some dressed in shifts that looked to be only one step above rags. Everywhere people were shouting, trying to grab the attention of passers-by in order to peddle their goods. It was an open-air market I realized and just beyond it a massive gate and even larger wall to keep the city safe and sound. Beyond that, I could see rolling green fields and then a massive amount of forestry. That must have been where we were hiding, I decided to myself. That was the place where we had been captured. It was too much to take in, and I was grateful for the comfort and relative peace of the set of rooms that had been designated for Ricky and me. There were two bedrooms, each with its own bathroom, connected by a large living space garnished with a gilded gold table topped with marble. The surface was covered with more food than the two of us could ever have eaten, and it was replaced each time we went to sleep. I wondered who took away the old food and what they did with it when it was removed, but I never saw anyone to ask. Chapter 22 Lily Days and days passed. The only person I saw in our suite if that's what you'd call our set of bedrooms, was Ricky. We hung out, read, looked at the people below, and enjoyed a serene existence, though we both hoped Mona was okay. I figured she'd gone back to the apartment, and I doubted she was sober enough to realize what had happened to Houston or us. Heck, many days she wasn't awake when we went to school or even when we got back from school. So I felt hopeful that she was okay and just boozing it up in and out of her regular stupors. It wasn't until what I estimated to be the fifth day that I saw a soul I could speak to, and by that time I had been lulled into a sense of comfort I would never have expected to feel in such a foreign place. Miss? Miss, I'm terribly sorry to disturb you. I laid down the hand of cards I had been playing with my brother. A deck we'd found this morning when we'd poked around in a drawer. You aren't disturbing me at all. And please, you don't have to call me Miss. My name is Lily. Call me that. Oh, thank you. You're too kind. Ricky and I exchanged curious glances, trying to figure out what to make of this new figure. She was dressed in some sort of uniform, which made me think she was probably some kind of a chambermaid. It struck me as funny that a word like chambermaid would even occur to me, and I started to laugh. Things certainly were different here, but we were starting to adjust. We were starting to adjust very well, something that made me happy. Or at least mostly happy. Underneath the happiness was a feeling of unease, but I did my best to ignore that. I didn't want to feel afraid and uneasy anymore. I didn't want to feel any negative emotions at all. 
I just wanted to go on the way Ricky and I had been going, with wonderful food and pretty rooms. I've been sent to fetch you, Miss Lily. The overlord would like to speak with you. I felt my sense of unease strengthen, and did my best to ignore it. I didn't want to think about the overlord, not about him or his contract or what Cade had said it really meant. I didn't want to think about any of it. I only wanted to continue to adjust, until I had no memory whatsoever of the things I was trying not to worry about. I rose, not able to think of what else I could do. All right, I replied softly, feeling like a stranger in my own body. I can do that. I started to follow her out of the room, but something made me turn back to look at Ricky again. He was sitting exactly where he had been before, pawing through the piles of food on our table and looking for the thing he was most interested in eating. He looked so happy. He looked happier than I could remember him having looked, since before he hurt his leg and became physically weak and mentally afraid of practically everything. I was beginning to feel more and more unsettled, but that was no reason to upset Ricky. If someone's bubble was about burst, let it be mine. It seemed like the least I could do for him, after everything he had been through. Which was way too much, especially for a kid his age. I'll see you soon, Ricky, okay? Don't think you're getting rid of me that easily. My throat felt choked with tears I wouldn't allow to fall. The overlord took my hands in his, greeting me as though I was a prized guest. I trust your stay is enjoyable. You are looking quite lovely today. I felt like I was in a surreal dream, the way he was greeting me, considering he'd had me sign a scroll with my own blood. I looked down at my dress, feeling slightly puzzled. It was a long flowing white thing, something that looked like it belonged to a princess instead of some random 18-year-old girl from Houston. He was right, it was a beautiful dress and much nicer than the dirty clothes I had been wearing before. There weren't exactly many choices in the wardrobe closets in our suite. Most of them were long dresses. None of my usual attire, and certainly no jeans or hoodies. Lily. Is everything all right? Of course. Everything is so lovely. I was just admiring the dress. You're right, it really is beautiful. I'm sorry. I seem to be so forgetful these days. I'm not sure why. Don't be sorry, no need for that at all. This place has that kind of effect on a person. Helps to melt the worries and the stress away. I nodded, hoping that the smile on my face looked as serene as I intended it to. So that was it then. Whatever forgetful lethargy had overtaken my brother and me, it had been done to us on purpose. They wanted us this way. The overlord wanted me this way, so that I would be easier to handle. I remembered again the things Cade had warned me about, this time with far more clarity than I had ever been able to achieve up in my chambers. Cade was right. We were in danger, at least we might be. I needed to keep very alert. I needed to keep us all safe. It really does. I kept right on smiling, smiling so much that my cheeks hurt at this point. I never knew it was possible to feel this good. Ricky too. He's had a hard time, you know? It's so good to see him happy. To see him feeling safe. Excellent. I was so hoping that you would find my home to your liking. I do. I pressed on, a plan formulating in my mind. I really do. We both do. I only wish Mona could be here to feel the healing effects as well. She's the one who really needs it, you know. She's sick. Not sick in the body, at least I don't think she is yet, but sick in the mind. This place would make her better, I think. I know it would. Can we bring her here? It simply isn't possible. Not anymore. But why? I appraised his expression, willing my ploy to work. It had to work. It was the only thing I could think of, to get my family back together. I had realized that fighting a man like this would never prove fruitful. He needed to be flattered. He needed to believe that he was winning, and that was exactly what I was giving him. I was giving him the victory he was so intent on, and I wanted my stepmother back in return. I'm sorry, 
but there are some things that even I cannot do. I don't believe you, I shot back sharply, losing some of my composure and finding it impossible to care. You can do anything. I see that. I feel that. Almost everything, but not quite. Even an overlord cannot bring people back from the dead. No, I whispered, feeling my whole body go instantly numb. No, don't say that. I don't believe you. You're lying. Would that I were. I wish I could produce her for you, if only to make you happy. But what I say is not a lie. I speak the truth. No. I don't believe you. It's a lie. Would you like to see for yourself? The question caught me totally off guard, and was enough to stop the steadily rising arc of my anger. Would I like to see? How was he going to manage that? Was he talking about taking me back to Houston? It seemed like the only way he would be able to show me something like that, but at the same time, I was pretty much positive it was something he would never do. I was beyond confused. He motioned for me to come forward. He led me to a large velvet curtain, stood to one side, motioning for me to move even closer with his head. I didn't want to. Whatever he was trying to show me, I didn't want to see it. That being said, I was powerless to stop myself. Because I had to see. I had to know for sure. What is it? I whispered, looking at his face intently, pointedly avoiding looking into the large silver bowl placed on a pedestal behind the curtain. It is a looking glass. Like a mirror? I suppose you could say that. It's unlike any mirror you've seen before. It's a mirror that shows you only truths. It shows what has taken place on all of the worlds, whichever world you wish to view. I couldn't help myself. I bent forward to look. I craned my neck and looked into the bowl. I screamed. Chapter 23 Lily Nobody came. That was the thing that kept playing through my head, over and over again, on some kind of terrible loop. Nobody came, nobody came, nobody came. Some strange yet familiar voice kept taunting me with that fact, driving me so crazy I wanted to knock myself out just so I didn't have to hear it anymore. It took me a minute or two to realize the voice was my own. But was I saying it out loud, or was it in my head alone? I had no idea. Everything felt too jumbled, like I was falling a great distance and couldn't get my balance no matter what I did. I was going down the rabbit hole and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I'm sorry. Truly I am. I didn't want to have to show you that. It's not real. My words came out in a weak whisper, nothing convincing about them. I felt my heart pounding in my chest, and knew that I wasn't sure I believed my own assertion. I wanted it not to be real, was practically desperate for it not to be real, but that wouldn't make it so. Wanting a thing and having it, were two different things entirely. I knew that. I had been forced to learn it at a young age, and it was a lesson I was never able to forget. I hadn't been able to pull my eyes away from the thing the overlord had called a looking glass. The bowl that the placid water resided in was undeniably beautiful, ornately designed with filigree that looked ancient. The pedestal it rested on was solid marble, yet somehow the placement still looked precarious. I was struck by a sudden urge to strike out and knock it to the ground, to just spill all of that water all over the floor so that its image would be destroyed forever. But I couldn't. I didn't even need to look at the overlord to know how closely he was watching me, and I had no doubt that knocking over his looking-glass pool would result in a pretty unpleasant punishment. I also knew, without ever having to look at his always benevolent face, that he was shaking his head at me with pity. He was standing there pitying me, pitying my refusal to accept the image of my stepmother's death as truth. I do so wish I could tell you it wasn't real. I nodded. I would never be able to unsee what I'd seen, no matter how much I wanted to, my stepmother lying in a pine box, the casket open to reveal her pale drawn face. She looked so small, so sickly, and there was nobody there for her at all. There was only a funeral director 
and he was leaning up against a podium and checking his watch every 30 seconds. She was alone, and it was all my fault. Nobody came to her funeral. I hadn't been there to save her. I hadn't found a way to take care of her, and now she was gone. I felt completely numb. I knew I should feel something far fiercer than that, but there was nothing but a numbness and a sense of disbelief so complete that there wasn't room for anything else. I couldn't even cry. It didn't feel real enough to cry. Is there anything I can do? Are you going to be all right? Fine. I'm going to be just fine. He looked at me hesitantly, clearly worried that I was about to completely lose it, and made a little noise as he cleared his throat uncomfortably. I looked at him full on then, and saw that he really did look unsure, like he didn't know exactly where he was supposed to go from here. Really? I'm fine. I'm not going to flip out or anything like that. I didn't think you were. It's just... What? I asked the question quickly, feeling myself losing patience with his delays. What? Well, it's just that I had something special planned for you, and now I'm not sure it's the right time to do it. I'm trying to decide whether or not I should just reschedule the whole thing for a later date. Are you going to be able to find a later date when my stepmother isn't dead? The question was a harsh one, and the overlord actually winced as if I had struck him. I felt bad then, wishing I could keep better control over myself. It wasn't his fault, after all. Even Mona would have told me not to shoot the messenger, which was exactly what I was doing. I needed to get a grip. Acting like a total monster was going to help anything. It was most likely going to make things a whole lot worse. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I don't know why I did. Because you're in pain, he responded softly, hesitating before placing a gentle hand on my shaking shoulder. And it's understandable. And you don't need to delay anything. Whatever it is you wanted to show me, go ahead and do it. You might as well, right? Maybe it will take my mind off of things, give me something to think about other than my stepmom. And you know, what happened to her? Of course, he said gravely, choosing not to react to the thick quality my voice had taken on, or the tears springing up in my eyes. That makes perfect sense. If you'll follow me then. There was nothing else for me to do, and I knew it. Ricky was safe upstairs in our chambers, with all the good books to read and delicious food to eat he could possibly wish for. The only thing I'd had left to fight for was my stepmother, and now she was gone. If the overlord wanted to show me something, let him. What was the point in fighting at this point? Just what the hell was the point? I followed him through a long series of corridors, each one lined more lavishly than the last with tapestries and thick fancy wallpaper the likes of which I had never seen. I had never seen this part of the castle before, but then again, I had never seen much of any of it. I had mostly just been tucked away in my chambers or suites or whatever and been happy to be there, safe with my brother in some sort of alternate reality where there were no explosions, no bullies to pick on him, and no abusive ex-boyfriends of Mona's to deal with. Whatever it was the overlord was leading me to, he was practically vibrating with excitement over it. Finally, after I had started to think he was just leading me through some kind of bizarre maze just to confuse me, we came to a large set of double doors so tall I had to crane my neck back to see the top. The overlord stopped, peering back at me with shining eyes and a heavily working jaw. He was grinding his teeth. Wow. Whatever it was that was about to happen, he was so excited about it that he was grinding his teeth. All right, dear, are you ready? Sure. Why not? He frowned ever so slightly, clearly unhappy with my lack of enthusiasm, and then flung the two doors open. They looked incredibly heavy, and I was pretty sure I wouldn't have been able to open them on my own. For a second I thought I had gone blind. That was how intense the light in the room was. How much brighter it was than the light in any of the other parts of the castle I had been in. All I could see was bright white so grand, and so expansive that nothing else in the room seemed to matter. It was only after I'd had a couple of seconds to recover that I began to see what else surrounded me, 
and that was just as impressive as the light itself had been. We were in what I could only figure was the throne room, with an impossibly high ceiling from which imposing-looking iron chandeliers hung. The two walls on either side of the entrance were lined with windows that went from practically the floor all the way up to the ceiling, meeting in arches at the top with tiny angels watching over everyone from the apex. That was where most of the light was coming from now, and I couldn't help but drift to one of the massive windows to peer out across the countryside in awe. Whatever else this strange world of Anafal was, it was certainly beautiful as well. I had never seen grass so green, a sky so blue. Nowhere in sight were the massive steel buildings and disgusting refineries I had grown accustomed to while living in Houston. There was nothing at all but the natural beauty of the land, and looking at it made me feel like I might start to cry. Lily, the overlord called to me. That's not actually what I wanted you to see. But it's so beautiful, I whispered, feeling completely entranced by the vision before me. How could you not just stare at it all of the time? It is beautiful, isn't it? I've always thought so myself. Me too, a new voice said. I flinched and whirled around. I had been so completely absorbed in looking at the strange new land stretched out in front of me, that I hadn't noticed someone walking up behind me. When he spoke, I just about had a heart attack, and when I turned to face this new intruder, I came very close to just decking him in the face. What do you think you're doing? I couldn't believe it was him. I also wondered why he hadn't attacked me. Looking. Um, okay, that's all well and good, but didn't anyone ever tell you not to creep up on people that way? Didn't your parents teach you any manners? The stranger began to chuckle, which was when I noticed the others behind him who were all chuckling as well. Three other guys plus the overlord. The stranger's fiery eyes were full of good cheer, and his body was actually rocking from his chuckles. Hear that, father. You and mother should have taught me better manners. Apparently, mine are lacking. I'll see what I can do, my son, but I fear that at this point you and your brothers are a lost cause. I felt my face begin to burn with embarrassment and wished wholeheartedly that I could just melt into the floor and disappear. Of course they were his sons. Now that I was paying more attention, I could see that the one in front of me looked like the overlord. He had the same golden skin, the same thick and wavy hair. Even the way his eyes crinkled at the corners were the same as his father's. He was his father's son for sure, and he wasn't the only one. This was my surprise for you, Lily. I wanted to finally introduce you to my sons. I wanted you to meet them, but I don't want to put you on the spot. I absolutely felt put on the spot. The one nearest me held out the crook of his arm for me and raised his eyes in a questioning look. It felt like he was daring me to take his arm, daring me not to be afraid, which was just enough to give me the courage to do what was being asked of me. I was a little bit too competitive for my own good, and I had a stubborn streak that drove my friends and family crazy. I allowed myself to be led over to the overlord and his brood. They stood in a line in front of a massive, velvet-covered throne. The velvet was the exact same color as the plum of the overlord robes, and I couldn't help thinking to myself that if it weren't for the color of his skin, the guy would have blended in completely. Lily, please allow me to have the great pleasure of introducing you to my sons. The one who startled you so badly is Donovan. He is the youngest, and I'm afraid he's a bit out of control at times. Hey. I take offense to that. But only because it's true, I must point that out. Donovan's eyes twinkled with mischief. He was definitely likable. And this is Belton. He is my second youngest. Beside him is Kame. He's our resident green thumb, able to make just about anything in the world grow and thrive as far as I can tell. There was one left, not facing us. He turned around. And last but not least is Declan. I believe the two of you have met before. The one guy they first probably never wanted to see again stepped forward. Yes, I managed to squeak out, feeling as if my throat had started to close up completely. We have. Should I apologize for slicing his face with Cade's staff? The room was silent, 
all eyes moving quickly back and forth between me and Declan. His brothers all looked pretty happy to see me, and all of them that same golden hue as their father. Declan was the only one who looked different, and it was such a total difference that it didn't look like he was even related. He was also the only one who wasn't smiling, and who didn't look particularly pleased to see me at all. All it took was one look at his face to know why he would be angry at me, or at the very least on the fence. In the place where I had struck him with Cade's staff, there was a long, angry-looking cut that would clearly turn into a permanent scar. It made him look menacing, and it was all I could do to keep from shrinking back, turning around, and running out of the room as quickly as I possibly could. The overlord cleared his throat, breaking the silence. Declan turned from me to look at his father, and some kind of silent message passed between the two of them. When he turned to look at me again, his expression softened. There was even the ghost of a smile there, something I would have believed impossible if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. He spoke softly, his voice sounding much different than it had in the field when he had been so intent on killing Cade. We all have our scars, don't we? It's just a matter of where we wear them. And how? Why yes, I said with surprise, taken aback by how perfectly that statement summed up the way I felt about the situation with my stepmom. I'm sorry. He nodded. I have an announcement, the overlord stated with a flourish. Oh boy. Donovan laughed good-naturedly. Here we go. My father and his announcements. The overlord sent a patronizing smile in his son's direction. In honor of our very special guest, we will be having a grand banquet. I inhaled sharply. A banquet? Because of me? But of course. It's not every day that we have such a special guest come to our lands. It's something to be celebrated. You don't have to do that. My cheeks were flaming, I could feel it. And as if that wasn't enough, I could feel Declan's dark gaze on me. I wished at that moment that I could shrink into the flooring. Nonsense. There will be a ball. He nodded and then turned away from me, apparently done talking for the moment. Not knowing what exactly I was supposed to be doing at that point, I started to slink off toward the doors. I wasn't sure that I would be able to find my way back to my room, but I thought it was worth a shot. I was suddenly feeling very overwhelmed with all of the ups and downs of the day, and the idea of being alone was an appealing one. I didn't even feel like talking to Ricky anymore. I just needed to curl up in bed and try to figure out what on earth I was to make of the events of the day. Chapter 24 Lily I don't care, Lily. That's what I'm trying to say. Do you really think I want to spend the night down at some stupid grown-ups party? I can't think of anything that sounds worse. I know it might not be your idea of a good time, Ricky, but I'm starting to worry about you. Worry about me? Worry about me for what? Because? You never do anything anymore. Hey. Not fair. I do things. I do things all the time. Right, things like eating, reading, sleeping. What's wrong with doing things like that? Well, nothing. Stop it, Lily, okay? Just stop it. Stop what? You don't have to do this. Do what? I'm not doing anything, I'm just saying. You are, though. You're trying to take care of me. Like you're my parent. But you're not. You aren't Mona, and you're not Mom. Or Dad. You don't have to keep trying to be. Ricky was staring down at his open book, a bit of jam still caught on the corner of his mouth from all of the jam and bread he'd been munching on throughout the day. He was looking at his open book without seeing anything, his eyes blurry with tears neither one of us was ever going to acknowledge. He was looking at his pages like his life depended on them, and he was doing it because he wanted to look anywhere but at me. Honestly, I was glad. I knew he didn't mean his words to be hurtful, but they felt like a sucker punch to the gut. All I had done since we lost our parents was look after Ricky. It was pretty much all that mattered to me, especially since he was the only family I had now. 
Telling him about what I had seen in the looking glass had been one of the hardest things I had ever had to do. I hadn't known what to expect. I thought he might scream or wail or maybe even hurl himself across the floor, prostrating himself with grief. What he had actually done was nothing like any of those things. What he had actually done was nothing at all. His face had gone very pale, his eyes over bright, but he hadn't spoken a word. After standing like a statue for what felt like a lifetime, he'd simply turned and walked out of the living room and shut himself in his bedroom. He didn't come out for a day and a half, not for food or water or anything. When I finally saw him again, he wouldn't talk about what had happened to Mona, and I didn't want to push it with him. The last thing I wanted to do was hurt him any more than I already had. Never mind that the words he spoke to me now were beyond hurtful, that they felt like a real physical pain. You look really pretty though. Honest you do, Lily. I didn't know you could look so fancy. Thanks. I looked down at myself, blushing. The dress really was beautiful, definitely the prettiest thing I had ever had on. It was the same deep plum color as the robes the overlord had worn the day he had told me about my stepmother. My hair was piled up on top of my head, in a whole mess of intricately plaited braids I would never have been able to construct myself. I hadn't had to either, because they had sent an attendant to get me ready. I couldn't help thinking that this was probably pretty similar to what it would be like on my wedding day, which only made me think about the fact that I was now supposedly to be betrothed to one of the overlord's sons. Was that what the whole banquet, fancy ball thing about? Was the reason just to get me more socialized with his sons, to get used to the world of Anafal so that I would transition smoothly? Um, Lily? Hum? You're going to be late. What? Oh. Oh no. I was not only running late, I was running very late. I was supposed to be down in the throne room at 7 on the dot, and here it was 7.45 with me still standing there in the living room. There was no more time to feel sorry for Ricky, who had, for some reason, not even been invited to the ball but didn't want to go anyway. And no more time to try not to think about my maybe impending betrothal. I was late, and I had a feeling the overlord wouldn't like that at all. I flung the door to the rooms open, throwing myself out of them with complete recklessness, and ran smack into a tall figure who was about to knock on the door. I hit the figure so hard that I actually rebounded backward, almost falling to the ground, and most likely ruining my beautiful dress. It was only a strong hand that kept me from landing on my backside, something I was infinitely grateful for. I didn't want to make my grand entrance to my first ever ball, looking like a mess. I might not have known what it was all about, but I couldn't deny that I was pretty freaking excited about it. I never got to go prom. So, this was like my prom. You should try and be more careful, Lily. One of these days, you're going to truly hurt yourself. Declan. Declan. And who'd have thought he cleans up so nicely? Oh. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to. I wasn't looking where I was going. No, I don't suppose you were. I'm running late, you see. I'm running really late. Yes, indeed you are. That's why I'm here. I've come to escort you, in case you forgot where it was that you were trying to go. T, thank you. I hated the fact that I was stuttering so much, but I was powerless to stop myself. I had thought I was nervous before, but that didn't even come close to how nervous I was feeling now. Out of all of the people in Anafal they could have sent to come and retrieve me, they had sent Declan. I didn't know if it was meant to be some kind of a test, maybe a punishment, but it definitely felt like one. He stood tall and brooding before me. The hand he had used to help keep me steady was still holding mine. I felt the oddest little jolt of electricity where our skin touched, and I drew my hand back quickly, almost as if I had been burned by something unbearably hot. The weird thing was, it wasn't exactly a bad thing. There was something that felt good about it which made me feel strange and super uncomfortable. I wasn't sure if he felt it too, but his constantly composed face wavered for a moment, during which I was pretty sure I saw the same kind of surprise I had just felt. Right. 
let's go then. It wouldn't do for me to come looking for you, and to then have both of us coming in late. Of course, I said quickly, glad for the change of subject. That definitely wouldn't be good. Can I ask you kind of a stupid question, before we go though? Oh God, I was babbling again. I suppose so, if you really think it's necessary. Although why you would want to ask something you yourself have already categorized as stupid is beyond me. Just be quiet and listen, will you? Haven't you ever escorted a girl to anything fancy before? Me? Duh. Yes, you. Who else would I be talking to? Do you see anyone else around who's about to escort me somewhere? No, he answered hotly, apparently flustered from my little jabs. I was only trying to be clear. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? No, there isn't, but you still haven't answered my question. What question? The one where I asked you if I could ask you a question. Fine, fine, ask your question. Just make it fast, will you? We really should be going. And by the way, technically, you did ask me a question already. He had me there. And that irritated me a bit. That wasn't the question. I just wanted to ask. I chewed on my lip. Yes, yes, what is it? The dress. Do I look okay? Do you think I'll look okay compared to the rest of the people in the ball? And why did I care what he thought? Or what he thought about what anyone else thought? Oh. Oh, I see. I see. I almost laughed then. I was so surprised by his response to the admittedly silly question. It was such a typical chick thing to ask, but I couldn't help myself. Because in the end, I was just a girl. I was just an 18-year-old girl who was going to my first formal event. From the look on Declan's face, however, it was pretty obvious that he'd never had a girl ask him something like that, point blank. I wondered just how much time he had actually spent around girls, which automatically led me to wonder whether or not he was the one I was supposed to marry, assuming that whole thing wasn't some kind of weird lie concocted by Cade for reasons unknown. I looked quickly at my feet, now every bit as flustered as Declan looked. Served me right for laughing at him, even if I didn't do it out loud. Not that deserving my discomfort made me wish any less that I could just lock myself in my bedroom. Lily. Nope. Nothing, forget about it. Please just forget I said anything at all. It was stupid. I'm just being an idiot. Lily. Look at me please. I peeked up at him from underneath my lashes, doing my best to look at him and not look at him at the exact same time. My heart was still tap tap tapping against the inside of my ribcage, with fear, nerves, I didn't even know what it was. Declan, on the other side, was looking far more composed, having quickly gotten himself back together after my successfully rattling him. For what it's worth, you look lovely tonight. You look perfect for the ball. There won't be anyone there lovelier than you. Now please will you take my arm? A blush crept its way through me, sneaking up on me, a warmth. I couldn't for the life of me understand why it mattered so much that he thought I was lovely. I kept looking at him from under my lashes. Even with that slash on his face, or maybe even more so because of it, he was darkly handsome. I caught the sigh before it slipped out, and I hesitated but only for a split second. Whoever this version of Declan was, he didn't seem to have anything to do with the dragon shifter I had seen in that field outside of Houston. I looked him straight in the eye and took the arm he was offering. Chapter 25 Lily Somehow, it hadn't occurred to me that Declan would stay with me once we were actually in the ball. I guess I hadn't really gotten that far, having put all of my energy into the process of just getting to the event to begin with. But it became very clear almost immediately after entering the throne room, which had been entirely transformed and looked like something out of a fairy tale, that he had no intention of leaving me on my own. Instead, he kept my arm wound through the crook of his own, keeping me so close to him that I could feel the heat of his body through my dress. In normal circumstances, having an escort that was basically a bodyguard would have driven me nuts, but on this evening, 
I was actually sort of grateful for the company. I was in way over my head, swept up in a sea of finely dressed people who all looked much more grand and important than I could ever hope to be. I knew that this soiree was allegedly to honor my arrival, although why my brother wasn't being honored as well was something I still couldn't figure out, but that didn't make me any keener on actually talking to anyone. The mere thought of doing so was terrifying, leaving me content to let Declan lead me confidently around the room. And he was confident, there was no doubt about that. Gone was the awkward confusion from the hallway outside of my rooms. There was no trace of the guy the first had managed to fluster so badly simply by trying to ask him how I looked. At this point Declan looked completely sure of himself, with no doubt that he would do and say all right things. I didn't even think about whether or not he was being overly cocky. I was glad to be able to sit back and listen, like some kind of a pretty prop that was to be seen and not heard. The thing about not saying anything was that it made it so much easier to listen which was exactly what I did. For at least an hour, I listened to both the conversations Declan engaged in and the ones being had all around me. I listened so well that, by the time I actually caught a quiet moment with my escort, I knew exactly which question I wanted to ask him most. There was one thing in particular that I kept hearing spoken of in whispered hushes, usually accompanied by sly sideways looks in my direction, and I wanted to know what the heck it meant. He gave me a smile. So then, what do you think? About what? Would this be the perfect time to ask? About this, Lily, Declan responded with an indulgent smile as he gestured around the vast throne room. About the ball. It's your first, after all. I'm curious how you find it. I'm not going to lie, it's pretty fantastic. Kind of overwhelming. Overwhelming. Interesting choice of word. What is it that you find overwhelming about it? I mean come on Declan, is that question for real? Of course it is. Why would I ask a question I didn't want the answer to? Fair point I guess, I mumbled to myself, trying not to laugh at the small frown that had begun to crease his forehead. Okay. It's overwhelming because this room is huge, and it's filled up with people I don't know at all, have never seen in my life. It's overwhelming because everything here is the kind of fancy that makes me feel like it's worth more than my life, and I don't want to break anything. And it's overwhelming because I still don't have a good enough grasp on what it is I'm doing here in the first place. Does that about sum it up? I suppose it does. I guess I hadn't thought about it in those terms. He looked puzzled then, which struck me with the oddest sensation. Here was this incredibly tall, dark, mysterious dragon warrior who also happened to be son of the overlord of Anifal. He was all of those things, but in his consideration of what I had just said, he also looked a lot like a little boy. That's when it hit me that I might not be the only one feeling overwhelmed here. Maybe my being there was at least a little overwhelming too. For Declan, for the overlord, for all of them. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that might be pretty dead on, even though I didn't have proof. I was operating on instinct now, just as I had been from the moment everything turned upside down on a Galveston beach. But then again, I still had that question spawned by conversations and remarks. So I dove in. Can I ask you a question? I looked him in the face, but still found it hard to put my eyes on the slash I'd left him. You can. Declan appeared visibly relieved not to have to think about whatever my words had made him think anymore, and answered me quickly. And I promise I will do my best to answer it. Okay then. Can you tell me what people mean when they talk about the above ground? Declan froze. It was like the entire room froze, although in reality nobody had taken any notice of my question aside from Declan. I guessed he hadn't ever considered the fact that I might be listening to what was going on around me, and because he hadn't, he didn't seem to know what to do. He looked around quickly, his eyes darting from one corner of the room to the other in a manic kind of a way. Whether he was looking for backup or to make sure that nobody was there to listen to us, I couldn't really say, but whatever else he was doing, I thought he was probably trying to buy time as well. Finally, 
after a long enough time to make me feel uncomfortable in my own skin, his eyes alit back on my face. The storm rolling inside them made me feel like a lost little girl. Which, in a way, I suppose is exactly what I was. Why do you ask me that? Where did you even hear that term? What do you mean, where? I asked, aware of the defensiveness in my voice and unable to get rid of it. Where do you think? I'm not exactly deaf, you know? It's something I've heard people whispering about, on and off, the whole time we've been here. Is that so? He raised a brow, making him look even more darkly dangerous. And yeah, I guess hot. Yes, I spoke slowly, feeling the annoyance bubbling up inside of me and doing my best to keep it in check. Hot or not, he was irritating me. It is. And I would like to know what it means. It must be important if people keep talking about it, right? People don't usually sit around talking about things that don't matter at all. I don't know if that's true or not, but I suppose you might as well know. It's not as if I can keep it from you, forever. Great. So, lay it on me. It's simple, really. The above ground is exactly what it sounds like. It's the world above. The world above? Precisely. The world above. It's what we call the earth, the earth where you came from. Oh. He made it sound so outer space-ish, but I knew it wasn't. I knew we were separated by that schism I came through. It wasn't like I did any kind of space travel. It didn't seem like enough to say, but then again nothing seemed like enough to say. I was frankly stunned. Somehow it hadn't crossed my mind that the fancy guests of the Overlord Party would be talking about my home as if it were another planet altogether. It hadn't occurred to me, but now that I knew, I wanted to know why. I had a feeling of dread building inside of me, and no doubt in my mind that it was because of all of the above-ground conversation. Something was going on. Something I was afraid I wasn't going to like. Yes. See. Simple. Declan spoke with a matter-of-fact tone that made me want to kick him in the shin, acting as if the topic had been addressed and was now closed. Except it wasn't. For me, the topic was anything but closed. My questions had just begun. But why are they all talking about it? What's there to talk about? The change, he sighed. They're talking about the change. Not helping. What change? What the flip does that even mean? It means the change to the earth. The earth you knew was different. Changes are being made. Things are happening. I still don't understand, I whispered, although I had the vaguest inkling that maybe I did understand and just didn't want to admit it to myself. What kind of changes need to happen? The kinds of changes that will turn the earth to its natural order. Did that mean getting rid of my kind? My people? What the heck? What? You can't do that. I didn't wait to hear Declan's response. I gave him one last fiery look, then turned on my heels and ran. Chapter 26 Lily Stop. Stop Lily please. I couldn't do it. I could hear Declan's footsteps pounding on the stone floor behind me, but I couldn't stop running. He was going to catch me soon, there was no doubt about that. He was larger than me, faster than me, and much better trained in everything that could have anything to do with combat. Not to mention he was a dragon, I reminded myself with a ridiculous sense of envy. I wasn't sure how much of an edge that gave him, but I knew there was one. So sure he was going to catch me, which made my running entirely futile. I didn't care. I didn't care about anything. All I knew was that there was an overwhelming feeling of anger and sadness sitting on my chest and I felt like I was going to suffocate if I didn't find a way to get rid of it. I said stop. Declan's hand clamped around my upper arm, his fingers digging into my flesh hard enough that I was sure I was going to have bruises the next morning. The force of it spun me around to face him, towering height and terrifying eyes and all. I didn't even think about the next thing I did. I didn't even really look at him. I just hauled off and hit him slapped him in the face as hard as I could manage. 
I felt the instant painful tingle in my skin that came along with the force of contact, and shook my hand quickly, shocked by how much I had managed to hurt myself. When I glanced up at Declan's face, I saw that he hardly looked phased at all. Either I had only hurt myself with my hit, or Declan had one hell of a poker face. I seriously hoped it was the latter, but I thought it was more likely to be the former. Knowing that made me feel even more ineffectual than I already had, and hot tears began to slide down my face. I hated the fact that I was letting this guy see me cry, but I couldn't control it. I was so far past my limit at that point that it wasn't even funny. Feel better? No. No, I don't feel even a little bit better. What do you want with me, Declan? What did you follow me for? Because? We weren't done. Oh, I beg to differ. We most certainly are done. Once a guy tells me he's in the process of making changes, maybe even changes that might involve a plan to vanquish the whole human race, a race I happen to be a proud member of, I'm pretty much done. Now let me go. I don't even want to look at you anymore. Are you telling me you don't know? Know what? Declan had his head cocked to one side, a look of frank curiosity in his eyes that made my hand tingle with the desire to deliver another slap. I was through with his surprises. I had been through so many different emotions in just the last couple of hours that I felt seasick, and a lot of them had been at his hands. There I was, in my fancy party dress, in the middle of a strange castle's hallway in an even stranger land, crying. No, Declan. Clearly, I don't know what you're trying to get at. So, do you think you could just get it over with? Stop it with the cryptic talk, and tell me what you want to say. I can't do this anymore. He was as bad Cade, in terms of not delivering information. It's just that you're missing a key element of the equation, Lily. I think you're angry, because I'm speaking of returning the balance of order for humans and their place in the world. Gee, I interrupted with the most dripping sarcasm I could muster. You think? You're offended by the prospect, which leads me to believe you think you are included in this assessment of the human's usefulness. Well duh. Why would I think I was the one exception in the whole of the human race? But that's just it, Lily. That's the piece of the puzzle you don't seem to have. You aren't the one exception to the plan because you aren't human. You aren't one of them. My mouth dropped open but not a single word came out. Some part of my brain was aware that I must have looked a lot like a fish pulled out of the water and gasping for life-sustaining breaths of air, but I couldn't seem to make my jaw work. I just stood there, not a clue what on earth I was supposed to say to that. It wasn't possible. That's what I wanted to say. There was just no way that I wasn't a human. My dad and mom, who I had virtually no memory of, but I didn't see how that came into play, were human. My brother too. I had always been a human, just an ordinary human girl. I wanted to tell him it wasn't possible for me to be anything else, except I wasn't sure it was true. A week ago everything made sense to me, but now? It felt like the rug that supported everything I held to be true, had been pulled right out from underneath me. Declan peered into my face, and it was as if he could read my thoughts like he was reading a book. He pounced on my doubts like a predatory cat, and I was powerless to stop him. It's true, Lily. I can see you're not sure, but I can assure you that it's 100% true. His eyes glowed with a certain sincerity. I touched my fingers to my temples. It felt like my world was spinning. So far, I wouldn't have believed anything I'd seen in the last few days. I was pretty sure he was delivering the truth, but still. But still. I sighed. If I'm not human, what am I? I know I'm not one of you. I think I would have noticed if I had the ability to change into a freaking dragon, don't you? Yes? He smiled in a way that might or might not have been intended to be condescending. Or at least I would hope so. Well then what? I tried to keep an open mind. He licked his lips as if preparing himself. You're a witch. Quite a powerful one at that. What? What? My head went from spinning to F5 tornado. 
Oh right, I'm a witch. Okay, sure. So if I'm some crazy powerful witch, how come I didn't know it? How come I don't have a single memory of being one? Well, you wouldn't have any memories of it, would you? All of those memories were taken from you. That's convenient, I muttered, feeling ridiculous just to be having the conversation at all. No, I can assure you it is not. We've been looking for you for a long time, Lily. Longer than you could possibly dream of. Do you know how difficult that is, when the one you're looking for doesn't even know who she is? Please. Now I know you're exaggerating. I just turned 18 like a week ago. So, you couldn't have been looking for all that long. No, there's where you're wrong again. You just turned 18 in this life. You're operating under the assumption that this is the only life you've had to lead. Okay, so let's assume that what you're telling me is true and that you aren't actually some psychopath messing with me to have a good time. Let's say I'm a witch with a wiped memory and a whole bunch of lives under my belt, none of which I can remember either. All right, let's. I still don't see what that has to do with you. Why would my being a witch make you want to look for me? What do witches have to do with the world of Anafal? Witches and dragon shifters have a long history with each other. Our lifelines are linked. So it has been from the earliest days back when things were right amongst the worlds, and the balance of powers was just as it should be. You were one of our originals, Lily. In a past life, your ancestors were the witches in our kingdom's council. Why does that matter? Because of the prophecy. It was foretold. In a time when all of the lands are in peril, facing their collective demise, the One of Light will return to take back what was forgotten. That's you. You're the One Lily. Liliana. The One of Light. Everything rests on you. I think part of you knows it too. I think that part is the same as the little voice that told you to follow the light of the schism, to see where it might lead. A light, I might remind you, that no human is able to see. All of a sudden, I felt dizzy, like I was about to fall to the floor in a crumpled up pile. I swayed on my feet. Declan grabbed for a decorative chair that had been conveniently placed in the hallway. He sat me in it gently, then knelt before me and looked up earnestly into my face. I couldn't look away from him, but oh how I wished I could. This was all too much. Whatever role I was supposed to play in the realigning of the worlds, or whatever it was Declan thought I was there for, I wanted no part of it. I didn't want to be some kind of otherworldly savior type. I just wanted to go home and watch TV, to go to college and maybe actually go on a date someday. I wanted the same things any girl my age would want and if I accepted what Declan was telling me, it would mean that things would never be ordinary for me again. I know this must feel like far too much for you to take in. I don't know what to think, Declan. Seriously, I don't. I don't even know how I would go about trying to figure out if what you're saying is even true. I might have a way to help with that. If you'll let me. Okay. I felt my own uncertainty like a stone in my stomach making it hard for me to even talk. Just show up. In the back courtyard tomorrow. I'll have a maid come and retrieve you at first light. Do you think you can do that? I nodded that I could, but in my heart of hearts I just didn't know. I didn't know later on that evening either, after my exhausted head finally hit my downy pillow. The one thing I knew for sure was that first light was going to come quickly, and at that point, I was going to have to make up my mind. Chapter 27 Lily Declan's brow was quirked in a way that I found was his, completely. I'm surprised. He wore a half-smirk, half-smile. What the hell for? You said first light, didn't you? You even sent a babysitter to make sure I wasn't late. I don't see what there is to be surprised about. Honestly, Declan, you really are one of the strangest guys I've ever met, and I don't even mean because of the whole dragon shifter thing. Declan chuckled and shook his head, but he said nothing. I had gone to bed late, sneaking into my room quietly so as not to disturb a sleeping Ricky. 
I had slipped between the cold sheets, exhausted and glad to finally lay my head down. Unfortunately, my body being so tired didn't seem to mean anything to my mind, which had no intention of shutting itself down. From my estimate, I guessed I got somewhere between two and three hours of sleep, and that was nowhere near enough for me. I was still confused from the night before, and now on top of it, I was beyond cranky. Not a good combination at all. It made me want to be a bully. As far as I was concerned, Declan was the best target around. No, seriously. I want to know, Declan. What makes you so freaking surprised? You told me to show up and so here I am. What's so shocking about that? I'm surprised because you didn't sound very convincing when you agreed to come. After all, you don't believe in any of this, do you? Nope. Not even a little bit. Ah. Uh, I can't afford to. That was a lie, of course. If I honestly didn't believe it at least a little bit, I wouldn't have dragged myself out of bed when it was practically still dark outside. I would have just gone right on sleeping, the way my aching limbs were still begging me to do. If I hadn't believed it at all, I wouldn't have let the idea keep me up all night. I would have known there was nothing to worry about. But here I was, and that meant something. Whether I wanted to admit it to Declan or not, in my heart I knew it meant something. Are you ready to begin? Ready to begin what? I asked crossly, terribly annoyed with the fact that he had intruded in on my private brooding. Your training, of course. What else would we be here for? Training? I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. So what? They were going to try and incorporate me into their dragon shifter army? That was all well and good, I guessed, except for the fact that I was neither a soldier nor a shifter. And as far as I could tell, my so called status as a witch didn't give me much of an edge. So far, I hadn't noticed it giving me much of anything. And why couldn't I work any magic? Yes, Lily. Training. You've got to remember who you are and what you can do. It's important. It's vitally important, and I think you know it. Are you game or not? I'm game. What do you want me to do? For starters, take this. He tossed me something, and before I even stopped to look at what it was, it was in my hand. My fingers closed around it tightly, my hand vibrating with a power I didn't understand. I stared down at what lay in my palm. It was a rod, just like the one belonging to Cade. The one I had picked up in the field a lifetime ago. At the time I hadn't given much thought to what it meant for me to be holding it, but now I knew far more. I knew that these things weren't usable by just anyone. These things were powerful, and there was a reason he had given it to me. Who does this one belong to? I knew that answer in my heart. Open it. Open it, then we talk. I did exactly as he asked without giving it a second thought, as if instinct kicked in. As if reflex kicked in. As if memory kicked in, and I'd done that before. Now that thought right there scared the bejesus out of me. One flick of my wrist and the rod had grown an amazing length, turning into a staff even taller than I was. I could feel its power coursing through me freely now, unencumbered. Unlike Cade's silver-white staff, it glowed a bright plum color, the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And where it connected to my hand, my skin on my body. Okay, I answered in a trembling voice, whether with fear or excitement I wasn't quite sure. Now what? Are you going to tell me who this belongs to? It belongs to you. Huh? Wait what? It belongs to you. From long ago. It's one of your relics one of the things we've kept close all of this time while we searched all of the worlds for you. You are its rightful owner. Nobody can wield it but you. Why could I work Cades then? If only one person is supposed to be able to use one of these rods, why could I open Cades and cut you with it? Yes that. And may I thank you for giving me such a delicate reminder of that charming event, by the way. He raised his hand to his face. The slash mark was healing, but still an angry reminder of what I'd done. I glanced down, ashamed now, all things considered. Simple, really. You can use any of them. 
You could use every one of them, one right after the other. Because they all come from your kind. It's like you're the mother of the staffs. You're the one who discovered how to harness the light and use it for the power it really possesses. They are your kind's creation. Mine. No way. This was cool and awe-inspiring. I guess you could say that. Now, do you know how to use it? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. For the next hour and a half, I felt like I was flying. The staff in my hand was the key. It was the thing that had been missing for all my life that I hadn't even known wasn't there. It was like a missing limb reattached, and I knew that I would never be able to let it go again. With my staff, I could do anything. I could do more than feel like I was flying, I could actually fly. If I hit the ground hard enough with it, I could propel myself up into the air, and I wouldn't have to come back down again until I used the staff to bring myself back. Declan watched me for a while, just stood back and watched as I learned, or as he reminded me, relearned how to navigate the atmosphere around me. I'd have to address that whole matter about other lifetimes someday, but right now I could only deal with so much. It was like riding a bike using the staff. I could tell that I had done this before, even though I still had zero memories of it. There was no way that all of the magical things the staff could do would have just come to me out of nowhere. It was one thing to be a natural, but this was out of control. If I had still been harboring any doubts about Declan's claims about my past lives, I couldn't any longer. I knew it was true. The staff in my hand was proof. All right, good. That's good, Lily but now it's time to see what you can do when things aren't so easy. Now it's time to see what you can do when you aren't on your own. What? I couldn't even get the whole word out before Declan's men, minions, fighters started to pour out of the wings of the courtyard being used as our fighting arena. I counted six of them, but who knew if that was accurate? My mind started to spin, a dozen questions popping up at one that I had no time to ask. Was this part of my so-called training, or was this something much more sinister? Maybe it had all been an easily orchestrated trap that I had just walked straight into. It would be a brilliant way to do it, even I had to acknowledge that. He had put me in a place where I was so distracted by my own glee that I had dropped my guard, something that might well prove to be a monumental mistake. They came toward me, their own staffs at the ready, surrounding me just as I came back to the ground. There was no time to think, only time to act, which was exactly what I did. The first of the dragon shifters lunged at me, and I spun, using my staff to knock him out from under his feet. He yelped in pain where my staff contacted him, but didn't stop to look at what damage he'd sustained. I smashed my pulsing mulberry-colored staff on the ground, and soared up into the air, spinning gracefully and using the staff to knock three more of my foes off their feet. The skin on their necks began to smoke and sizzle. Two of them fell to the ground just as the first had, moaning and gagging respectively. But the third, his reaction was much, much stronger. His hands flew to his neck, grasping at it like he was choking to death. It looked like he was trying to remove something, the thing that was cutting off his air supply, except that there was nothing there. Nothing but the mark from where my staff had made contact. Stop. For the love of the gods. Stop. That's enough. Everyone stand down now. Stand down. Declan's voice was loud, penetrating the sounds of the battle we were in the midst of. There was a confused scrambling on the ground beneath me, from the heart of which emerged Declan. He strode straight into the middle of the circle of my fallen foes, roaring instructions, sending them out in every direction. I couldn't even tell who he was shouting at, whether it was me or the men who had attacked me. As it turned out, it didn't matter. His commanding voice was enough to stop all activity, except for the subtle motion of my staff, as I brought myself back down to the ground. In my extreme elation over the magnificent things I could do with my staff, I hadn't noticed the way the light in the sky had changed. In the bright morning light, I surveyed the damage I had done. While most of the shifters looked like they had only been stunned and were recuperating easily, the last one was turning an alarming shade of blue that was moving rapidly to indigo. Lily, you've got to fix it. It's time. 
whether you remember who and what you are, and even if you don't, you've got to fix this. But I don't know how. You do it. You're the one who knows what's going on here, so you do it. Tears threatened. I'd actually hurt them. And one of them was hurt, bad. I can't. You're the only one with that power. Put down the staff and lay your hands on him. What happened next was a complete blur. I had no choice but to listen to the voice inside and let it lead me where it may. I looked uncomprehendingly at the palms of my hands and then placed them on the wound I had delivered to the poor guy writhing on the ground. The second I did that, his terrified movement stopped. Where my hands lay on his skin, it radiated with plum-colored light. All I could see was the light and the dragon shifter's eyes. They had been so full of fear and pain only moments before, but now they were full of something else. They were full of gratitude, the most complete and trusting gratitude I had ever seen. It's enough. It's done. Declan put his hands on my shoulders and gently pulled me to my feet. I was still looking down at the man on the ground, shocked to see that he was sitting up and looking around with a stunned expression. The other fighters crowded around him, helping him up. Declan led me away, his movements slow, his hand on the small of my back. He took me inside, into a pretty little drawing room I had never seen before, and sat me in a large velvet armchair. For a while, neither of us spoke. As I sat in silence, Declan quietly left the room. He returned shortly, holding a basin of warm water and a cloth. He knelt on the floor in front of me, brushing my hair out of my face in one fluid movement. He dipped the cloth in the basin and began to run it over my face. When it came away, I saw that it was thick with grime and dust and sweat. I hadn't realized the level of exertion I had expelled, but seeing how filthy I had managed to get clued me in. That was when my body began to shake, when what had just happened started to sink in. The shaking became worse, so bad that I felt like I would bite my own tongue off if I wasn't careful. I could hear my teeth chattering, and panic began to take hold in my heart. I didn't understand what was happening to me. I didn't understand anything at all. Declan dropped the cloth into the now dirty water, stood, and wrapped his arms around me. The tenderness was unexpected and completely unlike what I knew to be his character, but at that moment, I welcomed the contact. No, it was more than that. I needed the contact. What happened out there? That was your training. You did so much better than I would ever have imagined possible. But I hurt him, Declan. I think I almost killed that guy. Was that part of my training? No, it wasn't. Not part of your training, and also not your fault. Those men, my men, were given strict instruction as to what sort of padding they were to wear. He knew the protocol. He chose to ignore it. My guess is that he underestimated you and your ability. I imagine he won't be making that kind of mistake again. So then it's true. It's all true. I'm really not human, am I? No, he said softly, his arms finally letting me go as he pulled back to look at me. You really aren't. Now what? Start training all the time? What about Ricky? Is he going to train with me? I mean if I have training he should too. He's my brother, he must be like me. No. He won't be training with you. I don't even want you to speak to him about the training. I don't want you to speak to him about any of what we talk about. What? Why not? He's my brother. Why would I want to lie to my brother? It's what must be done. But it doesn't make sense. And then a thought occurred to me. What about Cade? Cade? His face darkened, his eyes clouding with that murder I had seen the first time I saw him. Don't worry about Cade. He will be dealt with. Why was he sent to kill me? And are you going to kill him over it? He ended helping me instead. No. He won't be killed. He's lucky there. It is law in Anafal that we don't put to death one with royal blood, no matter how egregious the crime. Royal blood? What does? I must tend to my men. There will be no more training for today. 
You are not to speak of the things you have learned. I looked at him in disbelief. Not to anyone. Chapter 28 Cade Lily Lily come on now. It's time to wake up. Um. No. She stretched out her arms over her head, arched her back, and then rolled over to one side. I sighed in frustration, my jaw clenched to keep from yelling at her. I had been trapped in my little dungeon cell for more than a week, and Lily was just as frustrating as she had ever been. In the moonlight streaming through the open window, I could see an impressive collection of bruises peppering her outstretched arms that appeared to move down the length of her body. Those bruises looked like they had come from the training pits. It was an unmistakable look, once you had experienced them for yourself. So then, it had begun. I didn't know to what extent Declan had gotten into her head, but I now knew that he was in there at least a little bit. The question was, how much did she know? How much did she believe? And perhaps most importantly, what did she plan on doing with her newfound information? Lily, come on. I need you to get up, I hissed in a low whisper. What? What the? Shush. No. Quiet. I clamped my hand over her mouth to keep her steadily rising voice contained, and now all I could see of her face was her wide eyes peering at me over my fingers. Beautiful eyes. I couldn't help noticing despite the unconventional nature of this meeting, and having them stare at me the way they were was unnerving. I felt like she was looking inside of me, like she knew things now that she hadn't the last time we had seen each other. I supposed it was inevitable, this knowing, but that didn't mean I had to like it. It was unnerving. Things were changing. The tides of fortune were moving, and I had no idea which way they were turning. If I remove my hand, are you going to stay quiet? She nodded, a spark of anger popping up in those gold-flecked eyes of hers. It was a wonder she hadn't just opened her mouth and bit me, I thought grimly. If I didn't move my hand quickly, she might still do it. I wouldn't put it past her. You have to stay quiet. Please. Jeez. What is wrong with you? What kind of guy sneaks into a girl's room and puts his hand over her mouth? Seriously, she huffed. Shish, I whispered, moving away from her onto the very edge of her bed as she hefted herself up to a seated position. What did I just say? I know I know. I have to be quiet. I feel like everyone around me is constantly warning me that things are worse than they appear, and that if I'm not very careful, I'm going to make them even worse still. That's kind of a bummer, you know? Not exactly the thing every girl wants to hear. I knew who everyone that she referred to meant. It had to be Declan. But still, against my own inner warnings, I asked. Everyone who? She glowered at me. Declan? All right? My skin prickled at the mention of his name, and I had to work to keep my anger under wraps. My issues with Declan ran so much deeper than Lily knew, and now was not the time to air out all of our dirty laundry. And it wasn't exactly like I could blame Lily for her interactions with him. I had been locked away deep underground, and she had been sent straight into the lion's den. She was only doing what she thought best, trying to figure out a way to live in a world she couldn't possibly understand. How did you get out of the dungeon? The loyalty of all of the overlord men isn't what he thinks he is. You mean to tell me that one of his soldier guys actually turned on him? Just let you out? No, nothing so noble as that. Money. What are you doing here? It seems like an awfully big risk. If you actually managed to escape, why didn't you just get out of here? Because it's imp. It's important. I know I know. I get it. Okay so what is it that's so freaking important? By the gods, you really are cranky when you're woken up, aren't you? I am indeed. Well, I apologize in advance, but you won't be getting any more sleep this evening. I need you to come with me. You need to show me something? What? The truth. Turn around. What? Why? Lily rolled her eyes at me. Turn around so that I can get dressed. 
Chapter 29. Cade. Lily gave me a dirty look. Are you going to tell me what we're doing? This is insane. We're going to get caught, Cade. It's like you have a death wish or something. No, not a death wish. I just know my duty. That's what I'm trying to do. And your duty is in the sewers. No, not the sewers. Not even close. Well then what is it? What are all of those tunnels for? I had led her through the castle, hoping against hope the entire time that we wouldn't be stopped and apprehended. If that were to happen, it would all be over. Everything I had been working for would be for nothing. And then there was the matter of Lily. I was putting her in danger, and I knew it. I didn't owe her any more, but somehow, I still felt responsible for her. Even worse, I liked her. I had never factored in the chance of actually caring about the one I was supposed to kill. It was inconvenient, to say the least. It was also dangerous for both of us. It made the things I knew we had to do harder, and they were already so hard they felt almost impossible. Those were the things that had led us here, to the network of tunnels used to navigate the worlds. The network was a complicated one, as many tunnels as there were worlds and not a sign among them to indicate which one led where. Not that it mattered. I knew where we were going. All I had to do was convince Lily to come with me. My only hope was that the things she had seen and done while I was locked up had made her more willing to take a leap of faith. Do you want to see the above ground? The above ground? Are you serious? Is that where these sewage tunnels are going to take us? Not sewage, I answered as I peeled away the hand she had just gripped my arm with. They are passageways to portals, I suppose you could say. The one in front of us is the one that will lead us to the above ground, which is obviously something you've already had explained to you. Oh boy have I, Lily answered grimly, her eyes darkening with some unpleasant memory. It's my world. The above ground is my home. You could say that. I would say that it used to be your home. What you'll find when we return is something entirely different. I'm in. What do I have to do? It's easy. Follow me. She looked at me doubtfully, but followed as I approached the mouth of the tunnel straight in front of us. This was the part where I was going to have to trust her. I couldn't send her down the tunnel first, not without having any clue what might be waiting for her on the other side, but for me to slide first meant that she would be left there in the depths of the Onifal castle all alone. What was to stop her from just turning around and going back to her room, crawling back into bed and falling straight asleep? I had no idea where her loyalties were at that point. I didn't think she knew either. How was I to know that she would follow the instructions I had given her? What are you waiting for, Cade? If we're going to go, let's do it. I didn't crawl out of bed just to stand here all night long. Go. I'll be right behind you. I promise. I took a deep breath and made my way to the lip of the tunnel's mouth. I turned to look at her once more, just in time to see her roll her eyes theatrically again and heave a massive sigh. Then, with her promise still ringing in my ears, I plunged myself into the darkness of one of many tunnels through time and space. I fell. Just like I did every time I traveled through the worlds, regardless of the means, I fell for what felt like a hundred people's lives. Throughout the fall there was nothing but darkness, and the feeling of belonging to nothing and everything all at once. It was the kind of feeling a man could get lost in, and if I wasn't careful, that was exactly what would happen. I shut my eyes and waited for my fall to end, feeling relief and grief when I finally hit the ground. Before I could pick myself back up and move out of the way, there was Lily sliding behind me, falling straight into me and knocking me on my back. She landed on top of me, her face a mere inch away from mine. Her sweet hot breath washed over me in quick frightened bursts. It smelled like strawberries, and all of the hairs on the back of my neck stood at attention. Sorry, she whispered picking herself up and then offering a hand to help me do the same. I didn't exactly have control of where I landed. Don't worry about it. You okay? Sure I guess. That felt weird. 
Just how many ways do you guys have to travel to other worlds anyway? Enough. Vague much? Now isn't the time, Lily. That's not what we're here for. Then what is it? What did you bring me to the past for? I didn't, Lily. This isn't the past. This is your world. Or what's left of it. I'm sorry, but it is. This is where your city of Houston stood only a week and a half ago. This is Declan's version of your home. My heart ached for Lily as I watched her turn in a slow circle, trying her best to take in everything around her. This world looked nothing like the one she had left. There wasn't even a trace of that vast, vibrant metropolis she was accustomed to. Instead, there was something that looked much closer to what the people of Earth studied as the medieval times or the Dark Ages. The tall buildings crafted out of steel were no more. They had been replaced by little thatch huts in which squatted throngs of dirty peasants who were afraid of everything, even their own shadows. Besides the smattering of makeshift homes was a dirt road, upon which a thin line of miserable, frightened people steadily trod. Heads down, back slumped, they were all walking in the same direction. They walked as if they were doing so against their will, as if they were being led by an invisible leash. Every now and then, one of the peasants would lurch out of their huts, joining up with the zombie-like procession streaming by. What's wrong with them, Cade? Why do they look that way? Because they don't want to go. Then why do they? Why don't they just stop? They can't. What you're talking about is free will. That's something you had in this world when you were living here, something I have a feeling you took for granted. It's also something these people don't have. That's what happens when a misguided witch is in charge of your life, especially if that witch is working for the wrong people. A witch? Did you say a witch? But that's... Not all witches are created equal. Having the kinds of powers you do is a great responsibility, and one not everyone can handle. It's so easy to be led astray, so much easier than you might think. Take me to her. Are you sure about that? Because I have to warn you, once we do that, there's no turning back. Stop it, Cade. Just stop it, okay? Isn't this what you brought me here for? To see? Yes, I guess it is. Then show me. You can't show me and protect me at the same time, right? So stop trying to protect me. I'm not helpless the way you think I am. I'm not the same girl I was when we met. I've learned things. I've learned all kinds of things, and I promise you, I can take care of myself. How was I supposed to make her see that the thing she needed protecting from, wasn't a shifter with a staff? How did I tell her that it was her heart that would need protecting this time? That was the most difficult to take care of. I would have walked that road for days on end, just to avoid the reckoning I knew was about to come, and I would have done it gladly. Unfortunately, time was a funny thing, always playing tricks on people just because it could. It was only when you didn't want it to, that time moved slowly. At times like this, times when you wanted the molasses slow version of time, it was the speediest little devil there ever was. We arrived at the castle much faster than I wanted to, and there was no time to take Lily aside and prepare her for what she was about to see. The crowd was moving us forward now, whether we wanted it to or not. Over their bobbing heads I could see Lily's eyes locked onto mine, full of panic and halfway to understanding. Cade. I don't understand. It looks like our building. It looks like my home. She was right of course. We were in the courtyard of the castle that was now the heart of Houston, and it looked like a darker, more opulent version of the apartment building Lily and her family had lived in. Any minute now she would see the thing I most dreaded. As it turned out, we heard it before we saw it. My eyes were still glued to Lily's face, and I saw her face go white when she heard the voice of the new queen boom across the crowd. People of this new world. My people. I see you. I see you wherever you are. I see you when you try to resist me, and that is when you feel the pain. It is better to come, is it not? It is better to give in. This new world depends on your giving in, on your bending. This world is not your own. Do you hear me? Do you hear? A low rumbling swept across the crowd, 
a sound of assent and misery. It was the sound of a large collective defeat, and it was heartbreaking. These people had been broken down so quickly. In no time at all, everything they were had been stripped away, leaving them shell-shocked and empty. It was exactly what the overlord wanted. It was the perfect way for a man to serve, and not ever think to question his servitude. Do you hear? Your lives are not your own. Hear me now and know my truth. You have all seen the dragons in the sky. You know in your heart what that means. You have heard my voice in your dreams, and you have come when you were called. This is the beginning of what is to come. Her voice filled the crowd, filled all of the space around the crowd. It was both beautiful and terrible, just as she herself was both beautiful and terrible. Everyone stood stock still with their faces turned up to her in rapt, terrified attention, taking in the truth of their new roles. The only movement came from Lily. She was backing away slowly, her face turned to the ground like her life depended on it. After she had moved a few feet that way, she turned and began to run. She managed to make it out of the courtyard of the makeshift castle, and back onto the path, before tripping over a tree branch and going sprawling out in the dust. The first spattering of raindrops began to fall, evaporating almost as soon as they hit the ground. The air felt thick, so thick it hurt to breathe, like the sky itself was now in mourning. I rushed to Lily's side, sliding into the dirt beside her, and attempting to put her head on my lap. She pushed me violently, blindly, tear streaming down her hot, flushed face. What the hell is this, Cade? It's not possible. None of this is possible. I know. I know it seems that way, but it is. I'm so sorry, but it's possible, and it's true. This is what your world is now. This is what the Overlord's servitude looks like. But that woman. That queen. Yes? That was my stepmother, Cade. That was my dead stepmother, the closest thing I had to a parent, whose funeral I watched in the Overlord looking glass. Nobody came. Did you know that? My stepmother had a funeral and not one person came, and now there she is, on that balcony, and acting like these people's ruler. She is. I don't understand. She's like you, Lily. That's the best way I know how to explain it. She's a witch, the same as you, and she's working for the Overlord now. Chapter 30 Lily That was very good, Lily. I'm impressed. Even with all of the potential I knew you had, I'm very impressed indeed. You've progressed more quickly than I ever thought possible. Thanks I guess. Although I'm pretty sure you just said you didn't have very high hopes for me. Lily don't do this. You've been moody for days now, and I'm tired of it. Is it the training? Too much for you. No I'm fine. Really everything's good. I just need some water. Is that all right? Come with me. I waited until Declan began to walk from our training courtyard into the little sitting room that had become like my second home, then followed closely behind him. I could feel my heart jackrabbiting inside of my chest, and did my best to slow my breathing so that my pulse would return to something resembling normal. That had been close. It had been too close, which meant I was becoming too reckless for my own good. Not that I didn't have my reasons. The past week had been one of the most difficult of my entire life. I had returned from my visit to the above ground with Cade, with fire and vengeance in my heart. I had fully intended to go storming into the castle, to hold my staff to the overlord throat and watch him squirm with fear. He deserved that and more, for what he had done to me, for what he had put me through with that vision of Mona's death. I had believed him, blindly and with seemingly no reason not to, and it had been a lie. I had no idea how he had created the image in the looking glass, but I now knew for sure that it had been a load of crap. I had seen her with my own eyes, lording over the frightened people of the city that used to be called Houston. She was the enemy now, from what I could tell, and it was because of the overlord. That he was my enemy was clear. What wasn't so clear to me, was Declan's role in everything. I had worked so closely with him during my training, and I would be lying to myself if I said that I had developed a certain kind of liking for him. It was a volatile feeling, 
apt to change from day to day and with the weather, but it was there nonetheless. I would have given anything for it not to be. Liking him made it so much harder to plan what I should do next, because I couldn't tell if it was clouding my judgment. That was something I just couldn't afford. Not now. Not when every single decision I made could be one of life and death. What I really needed to do was figure out who was on whose side, once and for all, and there was only one way I could think of to do that. Drink. I sipped my water carefully. What's on your mind? Declan's eyes pierced me straight to my soul. I tried to think through the next thing I was going to say. This was it. I could feel the truth of that fact humming inside of me, the voice I had come to trust more than any other resource available to me. I knew I had to listen to that voice, and it was telling me that this was the time. I just had to make sure I didn't screw it up. The above ground. What about it? I was just curious about it, you know? Not because I want to go back, because believe me, I don't. There's nothing for me there anymore. I see that. It's just that I'm curious to see what's happened to it. Why nothing's happened to it. It's exactly as it was when you left it, although some of the damage from the schism's tremors still remains. Repairs of that nature can take some time, you know. Really? Huh. I thought it would be different somehow. You don't believe me. Come on, Declan, I didn't say that. No, and you didn't have to. I can see it in your eyes. I don't know. I can't do much about what you see in my eyes, can I? No, I suppose you can't, but that doesn't mean I can't put your doubts to rest. Here. Follow me. He strode out of the room quickly, never seeing the smile on my face. This was exactly what I was hoping he would do. Just lead me straight to the tunnels where he would have to show me the truth of the devastation that had befallen the land that was once my home. My plan had worked perfectly. It had been so much easier than I had expected it to be, leaving me with nothing to do but follow quickly behind Declan's long strides and try to figure out what I would do once we got back to Earth. I hadn't decided how I wanted to play it. Would I act surprised? Would I lash out in anger? What I really wanted was to know what Declan's role was in all of this, which meant I would need to play it cool. I knew it, I just wasn't sure whether or not I could do it. My temper had been pretty bad as of late, getting worse and worse with all of my mounting stress. I would like you to follow me. Follow you where? I asked, looking suspiciously at the system of tunnels and feigning ignorance. Down the tunnel. To your earth. That is what you wanted to see, right? Sure. I mean right. That's totally what I wanted to see. I just expected you to take me to the schism. There are many things you haven't learned about the world of Anifal, Lily. Things I can teach you if you'll only let me. I smiled at him, hoping he would take that as a signal of my appreciation. Inside, however, I was scowling my worst scowl. Declan had no idea what I knew. True, it wasn't enough, not nearly enough, but it was definitely more than he gave me credit for. With that in mind, I slipped into the tunnel after him, allowing myself to fall back towards the worst kind of earth I had ever seen. Except that it wasn't there. It was, but it also wasn't. The place Declan had taken me to was the place I had left behind when I had forced Ricky to jump into the schism with me. It wasn't the exact same location, not in the field full of cattle, but it as the world I knew. The tunnel spit us out in a park off of the White Oak Bayou, right next to the Heights neighborhood I loved so well. Everywhere I looked were things I recognized. All of the character and charm was there. Nowhere in sight were the downtrodden peasants from before. Declan had been right, there were still buildings boarded up and under construction from all of the damage of the massive earthquake phenomenon. It did look a bit dystopian, with rubble and such, but other than that it was the same as the day we dropped into the schism. There was no wicked witch, no mass enslavement of the human race. It was all just normal. What's the matter? You look upset. No. I mean yes. I mean... I don't know, Declan. 
It isn't what I expected. Is it your stepmother? My stepmother? Yes, Lily, your stepmother. Her passing. My stepmother. Mona. That was when it hit me. In that other version of Earth, the one that looked like a trip to the Renaissance Fair, but for real, Mona had been very much alive. Yes, she had been a less than benevolent witch, but she had been alive. But in this version? It hadn't occurred to me that she might still be dead, at least not until Declan's words. Now I understood the sick nature of my conundrum. I could either have a world in which my stepmother existed, and the people of Earth were enslaved, or I could have an Earth that was as it was supposed to be, but in which my stepmom was dead. I couldn't have both. The worst part was that I didn't know which version was true. Not only that, I didn't know which version I wanted to be true. Lily. I want to go. But I thought this was what you wanted. This is a good thing, right? Now you can see that nothing has changed. I can't make any promises for the future, but I can tell you that nothing will happen without you knowing. Fine, Declan. That's fine. You can do what you want. I don't want to be here anymore. I thought... You thought what, Declan? I thought you might want to pay a visit. To your stepmother's grave, I mean. I thought it might be the kind of closure you would need. Declan? That is the worst idea I've ever heard. I don't want that at all. I can't think of anything I want less. I want to go now. Right. Now. I almost told him that I wanted to go home, but then I realized it. I didn't have a home. Not anymore. Chapter 31 Lily A blood contract. That was what Cade had called it, that thing the overlord had gotten me to sign. It was a blood contract, and it meant that I was betrothed to one of his sons. According to Cade, at least. The overlord had yet to mention anything about that, nor had Declan. Not once, not in any of the myriad training sessions we had endured together. Cade and Declan had rapidly become the bane of my existence a fact made all the more complicated by my conflicted feelings about the two of them. They were as different as oil and water, as different as light and dark, and I had no idea which of the two I was supposed to trust. I had spent days trying to figure it out, had made myself sick over it. One minute I would believe all of the terrifying conspiracy theories Cade fed me, and the next, I would be leaning more toward the tutelage of Declan. Their conflicting ideas were breaking me in two, to the point that I knew it would be the end of me if I let it. Four days of that back and forth passed before I came to a decision, and it couldn't have come any sooner. I would be catatonic if I had allowed it to go on much longer. Once the decision was made, however, I felt the most at peace I had in weeks. I went through the motions with my training, doing my best not to let Declan see anything out of the ordinary on my face and scurried back to my rooms as soon as I was able to get away. I spent the rest of my day in my room, sleeping as best I could. I wasn't tired for once, pretty much the opposite of tired actually, but I knew I needed to sleep now more than I ever had in my life. I wasn't sure of the next time I would have a warm cozy bed to rest my head in. I wasn't sure of anything when it came to my future. I was only sure I was ready for it. When night came, I ceased my restless slumber and crept out of my bed. My body felt heavy, as if it knew something I didn't and was attempting to warn me. I ignored it, and went about the business of packing up my knapsack. I had no idea what I should be taking with me, which made packing tricky, but I did my best to anticipate whatever weird scenarios and dangers I might face. When I was sure I had done the best I could manage, I slipped out of my room and into Ricky's. He was sprawled out on top of his covers, his body spread out like a giant starfish with an awful habit of snoring. With him laying like that, I could see the bend of the angle on the bottom half of his leg where it had never healed properly, and I felt a pang of regret over what I was about to do. He looked so young like that, closer to five than twelve. I was about to pull him out of that, and for what? A hunch? Because I couldn't handle being pulled in two different directions, anymore? 
These rooms in Onifal were probably the closest Ricky had ever had to a real safe home. In this Onifal palace, he was free to be exactly who he wanted to be, and he was allowed to do it in peace. I was about to take that away from him, and I was doing it knowingly. I could only hope that it was something he would be able to forgive me for. Someday. Hey, Rickster? Hum. Come on. I need you to wake up now for me, okay? It's super important. I need you to wake up. Decalmata. Come on, wake up now. I won't call you Rickster anymore if you just wake up, okay? I won't ever call you that again. Promise? I promise. But I need you to really wake up. Like, open your eyes and everything. Ricky pulled his arms into him, crossing them across his chest in a protective gesture. He pried one eye open, keeping the other one shut tightly. It reminded me of when he had still been a toddler, and would try to claim that only one of his eyes was sleepy when it was past his bedtime, but he wanted to stay up later. I could see the image of him doing that so vividly, it was like watching a family film inside of my head, and I felt my throat grow thick with sadness. I didn't have the time to cry. Crying wouldn't do any good now. I had started this next phase of things by waking Ricky up, and now I had to keep things in motion. If I allowed myself to slow down even for a moment, I might lose my nerve. And if I let that happen, I might never get another chance. No, this was the only way, and it had to be now. What are you doing in here, Lily? It's time to go. Where? I could hear the panic starting to creep into his voice, and felt another massive pang of guilt. Still, I kept my composure. I was doing this for him, I reminded myself. I was doing this to keep him safe, and that was something I didn't feel confident I could do in Onifal anymore. I wasn't sure I could do it anywhere else either, but I had my staff, my training. I had enough to give it a good try, and that was the best I could do. I was trying very hard to be an adult, even though I felt like a total child. Just go. We need to get out of here. But what if I don't want to? What if I like it here? I think that's what they want. They want you to like it. They want me to like it too, but something's wrong. I know it. There are too many things wrong. We just have to go. As gently as I could, I pulled Ricky up and out of his tangle of covers. He had a dazed expression on his face, which I figured could only work in my favor. As long as he stayed half asleep, he was far less likely to ask questions, and questions would make getting him to the tunnels that much more difficult. More difficult was pretty much the last thing I needed at this point. What about your things? Do you have anything you want to take? Anything important to you? No. The only important thing I have is you, Lily. That's it. God, it was like he was trying to break my heart. He was looking up at me with his still tousled hair and big dark puppy dog eyes, and I knew he would do whatever I told him to. He stood docile as I shoved some of his clothing into my knapsack, adding his favorite book for good measure. I didn't know what things would be like where we were going, but it couldn't hurt to have something to occupy him. Once that was done, I made a slow turn, checking out our rooms to make sure nothing important was left behind. I had to practically drag him through the castle. In the weeks in which it had been the place we both called home, I didn't think he had ever left our little collection of rooms. Not once, not for anything. To do so now was clearly terrifying for him, and it was all I could do to keep one of his feet moving in front of the other. He jumped at every shadow, statue, and tapestry. He was like a little boy in a haunted house, who didn't want to be there and couldn't wait to get out. The longer our stealthy creeping went on, the worse it got, until I was almost sure he was going to start screaming. It was the most massive relief when I finally got him down to the tunnels without getting the two of us caught. I realized then that I had been holding my breath for much of our movements, and I had to lean up against one of the cold stone walls and take deep gulping breaths. I felt lightheaded, like I had gotten very close to passing out, and the thought of that was horrifying. I had thought I had been being careful, but I was wrong. 
I was going to have to do better once we got back to Earth. I was so focused on that fact that I hardly even heard the low moans coming out of my brother's mouth. When I did, when I realized it was him, I rushed towards him, wrapping him up in my arms and holding him tightly. What is it, Ricky? What's the matter? It's those, he wailed, pointing at something behind me. What are they? Why are they moving that way? Moving? No. Nothing's moving, sweet boy. Those are the tunnels. Those are the tunnels that are going to take us out of here. But they are, Lily. They're moving. They're moving round and round, just like a carousel. I stood, turning to face the tunnels and see what trick of light was causing Ricky such distress. That was when I let out a gasp of my own, my hand moving up to my mouth to quiet the sound. See? They're spinning. They just keep spinning, round and round and round. He was right. The tunnels, which had been perfectly stationary both of the times when I had been there before, were moving, slowly but surely. The closest thing I could think of to compare it to was the look of an empty gun chamber being spun. Not that I had ever seen that in real life, but I had watched plenty of movies which gave me the frame of reference. I had no idea what had set the movement in motion, and it made me sick with worry. What if the tunnels were spinning because of us? What if I had accidentally triggered some kind of alarm or something with our nighttime crawl through the silent castle? I could see it in my mind, the door to the tunnel room bursting open to allow dozens upon dozens of shifter soldiers inside. Would they try to fight me? I knew I would be able to fight some of them off, but how many? How long would it be before we were overrun, our chance of escape gone for good? But how will we know, Lily? That's what I want to know. How will we know what? I asked distractedly, my eyes darting around the room rapidly, sure something was about to jump out and try to get me. How will we know which tunnel we're supposed to take when they keep moving around that way? My heart really did stop then. Not for long but it must have stopped. I felt my heart's pause in my whole body, like a jolt of horrible electricity. It was a simple enough question, but one I had no idea how to answer. I didn't have a clue which of the tunnels I had taken. They all looked exactly the same, and with the way they were spinning, there was no way for me to know whether or not everything had come to rest in the place where it had begun. It didn't matter how hard I tried. Any tunnel I chose would be nothing better than a guess. Maybe it would be better to find some other way. We could go back to the schism, maybe, there was always that option. I was pretty sure I could find my way back to it, although I knew it would take more time. It was still dark, and the castle wouldn't wake for several hours yet. Lily. Quiet, Ricky, I'm trying to think. Lily. Don't you hear that? I hadn't heard it, not before, but as soon as Ricky said the words, I did hear it. Somewhere in the castle above us, a loud clanging noise had begun. It was a sound I hadn't heard before but I recognized it for what it was. It was an alarm. Middle of the night or not, our absence had been discovered. I didn't know how long it would take for everyone to wake up enough to understand what was going on, but I knew we were now living on borrowed time. We would not be going to the schism or making our escape into the woods, after all. There was no way we would get away with that, what with the whole castle being roused. That left only one option. The tunnels. It would have to be the tunnels, whether I knew which one was the right one to take or not. I grabbed Ricky by the hand and began dragging him closer to them, all the while trying to decide which tunnel we would slip down. The commotion above us grew louder, our time for action growing shorter all the while. Come on. It's the only way, Ricky. We have to. But? I didn't wait around to hear what Ricky was trying to say. I had decided on which tunnel was to be ours, and as it made its way by us, I took Ricky and shoved. He slid down forward with remarkable ease, his trembling flailing hand soon the only thing left for me to see. Looking behind me one last time, I dove in the same tunnel head first. Immediately, there was that disorientation that was starting to become familiar to me. I didn't even mind it anymore. 
I only wish that I could hold Ricky's hand while we fell. He must have been so afraid, falling like that and not understanding what we were doing. He couldn't possibly know that we were on our way back home. Home. That was what I kept telling myself. We're going home. I'm going to take care of him, and we're going to go home. Oof. Ouch. Geez, Lily, can't you be more careful? You landed right on top of me. I'm sorry. I didn't exactly plan it. I couldn't really make a graceful landing in this kind of situation. Fine, whatever. Can you just get off of me? I'm freezing. I was about to ask Ricky why in the world he was freezing in a town as hot and humid as Houston, when I started to feel it myself. The adrenaline must have kept me warm upon first landing, but that could only work for so long. He was right. It was cold. No, not cold. It was absolutely freezing, the kind of freezing that settled down right inside my bones and took up residence there. I was immediately shivering out of control, and I could hear the chattering of Ricky's teeth beside me. What is this place, Lily? Where on earth are we? I, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. I couldn't tell which tunnel we were supposed to take. I just picked one. Well, wherever you took us, it sure doesn't look like Houston. No, it doesn't. Looking around me, I saw that we weren't in either version of Earth that I had been to. The world we were in now looked like it was entirely unpopulated. There wasn't a single solitary building in sight, nothing to show that there was another human being for miles around. Instead, there was snow everywhere, blanketing the world and making it look washed clean. It was thick too, thick enough that it went up right past my knees. It was even higher on Ricky, almost all of the way up to his waist. No wonder his teeth were chattering so badly. He was practically buried. We've got to get you out of this, I said desperately, highly concerned by the fact that my brother's lips were starting to turn blue. I don't think you're made for weather like this. And 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 nope, he stuttered. St. T. T. Tupud H. 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 Houston. Come on. Let's get out of this. I looked around desperately, scanning my surroundings for even the simplest structure that could act as our shelter. There was nothing. All I could see was mountains, fir trees and snow. Snow upon snow upon snow. The only thing that could even half work was a small cave a couple of paces behind us. Feeling dread and doom creeping up on me, I led Ricky toward it. I had only brought two blankets with me, and I wrapped them both around my brother, rubbing my hands briskly up and down his arms and hoping it would actually do something to help. What we actually needed was a fire, but I had no idea how to build one. I hadn't ever learned those basic life skills. I didn't know how to take care of the two of us, at all. For the first time, I realized how much danger we could really be in. If I didn't figure out how to get us warm, we were going to freeze to death in this strange world I couldn't recognize. L L L Lily. What is it, Ricky? What's wrong? There. L L look. He was pointing over my shoulder, into the dark and cold and snow. I could see by the look on his face that there was something out there, and I groped around for my staff, fumbling to get it out of the sheath that kept it strapped to my side. I couldn't get to it fast enough. The silhouette in the mouth of our little cave was growing larger, and any minute now it would be fully upon us. That was it. We were goners. Really, Lily? Is this the best you could do? Cade? Cade? You? Of course it's me. You would be able to see that if you weren't sitting here in the dark. What's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with me. I just don't know how to make a fire. Did you ever consider using this? As I watched, Cade pulled out his own staff and touched it to a pile of brush he had thrown down on the cave's floor. Instantly, the material lit up with flames, giving off little fingers of delicious heat. I pushed Ricky towards the fire, hoping against hope that it would revive him enough to keep him from getting sick. Once I had him as settled as I could manage, I rose and made my way to Cade. I couldn't even begin to identify my emotions. Fear, anger, confusion. They were all there, each one fighting for a starring role. 
I wanted to ask him what the hell was going on, to finally get some kind of explanation. Before I could get a word out, Kate held up one finger to my lips. The gesture was so surprising that I stopped dead in my tracks. He gazed at my face for a long while, waiting until nothing seemed to exist in the world aside from the two of us. All I knew was that I was free. And Ricky was free. And now with Kate here to guide us, I wasn't nearly as worried as I'd had been before. We'd forge a way in this new world. We'd do it. As for what I did or didn't know, as far as I was concerned, Cade was here. And even though he'd shown me things that I didn't want to see before, I felt good about his being with us. That was when he spoke, words I knew I'd never forget as long as I lived. You don't know anything, Liliana. But you will. God's help us you will. His silver skin glowed as he took my hand in his, and things felt right. I hope you've enjoyed this latest production. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.